cave in. This document, maintained by the Jones Law Office, is, by the request of Mr. Barney Sheehan, reserved for the eyes of Jim Sheehan, Jr. Dear Jim, it is, as I write this, the autumn of 1991. When you read this letter, I'll have already passed. Given my age, I feel the time is near, and this was the best method I could think of to impart what needs to be imparted, to plumb my soul's darkest reaches before the end. I left it with the family lawyer in Beattyville under promises you, my eldest and most level-headed grandson, would be the first to read it. I trust you are the first to read it, and I would urge you up front not to do so in the company of the family. Keep them at arm's length, and only come back to the text when you are certain you'll be able to finish it undisturbed. It's long, I know, but the content demands the length and I don't want others dragged into what I have left to reveal. There are things even a son shouldn't know about his father, and things a grandson shouldn't know about his grandfather. There are things no man should know, regardless of his blood or the strength of his mind. I've endeavored to protect you and your brothers from this all my life, and I would have taken this tale to my grave where it belongs were it not for the four of you toying with reopening the old cave-turned-mine you stumbled on hunting the feral plot a few years back. Even if your father or one of his brothers were still with us, I never dared tell any of them what I'm now setting out to tell you. Awful as it is, I never wished to burden another mind with it. Now I feel my hand has been forced, and I pray you will listen to all I'm about to tell you and the warnings which will follow. I'm just a year shy of 100, the oldest man in Lee County, according to Dr. Millen. Probably one of the oldest in Kentucky, if I had to guess. The influenza last year reminded me how tentative my life is. I could go any day, and I expect I won't last many more winters in these hills. Blessed as I am to have the memory and mobility I have at my age, and you boys to stock wood for the fire up at the house. The cold weighs heavier on me every time it sets back in. I feel in my bones that the next winter will be my last. That's fine by me, as I'm more than prepared to go. Better now than the day I begin to forget my name and the faces around me, as I've told the four of you several times. But, as I said, I have things to impart before I go. I'm the last man alive who remembers them. The people around Beattyville worked hard to bury what needed to be buried up there around that old mine, and while I can't summon the courage to tell you in person, I know I have some time before you boys garner the funds to really look into that mine along Farrell's Ridge. The people of these mountains are wary of outside influence, and with good reason. The land speculators who snapped it all up in the 1700s to sell to the impoverished early settlers were all coastal plantation men, and they had little regard for the lawless mountaineers who spilled their own blood to settle it. Any mining operations launched here have been profitable, but never for the men doing the mining. The funds and material always seemed to trickle upstream to their shareholders and owners in Pennsylvania or New York where the urban elite counted their coin and sneered at the illiterates down south in the hollers toiling away in company towns. I'm sure you remember that your brother baited me down from the mountains to Lexington nearly a decade ago now to see a comedy routine in a theater. The northeastern clown on the microphone opined that beyond the lights of the city, cavemen were still clubbing raccoons and eating raw meat in the hills. He said some places were so backward that he sometimes wished they could be hit with a can of human raid so that civilization might start over there. Veiled in comedy, that's exactly the murderous view most take of us. An embarrassment, remnants of an older, less enlightened age which have only accidentally clung to life as long as we have. 
In a way, they are more right than they know. This is an old, old land, and the people which live in it have been largely shielded by poverty and isolation from the cultural rot and decadence that swept the rest of the nation. Most of us would spray Boston or Philadelphia or New York with that metaphorical can of raid as readily as he'd spray West Virginia or the Blue Ridge. It's very much a two-way street. Appalachia's memory is long and vivid. It remembers how life was lived when there were no city lights and no organized local governments. It remembers how to keep its people safe from outside meddling. It remembers how to keep traditions alive and, when the time is right, to stamp them out. Appalachia recalls how to keep secrets. All this you know, of course. You've lived half a century here, just as I've lived a whole century here. This place courses through your veins just as readily as it does through mine. I merely say all this to make clear to you why this is the first time you'll hear about what I'm about to tell you. If you have any sense, you will also be the last to know. Many men who knew it carried it gladly to their graves. If I weren't sure you'd doom yourself sticking your nose where it doesn't belong, I'd do the same. With that preamble spent, I'd like you to imagine Lee County as it was when I was a boy and beyond. No electric, no plumbing, no paved or gravel roads. The only true highway was the Kentucky River, and it was rare indeed we saw an outsider. Your great-grandfather kept hogs. We grew only enough crops to keep ourselves full and the still running. You and the other kids played around the old cabin's foundation when you were boys, out behind my place, overlooking the family plot where you've hopefully already laid me to rest. Labor was hard, but limited to a few hours a day for most of the year. We had plenty of time to wander and get to know each other. Just about everything you ate, drank, and used was grown or built local, and, even more so than today, everyone knew everyone. No one ate a bad dinner or killed a big buck in Lee County without every soul in the hills hearing about it. So, it should come as no surprise that florid, fantastic legendary was a core part of the cultural tapestry around Beattyville, just as it is today, to a lesser extent. The stories of fey woodland folk and strange noises in the hills were as ancient as the land the settlers lived on, and most of those stories were dragged over on ships from the old world. Some they got from the Indians of the hill country who they'd warred with in the early years, a few were entirely new, born of the union of the Celtic and Germanic mind with the soil of a beautiful, vast, alien land. Whatever the genesis of the legends, they all agreed there were things in the woodland hills that no man could truly understand, and places in the darkest hollers where it was best not to settle. One of those places was a cave a foul crack in the earth at the bottom of a dark valley in the eastern reaches of the county. The very first European squatters to come into Lee County as permanent residents recorded that the savages would not hunt or camp in the valley, and called it by a Shawnee phrase that roughly translated to Vale of No Return. The forest grew quiet around that valley and the trees were wont to die young in peculiar sandy soil which seemed almost ashen. Only the cruelest of briars and the most gnarled pines seemed to thrive there, and the skeletal outline of the dying growth was as much a deterrent to the prospective settler as the fearsome reputation. As more and more plots were divvied up, and more and more settlers poured into the region, that valley was never developed. Its deep forest was never cleared for swine or goats, and its dying trees were never harvested to be burned as potash as was common on poor farming ground in those days. By the time Beattyville was established around 1850, it was just called Beatty at that time, few in the hills remembered the Indian legendary or their tales of vanished hunting parties and strange sightings in the depths of the wilted wood. All they knew was that the eastern valley was no good, and it didn't do to wander there. 
A fair number of strange things happened up there over the long march of years Appalachia spent holding out against the industrial age which was setting in on the lowlands. The mountains around that blasted valley swallowed a party of hunters in 1860, and no amount of searching ever turned up traces of the seven men and their dogs. Lights were observed flickering on the ridgetops along the valley's edge, bonfires perhaps, around Hallowmass of 1866, but come morning, no sign of revelry or ritual in the wilting woodland could be found. After a string of horses bolted for no discernible reason along a dirt path into town which wound alongside the dying span of forest, injuring several who were tossed from their saddles in the confusion, a reverend in town started to call the place The Pit, and that name was the one which stuck in the minds of the people of Lee County. Me and my kinfolk were raised on stories about The Pit. One of my father's favorites was about a massive black bear a few men from south of the river chased into the eastern hills in 77. It had been killing sheep and dogs along the edge of town, and when a party finally set out to kill it, they drove it by some malignant misfortune into the dead woods around the pit. When the pack of hunting dogs, baying and frothing, refused to cross over the ridge into the blasted forest, the hunters themselves chased alone. They hemmed the bear in on the valley floor and drove it to the mouth of the caves there. To a man, the hunters thought it would flee into the dark to escape them, but it didn't. When it saw, it was cornered. It took a long look into the blackness at its back and then settled down in the dirt and waited to be killed. Another concerned a group of foreign miners, whether Portuguese or Spanish my father never could decide, who tried to prospect the pit with aims of developing it into a mine around 1880. Coal was just beginning to be dug around here by northern firms, but most of the locals hadn't fallen into mine work yet, and even the men on the ground from mining companies in distant Philadelphia or New York City knew better than to poke around in the Dead Valley. There were easier pits deeper in the mountains, with less unsettling lore around them. The foreigners didn't know better, and they didn't much care to heed the warnings of the locals. When they found a big vein a few hundred yards into the natural tunnels, they brought equipment, built homes, and began a wholehearted mining operation. None were surprised when, a few weeks later, they packed up and left empty-handed, abandoning their equipment in hastily built shacks to rot around the pit. There were three missing, but the foreigners didn't linger to look for them. One who stopped to supply in town was drunk and jittery, and rambled to a shopkeep about whispers and footsteps and knocks in the cave, about whistling and strange words that rose up from the pit when there wasn't anyone inside. He said the cave system went far, far deeper than they'd imagined, and that he wouldn't be surprised if the system honeycombed the whole county. When he started to talk about eyes which reflected lamplight in the dark and long, tapering fingers which snuffed out candles in the gloom, his countrymen pulled him out and started on their way. Most curious of all the tales were the footprints. Even after I was born in the early 90s, it was rare that a winter passed without them being spotted winding through the snowdrifts on hills which bordered the valley, and every family in town seemed to have a story about them. I palled around with old Tim Kearney and Bert Farrell, and we used to wander the very same Farrell plot you and your brothers hunt on now, as I've told you many times. What I've avoided telling you is that when we'd sled those woods in the dead of January, there were fresh, bare footprints in the snow up there each morning. Like a man's, only much longer, with toes too splayed and thin to be natural. There were dozens of sets of them some years, when nights were particularly dark. The prince would bound and leap and creep, taking long strides we'd trace through the powder. We were never bold enough to poke down into the valley and check, but every one of us knew without seeing that whatever made them was coming up out of the pit and circling back before dawn. Well, the town did well enough leaving the place alone 
and only fools from outside ever fell foul of the place. Even children, brash as they can be, seemed overcome by the yawning quiet of the awful place, and let it be when they had cause to pass by the valley. Things went on like that until 1890, when another group of foreigners moved in, this time several large families with women and children in tow, and purchased around 500 acres in the eastern county in order to establish a community up there. The tract was perfectly centered by the blasted valley and the pit it sheltered. They bought the plot from the ferals, and couldn't be persuaded that the place was dangerous. They were experienced miners, so they claimed, for they had worked the mines in their homeland, and were well aware of the dangers posed by the bowels of the earth. They had come, so those of them who bothered to speak said, from some remote hill village in Powys, Wales. Most spoke only broken English, with a language we all assumed was Welsh being by far their preferred tongue amongst themselves. You would think the shared Celtic blood and the fact that rural Wales, like Scotland, shares a certain cultural and topographical similarity to Appalachia might help the outsiders better integrate with the mountaineers who surrounded them, but this was certainly not the case. They learned no English, schooled their children at home, and joined no local churches. The pastors in town speculated this was because the foreigners were some variety of papist, which only further alienated them from the fiercely Protestant locals. Perhaps the strangest of all these habits was the total lack of trade they did with the town itself. Any food, tools, and supplies the Welsh around the pit needed they either grew and crafted themselves, or bought and imported from elsewhere in the country. More so than ever, the blasted upland vale where the cave brooded amidst the village of furtive newcomers seemed a different land than the tracts that surrounded it, and the reputation it held only darkened over time. They named their modest hamlet Far Brecon, though they tended to say the Far in Welsh on the few occasions people in Beattyville had cause to hear them speak it. They seemed content to keep to themselves, and strange as they were, the people of Lee County were keen on doing just that. The insular nature of the sixty or seventy Welsh up there was only part of the problem. They looked strange. So strange, in fact, that the town's physician thought they were ill when they first came into Beattyville with a mind to purchase land. They were a good six or seven inches taller than most locals, with even the women usually standing a little over six feet tall but it was a lean, emaciated height, which brought to mind old images of starving long hunters and Civil War prison trains. Their limbs hung loose and limber, and seemed far too long to be normal. And yet, given the refusal of all local horses to tolerate the presence of the newcomers, they took to hauling their goods uphill into Far Brecon on wagons they pulled by hand. A lone man from Far Brecon once tugged a cart of mining supplies which must have weighed the better part of half a ton up the rough dirt path out of town. Thus, the uncanny slenderness didn't speak to frailty or weakness. If anything, they seemed quicker and stronger than most of their neighbors. Their fingers were skeletal and as unbelievably long as the legs, with tips that seemed just slightly bulbous like those of a frog who clings to walls. They seemed always to be slick with sweat, and those who had met them ceased to offer them handshakes when rare encounters on the road brought locals face to face with the lanky newcomers. It was noticed among watchful Kentuckians of that region that Brecken's hunting parties built no tree stands and used no ladders when taking game from the forests of the county. The foreigners clambered the slick trunks of pines as easily as the gnarled trunks of oaks, and perched like apes in the tree boughs to watch for prey down the barrels of their rifles. Their skin was so pale that in certain lights it was almost translucent, and even the youngest of them boasted dark veins which seemed ebon against their sickly pallor. A good six years after I was born in ninety-two, my older sister came home screaming one unseasonably warm autumn afternoon 
that she'd spotted one of the foreigners hauling firewood uphill out of a glen alongside the county road. The man had been shirtless to combat the heat of the day and his labor, and as he crested a ridge to be backlit by the setting sun, my sister swore she could see the man's entire skeleton and organ structure, ribs, gizzards, and all, silhouetted within his ghostly flesh like meat suspended in jelly. Their noses were remarkably small and upturned, and their hair was uniformly an almost ashen, spider-silk blonde, which seemed to fade to gray before thirty. The men kept their heads nearly shaven, and the women seemed always to sport bonnets, scarves, or hoods which masked their quaffs of painfully bright hair. They only ever went with heads and arms uncovered around dawn or dusk, when the thick woods of the looming hills could shield their delicate skin from the harsh rays of the sun. The most off-putting were the eyes. They were large, not so large that they seemed out of the realm of possibility, but just large enough that the skulls of the people from far Brecon seemed to bulge outward slightly to accommodate the orbs when one looked closely enough. The color was always a rich, almost orange-amber, and given the remarkable size of the pupils, the whites of those eyes were almost invisible. Dark as they were, they seemed onyx against the ivory of the newcomer's skin. On the rare occasion visitors to the county passed some of the foreigners on the back roads at night, they always came into Beattyville proper declaring that those unsettling, staring eyes reflected lamplight in the dark, like the eyes of a cat or a hunting coyote. Everyone expected the weird Welsh settlers would be driven off eventually, but that day never came. If anything, the people of Far Brecon seemed to be warming up to their new environment. They burned great bonfires beneath the lightless shadow of new moon nights, and sang so wildly in their strange tongue that the words often echoed down to the ears of shaken townsfolk as they lay awake in bed. Their wooden flutes often wailed into the wind almost till morning. Some intrepid hunters who dared to climb a mighty old chestnut growing on a neighboring ridge for a clear view of the foreigner's hamlet during one such lunatic festival said they were all naked, and that their awkward, capering, long-limbed jigs took them in and out of the mouth of the pit which centered the settlement. Things only grew stranger in 1896, when the fruits of the hitherto shrouded mining operations of those odd-looking Welshmen were revealed. They'd been digging up precious gems, it seemed, and they came that spring into Beattyville hauling several carts filled to the brim with glistening diamonds, rubies, and darkest emeralds. Many muttered that the geology wasn't right for such things here, but every six months or so the foreigners brought more crystalline treasure down out of the higher hills and the Beattyville trader who sold them on to buyers in Lexington and Louisville stopped asking questions. He became a wealthy man, but the vast sums the village of Far Brecon was making never seemed to be reinvested in the shabby huts of the upland settlement, nor did it get spent on luxurious clothing or food, or trips to other parts of the country. Rather, it was often spent on vast herds of livestock, often a hundred head of sheep or cows at a time, which the Welshmen bought from neighboring counties. It was oft remarked in the 1890s that the tall men from Far Brecon might buy 500 cattle in a year, and yet their tiny village pasture in the wilted woodland meadow beside the pit never boasted more than twenty. Well, things progressed like that for some time. When little Alfred Keel went missing from his family farm along the north side of the river in 1899, just a week prior to one of their raucous new moon bacchanals, the town launched a few inquiries up in Far Brecon to no avail. This spurred more hushed conversation than ever about the town, and threw out most all the goodwill the people of Beattyville might have maintained towards the furtive foreigners. When another child, Michaela Higgs, went missing after a long spate of dog disappearances around town in 1901. The Lee County Sheriff raised a posse of fifty armed men which he led straight to Far Brecon that night. Sheriff Hutch came back down the next morning with ten fewer men. 
His face was far more pale than a sleepless night and a long hike into town would have warranted, and his voice trembled as if he were fighting pneumonia. The other members of the party weren't much better, and it took them a long time to open up. When at last they did, their story convinced the townsfolk that the outsiders weren't just strange, they were wicked. Hutch had interrupted a celebration or ritual of some sort, just like the one hunters had spied upon years earlier. They broke up the gathering and pulled aside the eldest of the men in Far Brecken. After they had dressed, the heads of the village told him in broken English that they knew nothing of the Higgs' disappearance, and that they did not appreciate the intrusion of the sheriff's department on their ceremony. When Sheriff Hutch produced a ream of warrants and demanded to search the huts, the Welshmen demurred, but the huts in town proved empty, and the towering residents of Far Brecken followed the posse around like curious wolves, their eyes catching the light of the party's torches. It was then Hutch heard a wail from deep down in the pit, reverberating up from the stony maw of the place as if the earth itself had loosed the scream. It was high-pitched, shrill, the keening of a frightened child, he thought, colored by the desperation of a horrible environment. Incredibly, the intrepid Hutch and a dozen of his boys told the others to keep an eye on the foreigners, and pushed down into the pit with torches high and guns braced. A far Brecken man was drafted to lead them, and that unnaturally lean giant wove his way through the crags and crevices ahead of them like a master. So fast was he that, by thirty minutes into the crawl, the posse's caving party could not locate him, and they had to progress on their own. Hutch couldn't really bring himself to say much about what the caverns had been like, or how long he'd been in them with his picked men. What was clear, though, was that the trek was long, and often necessitated crawling and scrabbling in the tightest spaces of the manse. Every once in a while, a head count would reveal one among their number was simply missing, and no amount of echoing yells down the tunnels would yield a response. Now and then a girlish cry would sound, drawing them deeper into the pit, and yet no girl ever answered their searching shouts. At last they came into a broad cavern with a soaring ceiling, whose floor swept down and away into the nighted depths of the earth beneath them. Amidst the shadows along the foot of the jagged, stalagmite-riven slope, barely visible in the flickering light the remaining men bore, a hundred sets of eyes glinted back up at them, staring and waiting for the men to make a move. Hutch and his men retraced their steps and refrained from a panicked stampede. Even so, with a stealth none among the few who crawled free of the dark that night could comprehend, a full five more of the men were dragged silently into the deeps by tapering limbs they half glimpsed in the flashes of gunfire they loosed at the slinking shapes in the murk. When they finally broke into the pre-dawn light of the surface once more, with no rescued child to show for their efforts, it was just Sheriff Hutch and two teenagers from town who were left from the caving party. The posse who'd remained on the surface led the shaken survivors home when the residents of Far Brecken made empty promises to search the caverns for survivors in the days to come. Hutch couldn't bring himself to launch a massive militia action against the outsiders lurking up there in the hills, and he also couldn't send to the governor in hopes the National Guard might be sent to turn the place over and see what was going on up there. What would poor Hutch say? that there were demoniac ghouls in the hills that needed to be exterminated? No, that wouldn't do. With Hutch's evidence against the strangers being entirely driven by their odd behavior, and the unease it roused in the people of Beattyville and the county at large, he didn't have enough to take immediate actions. He was a small-time, backwoods lawman, and there would be no cavalry sent east from Frankfurt to back him up. Shaken as he was, though, he wasn't helpless, and he deputized many in the community with military backgrounds or hunting experience to patrol the county roads at night. They roamed with great packs of bloodhounds, who would occasionally start and bay bloody murder at the sky in the quiet woods on darkened nights. Men sat up late 
and took shifts with their sons minding the porches till dawn banished the threat of things which might creep in the shadows. Parents stopped allowing their children free reign of the woodland, and were especially adamant that the youngsters of the town, myself among them, didn't stray anywhere near the dead vale and the unwholesome village of moon-eyed strangers within it. The only exception to that rule was my eldest brother, Eamon. He was lost to us long before your time, but he was a tall, lean, imaginative sort, not like the rest of the family. A bit like your father, really. God rest both their souls. Eamon was impractical and prone to long, lonely rambles in the hills. He'd scribble poetry when the rest of us kids were hunting squirrel or hare. He clashed with my father quite a bit in those days, and through listening in on those back porch arguments past sundown, I learned Eamon had bumped into a girl from Far Brecon foraging mushrooms on the county road sometime in the spring of 1903. He'd stricken up a friendship with her, which my father rightly took to mean courtship. Eamon would stroll the hollers south of the road, and she'd meet him there, and they would talk till dusk demanded she slip off back to Far Brecon. Our father, needless to say, was not happy about the situation, but Eamon talked him into staying silent on it. Difficult as the thought of Eamon getting attached to one of the foreigners from Far Brecon was, it was agreed that the girl's parents would likely be even more hostile, for the strangers had never tried to hide their icy disdain for the people of the wider county. No one knew what foul things they might do if they got wind of the teenage romance, so our father was hemmed into a reluctant silence for the sake of the both of them. Between 1903 and 1905, on summer nights when our parents were dancing in town, Eamon would sometimes sit in the yard scored by Cicada Song and speak with the rest of us about her. She was called Theon, and as he supplemented the limited English she'd picked up from old books in her youth, she told Eamon much about happenings in Far Brecon. They were some sort of pagans, he said, and they had indeed been miners back in their native Wales. Their practices about which Fionn seemed reluctant to tell, had been uncovered by a neighboring town there, and the whole of their community had apparently decided it was better to flee to the new world than to be forced into reform at home. A group she called the Below Folk, with which her people had shared communion back home, had supposedly hinted there were subterranean colonies of their race up and down the Appalachian Mountains, and had helped guide them to the Wilted Valley, and the hated pit it hid. They called this pit the Ogof, a word I've since learned simply means cave. They made offerings of animals to the things they said lived within, a detail that made all of us uneasy given the circumstances of the disappearances which had troubled the region. But Fionn said the below folk here were not quite like the ones which had dwelt beneath Wales. They were strange, she claimed and worshipped a slumbering god apart from the old fey pantheon the ones back home had followed. They were harsher, and far more demanding of their subjects on the surface. Though they brought far Brecon the glittering treasure it sold to the outside world from deep within the earth, they also requested far more frequent offerings than those in the old world had done. We, of course, already unnerved by the outsiders, demanded that Eamon press her for more details of the things beneath the ground and the offerings they demanded. Partially, this was out of concern for Beattyville and the surrounding communities. I'll freely admit it was just as much to do with the fact that we were cunning youngsters fiercely curious about the goings-on up in the Forbidden Vale. Whatever our motives, we badgered Eamon enough that he began subtly badgering Fion for details and what she eventually told him was so terrible and unbelievable that, even compared to the other fantastic details he'd pulled from the talkative girl, it shook us to our young and timid cores. Fionn wouldn't tell everything, but she told enough. She said that the below folk had been known to her kindred for nearly a thousand years in the old country. Only relatively recently had they begun to trade with their cousins on the surface, it was some time in the 16th century that one of the below folk had offered gems and precious minerals to the surface folk, 
for a price they termed the mingling. From what Fionn understood, every woman among the surface folk was taken into the earth on the cusp of her sixteenth year, and paired with one of the folk from below in a ritual meant to produce hybrid offspring. She was then returned to the settlement beneath the sun, married among her own kin, and raised whatever child resulted as her own. It was through this mingling ritual that Fionn speculated her people had become so tall, and garnered their characteristic strength, speed, and nocturnal eyesight, but she could not know for sure. The women of Far Brecon, her mother among them, never spoke of the mingling in open terms. They revered the process, but they knew the half-glimpsed things in the dark below unnerved their children on an instinctive level, and they held back the intimate details until the day had come, and the rite was to be undertaken. Fionn's elder sisters had all been through the mingling, but refused to speak of it, even to their dear sister. With her own sixteenth birthday approaching that winter, the girl grew more and more frightened of what awaited her. I think that's the only reason she dared spill the secrets of Far Brecon to Aemon. She'd grown attached to him, certainly, but he was also the only person outside of the ring of the surface folk in whom she could confide. She wanted Aemon to take her away, she said, and he was scrambling to come up with the funds and the courage to try. Aemon had us pitch in money we made doing fence repairs and selling small game pelts in town to help him stock up food and the cash for train tickets south out of the state. He spent the autumn practicing with a dependable old revolver our grandfather had given him for his tenth birthday, interested, for the first time in his life, in learning how the weapon was used. He spent long hours away, telling our father he was working jobs in neighboring counties to explain the money we'd passed him, and we stayed silent. Young and naive as we were, we could still recognize that this was a crossroads Eamon meant to walk in his own way, and meant to help him do it. The night came at last on the 9th of December in 1905, a week before Fionn's day of reckoning, a date I'll never see the fortune to forget. An early snow had dusted the hills, and the shining moon was waxing in a cloudless sky, this made even the deepest depths of Appalachia's winter woodland navigable in the sheen of the frozen fugue. The surface folk up in Far Brecon would be loath to walk or skulk beneath the light of so bright a moon. I'll never know exactly why it was Eamon chose me to be his lookout. Perhaps it was because I was the best shot with a rifle. Perhaps it was because I spent the most time following him around and he knew I looked up to him enough to keep his secret, at least as long as it took for him to slip down. Perhaps it's just because I was home that night, and I was the first he ran into in his frenzied search for help. Whichever it was, when he stumbled in with battered suitcase and glinting revolver in hand to beg for me to watch his back while he went to meet with Fionn for their final escape, I didn't hesitate to agree. We ran up sodden roads and over crushing snowbanks to cut quickly through toward Far Brecon across the county, the mountains snapping up the final rays of the cold sun as we went. The pair were to meet in the shadow of a lightning blackened tree in a deep and shrouding stand of pines along the county road, one of the sole places cloaked in shadow amidst all that milky moonlight. Eamon posted me on a ridge perhaps a hundred yards off overlooking the road through the skeletal trees with my hunting rifle readied. He ordered me to shoot if it looked like the two of them were to be intercepted, but neither of us expected how totally the plan would fail. Neither of us could have known how many there would be. Fionn came into view amidst the barren trees alongside the road not long after Eamon got into position in the pines. It was the first and only time I'd see her, bundled against the chill and the damp, but clearly lithe and nearly as tall as Eamon. She had almost translucent hair that seemed to glisten blue in the gibbous brightness of the brisk night, and her huge eyes seemed to flash gold now and again, even at my distance. They embraced, half visible through the pine needles, 
scrabbling to make certain they had everything they needed before they began their sprint. I was slow to notice she did not come alone. The occasional glint of distant lights and the drip of melting ice made the nocturnal forest an eerie thing of glitter. It was only when a set of gleaming orbs appeared not ten yards from Amon and Fion that I realized she'd been followed. I almost shot then, my finger twitching above the readied trigger. Thank God I refrained. Who knows what might have befallen me in the town at large had I foolishly revealed myself on the hill. More eyes appeared almost as quickly as the first. Dozens of pairs there were, then over a hundred, skittering as silhouettes across the snowy mountainside beyond the county road like ants surrounding a meal. I had nowhere near enough ammunition to make a dent in them. Eamon did not share my realization of the gravity of the situation, for he discharged all six shots he had available to him in the revolver when the searchers closed in upon them. Some fell, but most decidedly didn't, and they battered and tugged Eamon to the ground to be hauled off with his screaming lover. It was only then, when I heard her wail for him amidst bursts of frightened Welsh jabbering alien to my ears, that I realized it had not been a planned ambush, at least not on her part. Perhaps the surface folk had noticed clothing or provender missing from Fionn's house. Perhaps she'd confided in siblings or kin, just as Eamon had done, and they had proved less understanding than we had. Whatever had happened, she was as much the target of their hunt as he had been. I made a mad dash for home as soon as the foreigners had skulked far enough back towards Far Brecon that I figured my footfalls in the snow wouldn't draw attention. I made record time, and yet as I rattled off my story to my father, and he sprinted off with me and my brothers in tow to Beattyville to rouse the sheriff, I was convinced we'd be too late. My imagination spun whole tapestries of the torments they'd be passing over Eamon up there and my hands were numb against my rifle with a chill that had nothing to do with the nip of the winter air. Looking back on it, I'm amazed the town reacted as quickly as it did. I suppose Sheriff Hutch had more than enough reason to trust my account, and the shaken men from that first posse which had barged into Far Brecon years back had passed their fears on to their families and friends in the lower valleys. By ten that night, there was a mob of five hundred armed men, nearly all in the county within running distance of Beattyville, with torches and lanterns bared above the glinting barrels of shotguns and rifles, and the flashing heads of axes and hammers. We went up the county road towards Far Brecon in a great jumble, hunting dogs weaving between our legs and nervous conversation on our lips. There was chanting in the dead valley before us, and we could see from the smoke and the red upon the backdrop of the neighboring ridges that fires were being burned amidst that cavalcade of foreign words. Father took me aside then, told me to stay back and keep clear of what was about to happen. Some other disappointed teenagers in the ranks got the same treatment, being convinced it was to guard the rear by the veterans among the party. Some of the better handlers among them took the dogs, who still refused to enter the environs of Far Brecon, out in an arc along the ridge, aiming to hem in the village. Then the men pushed up over the hills and down the rough road into the heart of Far Brecon. We boys who'd been left behind waited with bated breath, of course. The otherworldly chanting, which had seemed so infinite as it echoed up the hills and into the night sky, faltered. There were calls, shouts, a scream as if a woman taken by surprise. A brisk, manic argument ensued, Sheriff Hutch being one of the parties involved, though I could discern the words of neither he nor his enemy. A single shot rang out, somewhere in the east of the wilted valley. An absolute silence followed, and for what seemed like a minute the whole forest seemed to hold its breath along with us. Then the gunfire started in earnest. It wasn't much like a war. Though I seldom talked about it with you boys, I went to France in 1917, and for all the shellfire and machine gun discharge, the shootout in Farbrecken was so much more awful. 
so much more personal. Men, our fathers and brothers and teachers, howled as if they'd seen demons as the fighting started. The women of Farbrecken shrieked and called orders to startled children in Welsh. The dogs overlooking the slaughter bayed, anxious for their masters but still unwilling to risk the holler. It wasn't long before the pained shouts and frantic screams of injury rang out into the barren trees, seeming to taunt and gnaw at our ears as we shivered in the awful night air. It was young Noel Nagel that risked the ridge first from among our number. He had four brothers in the mob and wanted to help if they were in trouble. That was all it took to send the rest of us scuttling up after him to look down into the tumult, and what we saw down there ensured not one of us ever slept soundly in the hill country we loved again. The people of Far Brecken had constructed an altar of stacked limestone slabs just outside the mouth of the pit. It was around this they'd been gathered, and there they made their stand. A few of the strange men had held guns of their own, but these had been the first to be shot, and lay bleeding into the churned snow. Many of their fellows had scuttled like spiders up the walls of the leaning huts and shacks which constituted the town, and were braining the mob with stones and tools. Their moon-eyed women and children wailed and tried to make for the mouth of the cave, but some were inevitably hit by stray rounds. But there were other shapes in the veil as well even taller and more uncanny than the foreigners. Nude and agile, I immediately knew these twisted, living geists were the below folk. They were larger, paler, stranger mirrors of their tributaries from the surface, and their movements were even faster, even more impossible to trace as my eyes bounced from trunk to battered foundation in a vain attempt to track them all. A dozen or so of these malformed giants leapt and bounded around the village, and they had already taken what looked to be cruel stone hatchets to a full two dozen of our men. I saw Nagel's father's skull hoven in in the first few seconds I had eyes on the clearing as one of the below folk leapt down upon him, only to dart away at the sound of shotgun fire nearby. They were not invincible, for I already saw two thrashing and bleeding in the shadows beneath the altar but their motions were so twitchy, so unpredictable, that it was hard to draw a clear shot at them. I saw Sheriff Hutch die in the jaws of something huge, black, and skittering that rose up from the well just outside town to drag him in with it as it withdrew. It was so fast I doubted my eyes as it happened, and yet Hutch was never found after all was said and done. It seemed almost to be a centipede, but surely such a thing is a biological impossibility. Surely they can't grow to be ten or twenty feet long. Parson Byrne managed to kill one of the giants with a lucky blow from a hatchet just before the arms of a second scooped him up and snapped his spine. A lone, far-brecken man who'd avoided the volleys and injured my father and several others with thrown stone from the roofs in town was yanked from the building and bludgeoned to death with emptied rifles. Liam Griffith, a boy who'd palled with Amon for years, was stabbed by a far Brecken woman when he made a dash for the mouth of the pit, perhaps trying to recover someone who'd been dragged into the dark. The woman likely thought he was going for the children and scattered survivors flocking into the shadows below. Whatever she believed, Liam's father shot her dead a moment after his boy fell, and he wept over him in the middle of all that chaos like a boulder weathering a storm. At the very center of it all, thrashing bound and naked on that godless altar was Amon. He was bleeding from a hundred gashes and battered beyond all recognition, but I knew from the healthy color of his skin that he was who he was, even at that distance. I sprinted the hundred yards downhill into the fray and went to him, thinking to free him. By then, all the far Brecken surface folk were either dead or lost in the darkness of the pit and the subterranean giants were being finished off by injured and furious men. I reached his side, wiped the blood from his eyes, and went to cut him free, but he wouldn't follow me when I tried to pull him out of the valley to safety in the cold silence of the woods. Fionn had been taken into the caves by the giants, he said. He had to go after her. I refused to let him go. 
Weak as he was, I forcibly dragged him back up out of the valley, helped by my dazed and battered father after he realized what I aimed to do. We had to put him back in binds, for he wouldn't be dissuaded from his suicidal mission to dive headlong into the sunless hell which must exist far, far below our feet. Even as the last of the shots died away and the posse began to count its dead, he was still calling down into the valley like a madman. I was charged with hauling him home, so I didn't see what came next. The mayor and a judge from town took charge of the situation that night and set a rotating watch of eighty men on the clearing. The next morning, dynamite was brought in from Irvine, and a few of the miners among the group pushed forward a couple hundred yards into the pit, filled a pinch in the tunnel with explosives, and collapsed the Agaf for good. The huts and hovels were burned, and the twisted corpses, below folk and Welsh hybrids alike, were dumped down the well and covered over with heavy stone. Any fiscal or government records of Far Brecon's existence in Lee County were destroyed. The nearly hundred men from town who were slain or missing were said to have died in a gun battle with highwaymen in the hills. The land was silently passed back into the hands of the Farrell clan, as if none of this had ever happened. By the new year, there was no standing trace of Far Brecon and Beattyville meant to keep it that way. I suppose one who didn't see what I saw that night would say the townspeople did it to protect themselves, and I suppose they'd be partly correct. After all, even with the dead giants and strange foreign corpses at hand, they would have little save hearsay to prove the far Brecon miners had been murderous ritualists if a large-scale investigation was launched by the state government in Frankfurt. We were just a low-born gaggle of frightened rustics, after all, and the government in the bluegrass lowlands was just as likely to hang a few of us as gunfighters and rabble-rousers as launch an investigation into the caves. But simple self-preservation wasn't the reason. They did it because those things were not meant to be, leastways not up here beneath the light of the sun and the moon. Firmly as I believe in a scriptural hell, I also know there is a material, tangible hell, and it is anxious for traffic with the surface. Lee County crushed any chance that Pitt might have of ensnaring a wandering traveler or lost child ever again, and not one of us broke the silence save amongst ourselves, in quiet corners away from prying ears. That should tell you how I feel on the matter. It should tell you how all of us felt about it. Mining operations in neighboring counties would often complain that miners heard strange sounds, knocking through the stone and voices raised in chants caught through nigh invisible crevices in the coal-blackened rock. We in Beattyville would knowingly smile, and blame the tall tales on ancient superstitions handed down from those who'd come over in elder days from the old countries. As machines replaced pick-swinging men underground, talk of strange noises in the deeps waned, and we were happy to let memories of them fade into shrouded myth. Eamon recovered over the next few weeks, but he stayed silent. He left with a pack and rifle in the June of the next year. I've always believed he delved into the hills, mines, and caves of the region in a wild attempt to find Fionn. He never came back. I shouldn't have to tell you now that the cave on the feral plot you pulled that little diamond out of was the pit, the Ogov. That cave-in you're aiming to clear is the very same collapse we caused in the winter of 1905. It is the gate to a literal underworld, to fathomless gulfs that house scuttling things which hunt in shadows only they can truly call home. Do not open it. Kind and caring as you've been to me as I've aged, take that as an addition to my will. It is the most vital thing I've ever asked of you. Tell your brothers and whatever friends you've babbled about riches to whatever they'll believe is dismissal, but don't so much as look at that crag in the forest ever again. The birds sing there once more now that the way is closed, true, 
but there is no telling whether the long fingers of gangly things in the blackness still claw and scrabble at the threshold, waiting for a gap to be thrown wide. Do not give them the option. I fear, like so many of the ghastly monsters of old Europe, they will only be emboldened by the invitation. My dreams have been haunted by troglodyte whales and searching fingers and gleaming eyes since the earliest years of this century, and they grow worse this time of year, as the last of the leaves fall and the cold presses in to remind me what's coming. I can't pass the cool winters in my little house without imagining them behind every branch glimpsed through the windows at dusk. I can't walk the snows outside without being petrified at each step I'll spot those familiar, elongated, barefoot prints along the frigid hills. I can't sleep through a December night without awakening from nightmares about noseless, gigantic faces leering down on my bed from the doorway. The least you could do, for your aging grandfather and for this land which we both love, is to keep those eyes in the depths where they belong. Barney Sheehan, Beattyville, Kentucky, October 31st, 1991. Olive Hill is nestled amidst lonely valleys, its forests and winding roads set far enough back from the interstate that strangers only rarely look upon its slowly decaying main street or its leaning, mold-rent church steeples. A friend from college, upon seeing my hometown for the first time, remarked that it was depressing, even ominous. This is not an uncommon reaction but it had never stopped me from feeling at home here. The overcast hills, mist-cloaked mornings, and centuries-old Appalachian farmhouses have always brought me quiet, reflective calm, the discomfort of outsiders be damned. Similarly, the death of the lumber industry under the weight of increased regulation by the encroaching Daniel Boone National Forest has not soured me to the economically atrophied little town. For years, I would proudly proclaim to any that would listen that I'd sooner retire to the woods and attempt subsistence survival than leave the hills for more bountiful work. Rather, it was an innocuous weekend tending a friend's dogs at his house just outside of town that shadowed my view of Olive Hill and the surrounding woodland. My task was simple. I was to feed his two boxers, Gus and Jake, in the morning before work and in the evening after I slipped free from my weekend shifts at the lumber mill. The drive over to see them would also serve to check in on their new cabin, a modest dream home for his wife and young sons. After frequent pillaging of the trash cans by curious black bears, he was in no mood to leave the house unobserved in his absence. My friend's New Year's trip to visit family would mean I was needed Friday night through Monday morning, and there was not a shred of unease in me as I wound my way through the lightly dusted snow up the familiar road and parked before the cabin for my first night on the job. The house sits up on a hill at the end of a tapering one-lane road, its tasteful wooden walls rising in a relatively small yard amidst many acres of untamed forest left thick to better dispose the land to good hunting. Every tree along the wood line was distinct against the snow, and the lights on the wraparound porch cast a warm glow through the forest that welcomed me in as I crunched up the walk from the gravel drive to the door. I did find it odd that the dogs were barking at the back door rather than the front when I pushed my way inside, but I thought nothing of it until later. The snow showed all kinds of shadows in the beams cast by my truck, 
so I supposed they had been confused about my path of approach. The canines barked their greetings, took their dinner on the screened-in back porch, and then did their business with characteristic efficiency. They lingered in the cold, though, both silently observing the banking woods behind the house, where the property swept up to the ridge of the hill before careening down out of sight into the miles of tangled forest beyond. They did not bark, nor did they stray far from the lit wooden stairway to the safety of the porch. They merely stared, heedless of my first few calls for their return. When at last the pair had turned and meandered back inside to the warmth of the cabin, I followed with their bowls in hand thinking of nothing more than the comfort of my recliner and the warmth of my laptop against my legs back home in town. I ensured the dogs were comfortable, locked up the cabin, and hopped back in my truck, eager to get some rest and dreading the early rise that I'd make come morning. When dawn had broken and I returned up the hill to the cabin, I found my rush to finish my chores before work hampered by the dogs I was to feed both of them sheepish to greet me at the door, and hesitant to approach the exit onto the back porch. The lure of food eventually broke them, though, and they pushed out the door in my wake. Every few seconds, either Gus or Jake would look up from the bowls and shift, eyes scanning the woods and noses twitching as they scoured the cool morning breeze. This time, their bathroom run was confined to the snowy ground just before the steps, and they made no show of staring up the ridge. It was as efficient an affair as I'd ever witnessed from dogs, with no sniffing, circling, or pacing to slow the effort. Once again, I locked up the wooden fortress and left for the mill, eyes now a bit more keen on the empty winter forest pressing in around me. Marveling that two dogs born and raised in the mountains would seem so skittish in their new domain, I would cease to marvel after night fell and I wound back up that hateful road to the cabin on the hill for the third time. Saturday had been uncharacteristically busy at the mill, so it was not until after ten that I pulled up the gravel drive. Emerging from the truck, the most loathsome howls and barks I'd ever heard met my ears, and as I crunched again up the path to the door through the lazily falling snow, I realized it must be the placid, playful dogs inside making the noise. I pushed into the cabin and was nearly bowled off my feet by the jumping, whining boxers, who ran from the back hall towards the porch with nervous glances at the back door delaying every step. This time, I didn't make for the stored food and write off the odd behavior. Something had to be amiss. I strode out the back door onto the porch with my eyes narrowed and was met with a long, winding trail of what I took to be footprints, leading down to the rear stairs from the woods up the hill. I stared for a moment in the chill air, marveling at the strangeness of the sight with the dogs at my side, heads lowered in hushed tension. The tracks were like those of a person, but they were bare, as if the owner of those feet had trodden without hesitation all down the wooded slope and through the yard in the snow, heedless of the cold and briars in the forest. The toes were odd, elongated and misshapen, bending in asymmetrical and painful angles away from the feet. Most worrying of all was that the track did not loop back into the woods, terminating just shy of the staircase to the porch on which I stood. Turning for the back door, I strode through the house from room to room, certain I would find some disheveled intruder lurking in a closet or looming in a corner. I found not a single drawer ajar or blanket askew, and I poked my head through the front door to find the moonlit snow of the undisturbed front lawn equally in order. Then, the howling and growling started again, sounding more pitiable than intimidating back on the porch where the dogs had stayed. When I came to calm them, my eyes finding the backyard just as empty as before, they darted inside, 
glad to be away from whatever had spooked them in the nocturnal woodland. Only then, once their raucous calls had been shut behind the walls of the cabin and its hearty oaken doors, did I hear the voices in the trees. They were faint, almost lost beneath the whistling weight of the lazy wind, and I had to strain to make sense of them. But still, they were there. From far back in the shadowed forest, scattered all along the ridge atop the hill, a chorus of disjointed, jumbled voices called with mournful persistence into the dark. Their otherworldly voices, repulsive to my ears, were wet and strained, and echoed as if emanating from the ends of tubes. It was an uncanny thing, like birds aping the words of their masters with no grasp of the meaning behind their speech. Parts of it, though, were blasphemously familiar. From atop the ridge, they murmured the names of Gus and Jake, laced with phrases like come here or go outside, in mockery of my own voice, in mockery of the voices of my friend's absent family. I rounded up Gus and Jake and took them with me that night, herding them out into my truck and tossing some food in the bed before peeling off as fast as the snowy gravel allowed, my eyes ever on the trees up the hill. Once back at my modest apartment, with the dog stealthily rushed in under hopes my landlord would remain oblivious, I called the Carter County Sheriff's Office and told them of the footprints in the snow, urging them to send a patrol car up the road to check in on the house during the night. I neglected to mention the voices in the woods. While rationality told me it was teenage hunters or hikers who had wandered off course and sought to entertain themselves at the expense of a local dog sitter. The nature of the voices kept that rationalization firmly at bay. I somehow knew they were not normal, and resolved in those moments that speaking of them would only muddy the situation. My call to my friend, too, was void of any details about what I had heard. After informing him that I'd spirited his dogs away and set a watch on the house, I only dared ask if he'd ever heard any odd noises around the property. When he replied in the negative, I decided to keep my sanity fully unquestioned and let the issue drop. Sunday, I called in sick to work, spending the day trying to keep the dogs quiet inside. They were well behaved, so the task wasn't terribly hard. But, truth be told, I had larger reasons for staying home from the mill. I had to catch sleep in the light of day, for I'd gotten none the night before, and each hour or two I bolted upright with the image of the yawning woodline behind the cabin freshly burned into my thoughts, the sound of those inhuman voices still ringing in my ears. Such thoughts wouldn't leave me as I trudged through household cleanup and lounged with the boxers that afternoon, ever glancing for the window in the woods beyond, as if any moment my name might be called by unseen forms amongst the trees. That evening, as night closed in, my friend called and urged me to visit the cabin before dark and double-check the doors and windows, just to be certain the home was secured. I wanted to refuse, loathing the idea of driving back up that winding road to the snowy cabin in the dusk. But I could tell he was worried, and I figured I could use the quick trip to grab leashes and supplies for the dogs. Besides, I could hardly excuse myself by saying I was afraid of monsters in the woods. I made sure the boxers were secure in my apartment, tossed my shotgun into the passenger seat of the truck, and made for the house, racing the dipping sun so its rays could comfort me on the lonely trip up to the cabin. The cabin, for all my worry, was placid and undisturbed, looking every bit like a postcard with its windows and porch aglow against the muted backdrop of the winter woods. There were no misshapen footprints in the snow around front, nor did I spot any around back when I rounded the cabin with shotgun readied to try the back door. Finding everything secure, 
I produced the keys and slipped inside, making straight for the utility room where the leashes and cleaning supplies were kept. I might not have witnessed anything strange outside, but I was not keen on wasting a single minute of the waning light by hesitating now. It was only as I wrapped my hand around the leashes and began to celebrate my small victory that I heard the noises. Slow at first, but rapidly building to a rattling frenzy, there was a rapping at the back door of the cabin. The sound was that of a hand knocking upon a door, but was somehow much more hollow than that, as if it were a cane or a tree limb rather than a fist doing the knocking. I froze, counting the seconds since I had entered the house and marveling that someone could have approached in so short a span of time. Perhaps an officer with the sheriff's department had swung in behind my truck, I told myself. They had seen me enter the empty cabin during a passing safety check and had pulled up to make sure I belonged there. Still, that comforting mythology was not enough to make me set the shotgun aside as I tentatively stepped back out into the hall and looked for the door. I was almost unsurprised when I saw no shadow against the glass panes of the back door, the noise having departed as suddenly as it arrived. The porch was empty, and beyond, the dusk was giving way to night and casting the obscured snow in the milky blue of the moon's peaceful glow. That mellow setting mocked me as my heart beat out a death march against my ribs, carrying me on shaky legs up to the door. When it had been thrown open, the mockery only grew worse. The snow blanketing the yard, glassy smooth just a moment ago, was now tarnished and broken. Countless strings of footprints wound and intersected through the yard, making their way from the trees to the familiar resting place before the porch's bottom step. There were dozens, perhaps hundreds, so many the grass beneath the disturbed snowfall now dominated the yard. Not a sound brushed through the woods around me, be it a bird or an otherworldly voice, save the howl of the cold wind cresting the ridge up above and buffeting the silent cabin in whose mouth I stood, stricken dumb. I rushed for the truck, only just aware enough to slam the back door and scramble with the lock before I fled. Each moment I expected a call from the woods, or a crunch of some running footfalls across the snow as whatever lurked in the trees chased after me, but nothing ever came. The door slammed, the engine started, and my escape was made, the old truck carrying me away to safety back down in the valley. The night held one parting gift for me, though. It is one which has ensured my resolve never to visit that ridgeline again, and which has permanently ended my decades of recreation in the Daniel Boone National Forest. Never again will I drive the roads between Olive Hill and neighboring Moorhead after dark, or stroll out away from the mill to smoke to the soundtrack of nocturnal insects in the humid summer woods. My headlights cast shakily into the trees up the hill as I backed down the driveway, illuminated shapes too terrible to forget, ones which might drive me out of my homeland in a way economic ruin and dreary weather never could. Hunched and shivering in the trees, skittering backward away from the punishing light of my high beams, bent and twisted parodies of the human body could be seen amidst the barren branches. They were unnaturally tall, emaciated, and pale, their nude flesh white even against the marble of the snow. Worst of all, though, were the eyes. All throughout the tree line, glistening as their owners squinted and flinched against the light, dozens of wide eyes cast their reflections back to me over the intervening yard, calling to mind a school of deep-sea fish, hunting far from home. I have since warned my friend, in as vague a way as I can while still seeming sincere, that there is something odd in the woodland around his cabin. 
while I think he finds my worry genuine, he's never witnessed anything odd or heard voices on the wind. His dogs, returning to the home, regained their bravado in the woods within a week, and his family has yet to see eyes peering from behind trees in the yard. For this, I suppose, I should be grateful, but it raises more worries in me than it dismisses. Where the things have gone, assuming they were ever there, is hard to guess. What their aim was, if indeed there was an aim, is even harder to guess. All I can know for certain is that the darkly beautiful wooded hills and vales that suffocate this land hold a foreboding, malign presence for me now, one I would never willingly disturb. Some friends and I stumbled across a pack which had been left behind in the deepest portion of Pine Hill Cave. It's the sort of isolated, eerie place that makes for a good drinking spot when you're looking to reminisce and try to scare one another. There's enough teenage traffic and college spelunking going in and out of the place that we didn't take the find too seriously at first. We just assumed a group of drunk assholes not too dissimilar from ourselves stumbled off and left it behind. Then, when I rummaged through it at home, I found the old logbook that was stashed away in the frontmost pocket. It was marked as a geological survey log, and most of the pages were records of cave surveys. I'm no geologist, but the information seemed to mostly be about rock layers and formations in local caverns and mines, very dry and practical. Then, near the end, it suddenly diverges into a sort of journal. I still don't know how seriously to take the record the owner left there, but I've transcribed it here, because I've found it weirdly captivating. First day. I'm jotting this account down in hopes it helps me clear my head and keep straight exactly where we have and haven't been. We entered Pine Hill Cave this morning through the only known entrance, about three miles east of Mount Vernon along the railroad tracks bisecting the town. We canvassed the opening string of caverns before making our way down into the lower tunnels, where the cave system opens up and starts to wind. We chose the central path at the fork present on all our maps, the one with the lowest ceiling, and made for the least explored part of the tunnel network. Now, we're about two miles crawl away from where we came in. Something happened last night, while Kirk and Alan were asleep. I didn't hear much, just enough to pique my interest, but some kind of rock slide or tremor must have occurred. We woke up to find the low passage back out of the caves blocked by rockfall. We have about two days before anyone back at EKU knows we're in trouble, so stress is high. I've kept the others relatively calm, and they're managing well, considering their experience. This is a hell of a first spelunking expedition. I don't know that I'd have stayed as level-headed in their shoes. Though it's a gamble, I'll be taking us further into the tunnels today, to see whether the rise some earlier mappers have noted means there's another exit somewhere along this branch of the cave. While we could ration our supplies and wait here for a few days anticipating rescue, the rock shelf that fell in is massive. We'll be stuck in here much longer after anybody finds the collapse and gets around to moving it maybe weeks given the cramped scale of the tunnels. With any luck, there's some small cave mouth in the hills above us that no one's ever stumbled across, and we'll push out into the sunlight before anyone even knows we're in trouble. Second day. We worked the rest of the first night to get further into the tunnels. The dry creek bed we've been tracing ended its downward slope around morning and we've only just reached the last marked cavern on the maps. There's a little pool of water here, clear enough to drink with a bit of filtering in a pinch. The chamber is wide, ringed by forests of columns and stalactites. There's no obvious exit, so I don't know where the speculation about further tunnels came from. 
At least we stretched the amount of time we can expect to survive in here by a respectable amount by finding that pool. We are settling in for an early rest after all the hurry and worry over the past couple days. My watch says it should be around dusk on the surface now. We are eating cautiously, making certain we're prepared to make every calorie count if things get tight. Hopefully, it doesn't come down to eating crickets in here. Fourth day. Alan and I crawled back up to the collapse this morning to listen for digging or calls from the other side. We've heard nothing, but it's possible they're just probing the other mapped tunnels for us before they invest the energy in tearing through the fallen rock. Kirk stayed behind near the pond, sipping some tea we made him on our little camping stove, suffering from a headache. It's possible it's just the sudden drop in food intake, but I'm worried about him. When we got back from the rock fall to check on him and settle in for another night, Kirk swore he'd heard sniffing like that of a dog coming from the far side of the cavern. He'd scanned the columns around the edge of the clearing, but found nothing there. We couldn't find anything either. I don't know whether the echoes were just playing tricks on his ears down here or whether the stress is getting to him. Either way, we'll try and stick close together from now on so no one has to stew on the situation alone like that again. Fifth day. We decided against another climb to the blockage until tomorrow, at least. We have such limited food looking forward that it'd be best not to waste any more energy on the tough climb than we have to. There's only one place we could be, from a searcher's perspective, and they must know we're here by now so there's little use in huddling near the collapse just yet. We're cooking the we're cooking the oatmeal we've got to spare and talking about what a good adventure story this will make back at campus geology department, trying to keep spirits up. Kirk hasn't done anything to ease my worries about him. He stayed awake all throughout last night, eyes on the far wall of the cave, never giving in to my constant advice on sleep. He's been napping sporadically today while we're up and about in the cave, but he can never rest for long before he jolts himself awake. Whatever he thinks he heard yesterday has really shaken him up. Seventh day. Everything's gone mad down here. We'd gone up to listen for digging near the collapse and, hearing a bit of muffled tapping through the rock, returned to the bottom with our spirits up. Hopefully, this meant it was only a matter of time. We were discussing shifting our camp up the creek bed to be closer to the collapse when the electric lantern burnt out. We were more than prepared to lose the battery. We had a few stowed away, anticipating the loss. We all had our flashlights as well, but I'd advised against using them during this involuntary camping trip, since we had no timetable for how long we'd be without natural light in the caverns. When I went into my pack with practiced motions in the inky black to grab the new battery, something happened that I still can't rationalize. Something rushed past me in the dark. It was frightfully fast, and large enough for me to feel the displaced air as it sprinted, but it moved without striking a pebble or scuffing the stone once. Alan cried out, but the calls were muffled almost as soon as they started with what had to have been practiced precision. I fumbled for my flashlight, the battery for the lantern scattering across the floor as the intruder tore past us, back towards the deepest reaches of the cave. Kirk managed to grab his light first, but by the time its beam found the far wall, we saw only the flash of motion as Alan was dragged up into the clustered columns and stalactites along the low ceiling, his legs disappearing as the two of us got to our feet and called after him. The whole ordeal, from the dying light to Alan disappearing into the stone, couldn't have taken more than ten seconds. I know of nothing agile or quick enough to cover so large a cave in so short a time, I know of nothing big enough to displace air and drag off a grown man like that. Not this deep in a cave system. 
It took Kirk and I several minutes to actually find the awkward crevice in the ceiling's stony edge amongst the stalactites where the intruder must have fled to, but by the time we'd struggled up into the little tunnel after Alan, he was long gone. The only sounds haunting the halls of Pine Hill Cave were our own shaky calls, winding off down the unmapped crevice in pursuit of something neither of us could imagine. The only testament to the struggle was a bloody blade of stone, shaped with crude, jagged edges likely obtained shearing the flint against denser, tougher rock. Away down the bucking and winding little corridors snaked a trail of blood. Though it crushes me to write it in such a brutal way, it was far too much to be survivable. This, along with the jabbering wreck Kirk has become, deflated any plans I might have had to attempt a rescue. We've talked it over, and we think our best chance is to fall back to the collapse, our backs to the proverbial wall, and wait there. We'll take all the water we can carry, and keep lights on at all times. Kirk is convinced whatever took Alan is the same thing he heard poking around the stalactites the other day, and I'm inclined to believe that. If that's the case, then the only thing we have in our favor is the flashlights and the lantern. Day 8. We've been up at the collapse through the night and into the morning. The tapping from the other side keeps us from total hopelessness. I've called out a couple times to see if my voice might carry to the searchers, but they've not answered. The noise of the shouting makes Kirk nervous as well so I've given up trying. I've almost explained that whatever is down there must know exactly where we are, so noise couldn't really hurt the situation, but that would be cruel at this point. Kirk is so close to losing it under the strain I can't help but feel even more on edge than I already would. He shakes despite the subterranean warmth, and he still refuses to sleep in shifts with me to keep our eyes on the empty creek bed below. I sleep my uneasy, desperate sleep while he sits quivering, breathing in quick gulps, his eyes seeming pained by the act of blinking. I've been looking over the broken knife, and it worries me how closely it resembles Stone Age tool use. If I didn't know better, I'd say the thing was an old Amerindian weapon, but the material is a strange igneous obsidian. It's from deep down in the crust, far deeper than we are now. The fact that something like this, shaped by hand and gathered miles below the surface, made its way to us here raises too many uncomfortable questions for my liking. All we can do at this point is hope the crew clearing the collapse moves fast. Whatever made this knife almost certainly has more. I've lost track of the days. This will probably be the last entry as I've been out of food for some time, and I'm down to my last batteries. Whoever finds this, if it gets found, will at least have some idea of what happened in the end. The tapping at the collapse was not coming from a rescue attempt. We lasted another day waiting on them, barely sleeping and watching the passage back down to the pool like hawks, before they broke through. It was quiet almost silent, just a scratching of gravel and mud before a big chunk of the collapse went sliding down the creek between us. The things that came through weren't human, though I struggled to place what one could class them as. They were tall, much too tall, and gaunt, flexible in a way that went beyond anything I've ever seen a man do. They moved like snakes, if that makes sense. It probably doesn't. The dark hasn't been kind to me down here. The faces were just as bad, broad-eyed with mouths that opened far too wide. They had a kind of centipede with them. It was large, the first thing through the gap in the rocks. I think it might have been digging for them. God knows how something like that works. It was the length of a man, pale and troglodytic, but seemed uninterested in us. It was the knife-making things that came hunting for us. 
Kirk was grabbed before we even knew what was happening. The centipede shocked us so badly we didn't really react until the things behind it had made it out into the open, and by then it was too late. They seemed enraged by the flashlights, but they just wrestled with Kirk blind, gashing at him with obsidian blades. It was only chance that set them on him before they got to me. If they had been just a few feet further to their left when they broke the barrier, Kirk would have been the one shivering in the dark down here while they did God knows what with me back up there. As it was, I scrambled down the creek with my pack, too terrified to worry about what a cowardly thing I was doing. I didn't think about the fact that I was running farther from the only route I knew towards the surface either. Getting away from there was all that mattered. There was another of them in the chamber with the pool, crouched near the water. It may even have been the same one that took Alan. They all look frightfully similar, though, so there's no way to tell. Regardless, I was on such an adrenaline spike after the run-in with the things up above that I didn't even stop. Just yelled at the top of my lungs as I ran past the pool towards the little passageway further in, swinging the flashlight. Whether I scared it or confused it, I don't know. It slid into the pool and went under, giving me just enough time to scramble up into the rearmost tunnels. Then I hurried in a crouch down the path that seemed more open. The ceilings were all low, so the progress wasn't great, but I was locked in an animalistic sort of flight uncaring where the destination might be as long as it was further away from the pale men crawling through the cave behind me. I hoped, in a dim, malnourished and petrified way, that I might be able to find some other exit down here, just as we'd originally planned. Maybe I'd smell pine nettles or pollen on the wind through some long-forgotten crevice in the forest floor overhead or spot a distant light in the darkness as the sun scratched its way down to me through the rock and stone. Neither of those things have happened. I scrambled for a long time, down the corridor I initially fled through and into a deeper complex of tunnels. I tried to be relatively quiet, but I also knew anything adapted for life in a cave system would hear even the slightest scuffle or footfall across the stone so I never let it slow me more than I could afford. There were splits and fractures in the path, forks in the tunnel system, and I always favored the ones which seemed to lead higher. Failing that, I would take the ones with the highest ceilings. Any minute I can spend on my feet rather than on my knees is a godsend, even now. About a day into the wandering, I heard strange noises, echoing my way from up ahead. It was something akin to shouting, but different somehow, as if the vocal cords were desiccated or malformed. I doubled back into a tight fissure which led off to the side of the path I'd been following. That's where I found it. At first, I thought I had found the surface. A sickly, yellowish glow wafted through the little opening. I turned off my flashlight shocked to see what I took to be the sun after so long. It wasn't the sun. I emerged high up along the side of a massive open space, overlooking the floor far below. The chamber was gigantic, the largest I've ever seen underground, easily the size of a sports stadium. A small waterfall trickled lazily from the jagged ceiling above into a deep sinkhole pool down below choking the cavern in a warm mist. Along its walls and amongst the stalagmites littering the ground, a sort of pallid golden lichen grew, the luminescent masses of it casting the entire space into dim, otherworldly color. Thousands of marble-white crickets crowding the natural roof scored the scene with their chirping song. I was likely much deeper than the deepest mapped reaches of Pine Hill Cave. I can't know for certain, but the rock layering on the walls makes me think that's the case. For all I know, my days spent running through the tunnels was actually many days, and it was all a sort of fevered dream episode. 
The warm mist of the waterfall on my face and the musty smell of the lichen makes me think otherwise, though. I stayed low, trying to remain silent, hopeful that the noises that scared me out of the main tunnel didn't follow me on to the little overhang on which I stood. I would have nowhere to go if they did. Only after a minute or two spent in silence did I spot movement along the lower reaches of the cavern's walls, jerking my attention down toward the cave's floor. Clambering out of a little alcove in the rock, its entrance seeming too tiny to allow so swollen and unnatural a figure to dwell there, one of the knife-making hunters showed itself. It slid down onto the ground, carrying a dish or skin to the pool to fetch water. It called out, making hyena-like guttural noises that sounded almost too brutal for speech in my ears. An answering voice called out in return from across the cavern. Soon, several of the things had crawled from their own alcoves in the rock, their elongated limbs scuffling noiselessly across the stone. They congregated around the pool, broken caricatures of men, vocalizing to each other. The longer I watched, the more certain I was that they were speaking. The noises were unnatural, but the cadence and the way pauses and breaks were laced throughout the speech seemed linguistic. I hugged the rock on the tiny platform I rested on for some time, until long after the little group had dispersed. More voices, if they can be considered voices, echoed to my ears from the crude dwellings in the rock face from time to time. Eventually, needing to be free of that disgusting yellow glow and the otherworldly voices in the cavern, I slunk back into the small tunnel, finding it silent once more. I've wandered for a long while, though I can't know how long. My watch is gone, left on the dry creek bed where Kirk was taken. I have found more of the villages as I've come to think of them, and heard more of the hunters lurching through the tunnels. I've had a few close calls, but I've been fortunate so far. These centipedes are the worst. I think they can smell or hear me better than the hunters somehow, and they've come crawling for me through the dark several times. I've always gotten away, but the hunters are never far behind. I probably don't have long. I'm going to make for the creek bed again, if I can find it. I'm too deep to find an exit down here, I think. I don't know if I'll be able to avoid being spotted on the climb back out, but it seems better than staying down here, where the things are so plentiful. I'm emptying the pack of everything except this logbook. The food's all but gone anyhow, and I'll need to travel light. If you've found this... Get out the way you came in, if you can. You aren't alone down here. The bag the log came from was hanging from a jagged stalactite on the ceiling of a little cave with a pool, one we've camped in on short spelunking trips several times. It was hard to see, and it certainly seemed old. We only found it because there were so many crickets making noise in the columns over there that I thought a rattlesnake had somehow meandered down there and went to check it out. I think the chamber might be the same one the writer is describing as their first campsite, but I can't be sure. I've looked into disappearances associated with the cave, and there are several. There was a pair of sisters who went missing in the late 90s and a boy whose family lives just up the railroad tracks, assumed to have drowned somewhere inside during a sudden rainstorm a few years back that flooded some of the tunnels. The one that interests me is a group of grad students from Eastern Kentucky University who were lost after entering the cave during a statewide trip to survey Appalachia's caverns in the summer of 1982. There was a small tremor during their time in the cave, and the failure to find them was laid at the feet of rockfalls and disturbed earth. They are assumed dead, and none of them have resurfaced. Two of the first names match the two mentioned in the logbook. I'm considering trying to look further into this, 
to try and discern whether or not this is some kind of elaborate fiction exercise taking cues from obscure old news stories that someone conducted to spook the hell out of wandering teenagers in the cave. It bothers me, though, that the backpack was hanging next to a small gap in the cave ceiling near the pool, almost invisible through the stalactites. I can't help but think it seems horribly similar to the one mentioned in the logbook. Lawton. Homeless would not have been the way I described myself in the early summer of 2004, but that is exactly what I was. To say it was my own fault would be an understatement, and part of me knew that even then but I wouldn't have broken down and told anyone that for any sum of cash or helping hand at the time, no matter the temptation. Ragged but practical, my old leather coat and cracked, battered hiking boots kept the constant rain of the June mornings just bearable enough for me to keep my pride. Pressing east along the roads, I shadowed. I forced one tired foot after the other out before me in a chain of ever-weakening steps that made every thought of my final destination seem a shallow sham, slapped low by the pain of blistered, wet ankles, and heels which cried out under even my dwindling weight. One hundred and ten miles I'd walked, moving through fifteen a day and holding fast to a limit of sixteen to spare my feet undue cruelty on the long path. Even with years of experience wandering the hills and hiking long spans in the low mountains and knobs of my home back west down the maze of uncaring roads and highways, the trip and my lack of real meals and provisions dragged me farther and farther towards surrender, especially as eastern Kentucky's rolling hills turned to mountains and the first echoes of the Appalachians yawned up to meet me. Telling myself I needed only go forty miles further to reach my destination in Huntington had been shoved aside early that morning, when the sun was still low enough on the horizon to peek through the storm clouds up above. Now that seemed an insurmountable obstacle, and having put most real thoughts of hope or relief aside, stubbornness and anger alone dragged me down the old country roads and across rickety bridges toward my destination my sole place of refuge. Nine days prior, I had informed my parents of my intention to drop out of classes at the University of Louisville and had returned home to Clarksville, about an hour south of Lexington. I'd begun in 2002 with every intention of pursuing a history degree and either continuing on up the chain of postgraduate study or becoming a teacher but my interest in any chosen field wasn't enough to shield me from all the problems that had been stalking me since before my arrival at college. Drinking had already been a vice before I left, but when I gained more ready access to alcohol and a place away from parents and direct observation to sleep off a nasty hangover or two, things got out of hand. Still, I managed to do passably during my freshman year. That wasn't to last. The untimely death of Warren Carter, a high school friend and great confidant of mine who shared many a midnight musing with me on our constant evening calls across the state, dragged me wholly into the pit. Loss might have been bearable if I had kept wider circles of friends, but outside of academic acquaintances, I was quite alone as a transplant in a new town. Magnifying the blow all the more was the fact that suicide was what had taken him from us, and I had been as blind as anyone in his family to any signs he might have been struggling so greatly. Guilty, alone, and attempting to avoid reflection, I burned a great deal of the money my parents had sent along for food and expenses on liquor bought through a roommate, and my temper began to drive off any friends I might have made in Louisville. When sophomore year ended, I was a wreck, 
and I stumbled home with all the apathetic arrogance I could muster. School didn't matter anymore, and neither did the future. Looking forward had handed me nothing but disappointment, so I was more than prepared to stop looking altogether. Parents often prove harder and more willful than their children assume they will, though, and upon hearing that I didn't aim to return to school and had no intention of finding a job back in Clarksville, fights broke out. Drinking was the biggest issue, and it didn't help that I had arrived drinking, the whole swerving ride home having been a stewing pot for this rancid moment. My father and I shouted back and forth until the night of the 8th had passed and the morning of the ninth had played out to sunrise, and with light beating down on the fields and wooded hills outside, I rounded up my belongings and stormed out, having my cheap cell phone and parent-furnished car keys snatched as I went. Slipping on my hiking pack, filling it with hastily gathered clothes and grabbing up all the camping gear I'd built up over years of traveling with my father and grandfather, I tucked some three hundred stashed dollars left over from my drained school account into my old boots and turned my back on home. I cringe now to think of myself back then, but in the moment I thought myself a regular Davy Crockett, prepared to stride out and find a way to make it in the world on my own giving the finger to the established law that was my parents. Warren was dead. My grandparents were half a continent away, and most other childhood friends I could call were off in colleges as widespread as California and Florida. My last hope was a close cousin of mine, Wilbur, whose small trailer home outside Huntington, West Virginia, lay only a couple weeks hard hiking away from me. He would give me a spot to sleep for a while at the very least, and though I had no interest in plotting out my goals farther than finding refuge in Huntington, I needed something to take my mind off my problems, something to make me feel proactive. Stranded for the first time on a horrifying yet exciting isle of independence, I needed to make myself move. Hiking to town along Highway 150 that morning and spending about a fifth of my money on the cheapest canned and dried food I could gather, I then wound east along the roads, planning to find more along the way. I stopped where I could, often hiding just off the highway in thick copses of trees or particularly tall and verdant patches of grass to cover up with my tarp and unfurl my sleeping bag my tent getting abandoned on the first night in favor of lighter travel. Evenings and nights in the open were long, and though I yearned for drink in a way that still rattles my thoughts years later, my age and a lack of willing buyers kept me away from gas station beer runs or cheap liquor sold in roadside hovels. When passing close to eastern Lexington on the third night of my trip, I raided the dumpster of a used bookstore and picked up an old Harold Lamb history on Hannibal of Carthage, and would read it during the still, cricket-scored nights when small-town streetlights or the light of a full moon allowed me to pick out the words without wasting the batteries I had in the sole flashlight I carried. Before long, I actually found myself enjoying the trek, staying dry when I could and buying cheap food at rest stops and fast-food joints along the rural routes after filling my water bottles in their bathroom sinks, each day another adventure to keep my mind from wandering back home or further afield to Louisville and months of aimless rambling and drinking. Days dragged, though, and by the time the 16th came, I was ragged as could be, only to find myself even more spread thin by the 18th, when morning found me forty miles from Huntington. Worse than all of this was that my copy of One Man Against Rome was muddied and falling apart in the recent rains, even within my pack. Despite having already finished it, rereading its pages put me at some ease while I waited for the dawn or looked forward to sleep, and having to abandon it left me sour indeed. Having moved six miles by noon at a snail's pace, and facing steeper and steeper hills as the eastern ridges loomed higher, I found myself relieved to see the community of Lawton picked out on a green sign nearly swallowed by trees off to the side of the roadway, its surface pocked and marred by several holes left by buckshot. 
I had never heard of the town, nor did I expect it to be bustling after days of passing sparse housing in the deep forested knobs and only sporadic traffic along the treacherous roads. But I needed to rest, and here I might find a gas station to grab a cold bottle of water and a sheltered tree line or barn in which to hide from the insistent bite of rain. As I rounded a long curve in the road between two small trailers set back in the trees away from view, I saw that even those modest hopes were a bit much. Lawton's main street, an unmarked and pothole-ridden section of Route 174, was flanked by just four buildings, most of which would be better described as ruins. One, perhaps an old service station, had burnt down and been left to wither in blackened piles in view of two larger, two-story buildings. Skeletal things I saw labeled as a mining company's laborer store and a schoolhouse, whose construction had long ago sunk into wholesale decadence. A larger home had sat just to the right of the old service station just twenty yards from the road, but the leaning pile had long ago tumbled in on itself, and sat decaying in the rain alongside its withered companions. Lawton was really and truly a ghost town, for most of the trailers and tiny homes along the rural roads all fed into the town of Olive Hill, some ten miles off, and no one had mourned the loss of the brutal old concrete and slab structures of older, poorer days. Feeling a little bit deflated, I wandered on still raw feet over to the front stairs of the school, and sat just to the front of its boarded and stinking entryway, lowering myself carefully with the aid of the rusted railings and only stressing my feet when absolutely necessary. Pulling the now split and discolored leather gloves I kept over my hands off and reaching into my pack, I pulled out the last of my small bags of gas station bought store brand beef jerky, sucking it down as if it were the finest cut of sautéed tender veal I'd tasted to date before going for my water bottle and draining what creek water I had left within it. I knew full well I might pay during my bowel movements that night for drinking this stuff without having boiled or treated it, but there had been no stores at which to replenish my water, and no spots to raise a fire without drawing attention from the road through the dark trees. There was no telling what was and wasn't private property out here, and I was many miles within the borders of exactly the kind of land my grandfather had often referred to as 12-gauge country. Even if you did get relatively lucky and find a patch of land that belonged to the Daniel Boone National Forest, you'd then have fire watchers and rangers to worry about. This was not the time to trespass without knowing full well just who you were dealing with, and I didn't know anyone out there in the metropolis that was downtown Lawton. Water spent, I bent my head and thought, Thankful for the sanity-saving shelter of the old school's entrance, but knowing I didn't dare risk staying long in the tottering building, given the collapse risk the place must pose. The town's structures were off the list of potential housing for the night, and though I hadn't seen a car in half an hour and the towering forested hills locking the valley in promised all the visual shelter I would need to fight the rain beneath a thick stand of trees and camp beneath my tarp, I was desperate for a night in relative luxury. I wanted a barn or shed, something to keep my thoughts from even drifting passively towards my aching, moisture-racked feet in their wrappings of damp socks. I needed to move just a bit more, to find somewhere safe to hole up for the night and fix up my spirits, especially with no gas station around to promise easy food and drink. The trip, and what little pride I had left after this long on the road, depended on it. Looking up and across the street, my eyes found the only branch away from the road here in Lawton's old center, a path I had initially taken for another gravel driveway or decayed parking space. Choked on either side by a wrecked service station and a house, it snaked behind these and up into the hills beyond the only indicator that it was anything other than a driveway being an old, beaten white marker which proclaimed the path to be Mushroom Road in dark, barely legible paint which had long ago gone to seed. I chuckled to myself and, 
looking down the road both to the east and west and seeing nothing that looked to be anything other than driveways, mustered up a new strength and rose, striding over the rain-beaten pavement and onto the crunching surface of the oddly named road beyond. The going was hard, especially given the condition of my feet and the exhaustion that had shrouded me since moving into the Appalachian foothills, but I managed. There was a rickety but seemingly passable old metal bridge over a creek, which promised to be a potential water source for me, but beyond filling my water bottle and a spare canteen in the backpack, I didn't bother to strike camp just yet. A stone sign across the bridge, not a hundred and fifty yards from where I'd left 174 and gone onto the gravel, proclaimed in weathered lettering that the land was the property of the Lynch Limestone Company, a name which had decorated the entryway of the store in town. And where there were defunct companies, there were likely to be defunct buildings. I only hoped I could find more sturdy lodgings than the store and the school farther uphill. Mushroom Road sloped upward so steeply after the creek had been passed and the forest had surrounded me in full that I doubted most average cars could easily get up the slick gravel path. Perhaps a sturdy truck or jeep, but even then they would be hard-pressed by some of the tight switchback curves and turns in the trail. Trudging up, though, I realized that a cinder-block wall stood perhaps a five-minute walk away up the trail through the trees, and I moved all the faster seeing that it was relatively straight and unbent by the time which had so crippled Lawton. The noises of the striking rain and the wind in the leaves above couldn't deter me now, not when salvation was so close. I almost smiled to myself when I crested the last rise in the trail and brought myself up to equal ground with the hulking cinder-block structure, and audibly laughed to myself when I saw that it had a tin roof which, while rusted, was on a square building with sturdy sides. I had found my fortress, a place to rest and catch my breath after far too long on the road. Slightly raised from the grass and scrub-choked ground on a concrete foundation, a ramp led up to a thin doorway through which was the one-room interior, a wide, open storage space perhaps as big as a football field. A few stacks of aged wooden pallets dotted the floor, but for the most part it was an empty and dry space, only a few leaks here and there breaking through the roof to puddle upon the ground. Crossing the place with my flashlight out, I saw that the opposite end of the building featured a raised stone platform with a cheap, warped desk and several chairs sitting atop it, all backed by a large square opening, which might have been a loading bay at one time, but which now lacked a door to block it from the woods beyond. Light breached the building fairly well over here, and as I worked my way up onto the dusty platform, I shut off the flashlight, knowing I might need the battery as the night drew in. Checking the desk's top for old papers and stock documents, and finding none before looking to the chairs, I brushed one off and rested my pack on it, leaving it as I moved up to the loading bay and looked out. The rain-soaked woods seemed thick all around the sides of the building in which I stood. But back here a clearing opened up, with only sparse patches of tall grass and scrub to break the shattered pavement of an old parking lot or work area. Most immediate in my eyes, though, was the slope of bare, cracked limestone seventy or eighty yards off, a sheer rise which may well have been quarried back to give the Lynch Company space to build on the steep hillside. Into that vertical surface, their mouths gaping and grinning back at me through the mist and rain of morning as it filtered into noon, had been carved the shadowed and rough-cut entrances of a mine. Tapping my foot against the cool, shaded stone of my newly claimed home and downing my freshly filled canteen, I watched water pour from a slow stream's terminal at the top of the man-made cliff's peak and add to a deep pond which filled the wide maw of one of the passages, the pattering noise of the waterfall barely audible through the general din of the rain. Behind those mouths rose pockmarks on the already assaulted stone, profanity and initials marked out in graffiti decorating the walls of the mines just beyond the entrances even in this lonely place. 
The exterior of this rear portion of my building bore those marks, too. And looking down the four or so feet to where the raised platform from which the loading dock opened came into a halt, I saw the hushed glimmer of many broken glass bottles, the trophies of several drinkers' evenings apparently spent in the very spot I'd chosen to stake my claim. Growing more impressed by the sight every moment, I took up my flashlight again and lowered myself from the little ledges into the weeds, rocks, and glass, meaning to get a feel for the area before I settled in too much and caught up on much-needed rest. Weary feet, almost forgotten, I crunched across the rough patch just beyond the storage building and traversed the little clearing beyond, noting that there were a few old pieces of furniture and a wrecked bed frame scattered about. The derelict mine was likely little more than a dumping ground now, but every step closer made me realize just how massive the whole complex must be. Five openings led into the mine, and even without my light on I could see in the glow of the gloomy day outside that the space inside was a grid, with rough walls and ceilings flanking crisscrossing tunnels which were about twenty feet wide by twenty feet tall wide enough to move moderately sized digging equipment and whole groups of men through at a time. It looked like a subterranean quarry, with all the chutes cut horizontally to make a single-floor complex, and when I disrupted the blackened, dusty innards of the place with my flashlight's powerful beam, I could see no farther than twenty rows or so of intersecting tunnels before the mist and dust of the complex snuffed out my sight. Kneeling and gripping a heavy stone, I tossed it as far as I could along the rocky hall in front of me, listening to the echo of its clatter as it rolled and hearing no hint of a nearby end to the sprawling shadow. Enthralled as I was with the mine itself, I cursed that I hadn't kept more batteries in my pack, knowing I had only those in my flashlight and a single, lonely D-cell to back them up. It would not do to waste the things poking around on an exploration of the mine. Jointly, even as I berated myself for not having the equipment to enter, the whining wail of the wind shifting through those long, vacant stone pillars drifted past me in the cool air of the passage's mouth, and I shuddered. Fascinating it certainly was, but it was eerie as hell, too and it wouldn't do to dwell on that when it would lurk so close after nightfall, and the clearing between me and the limestone mines was cloaked in masking shadow, a thought which brought my mind to fire. Wide and tall as the entryway to the back of the storehouse was, it would make an excellent sight for a fire, letting most of the smoke escape through the wall along with most of the heat which suited me just fine given how hot most of the nights were if you could extract yourself from the rain. That, combined with the height of the entrance, would keep most wandering animals away. But the open front entrance might be a concern. I was getting farther into the mountains and farther away from active roads, and while it was not terribly likely that black bears were thick in the area, it was a distinct possibility. They aren't generally violent, but they are definitely curious, and I would much rather do a half-hour's work now to make sure they stayed away during the night than wake up in the wee hours to find one rifling my pack, six or seven feet from my head. All that to say, I needed firewood and a makeshift door before I settled in, and while I could burn the wet wood out in the forest, it would not make for good fire-starting material. Pallets like those in the storage building flanked one of the clear tunnels not far in, though and most were not in good shape. The stray boards and splinters, bone dry after decades underground, would make perfect tinder. Keeping my light high, I pressed a few feet into the mouth of the tunnel nearest the pallets and made for the piles. Breathing in felt like sniffing sand once you were well and truly inside, and I found my eyes stung by the hanging dust of the place. Traveling the twenty or thirty feet to the wood, I slipped my gloves back on and began collecting an armful, my ears once again being assailed by the whine of the wind and the passages all around me, its wail mixing hauntingly with the pattering sound of water from outside. Wood creaked in protest as I pulled it from the pallets or clattered as I groped for it in the shadows, 
mindful of spiders in the piles. Every sound was a cacophony in the stifling air, seeming to break the looming atmosphere and make evident the presence of a lone intruder, this meek wanderer looking for comfort, on the precipice of the beyond nocturnal world which sprawled out just beyond the grasp of my electric light. Like Roman legionnaires at Cannae, I felt surrounded, suddenly drowned in more nervousness than I'd felt in all my days and nights on the road, despite my close proximity to the exit. I rose, now holding five fair-sized planks and a great many smaller pieces, and threw my flashlight's beam all around, almost expecting some lightning-fast assailants to fling themselves out of the shadow at me before I had time to so much as think about stepping towards the exit. Nothing awaited my searching light but the still decay of mounded wood and the looming dark stone of the place's walls, a discarded container of spray paint or a crushed beer can here and there being the only interruption to time's marching order of moldering disintegration. I shook my head, standing for a moment in self-shaming silence before making for the light outside. Two rats that had been foraging quietly somewhere in the dark darted through the tunnel's maw, just as I did, and I was momentarily grateful to be alone, so that my exaggerated flinch at their flurry of movement went unnoticed by all save the rodents and myself. Exhaling and vigorously shaking my head in a short burst as if a show of force might remove whatever fear lingered in me, I stalked back across to the back of the storage building and mounded the wood just to the side of the loading doorway, keeping my gaze forward and my back to the mine. I would not let the shadows of an old quarrying operation scare me away from the best hideaway this whole trip had coughed up for me. Only when I had finished did I allow myself a glance over the shoulder, and I found nothing amiss save my own shaky demeanor. Snorting audibly at myself, despite the startled shakes still playing themselves out at my fingertips, I brought my mind back to the task at hand and hoisted myself up into the building again. I grabbed a light crowbar and hatchet that rested in the main pocket of my pack and went back out into the rain, pulling back my hood and letting the drops cool me a bit after I realized the fall was growing less steady. Making for a pile of several dressers and a table out in the clearing, I set about breaking up this partially soaked and rotten trash, unwilling to go back towards the mouth of the mine despite my self-deprecation. Never would I have given voice to it at the time should someone else have come wandering along the gravel road just then to ask me about it, but something about the mine didn't feel right. Interesting, yes, but too oppressive too filled with wailing wind and dripping water to stand for long. Burying it in work, I was soon too absorbed in the destruction of old furniture to let my imagination run wild, the fear turning to a dull thud rather than a pounding roar and receding into the depths. I knew it might return, though, and so took some joy in spotting another project to busy myself with on one of my trips back to the storage buildings to deliver wood. Off on the hill, sloping down away from the mine site, was resting a horrendously damaged and grimy mattress, likely that of the bed frame which rested not far from the garbage pile I now attacked for fuel. Once the pile in the big storage shed was sizable enough for me to feel confident relying on it and the few pallets already stacked in the lower portion of the building, I got to work dragging the mattress uphill and around the building towards the front, tramping down a path through the brush along its sides when necessary and moving the thing in short bursts to give my tired legs time to rest. Once I got it out front to the face of the cinder block behemoth, I slid it up the concrete ramp built into the foundation and through the open entryway, lodging it firmly into the small doorway. Back around to the rear of the building I went and, climbing in once more, I then dragged a pallet over to the door's interior and added its weight to the barricade, leaning it up against the barrier and sliding a few errant cinder blocks up to the base to seal the deal. It was no castle gatehouse, but it would hopefully deter any wandering bears drawn to the smells of camp, 
along with any expeditions of local teenagers looking to brave the mine. Water was the last thing to see to, and then some much-needed rest could be gotten. I was out after depleting the water bottle howling wood, and with several sources nearby I would be a fool to let the opportunity for refills go to waste. Striding back across the shadowy innards of the storage building, I climbed the cracking old staircase to the loading platform and got my canteen and water bottle out of the pack, along with a little tin mug I used for boiling water, and then turned for the open air again. My eyes found the mine's mouths, and I halted, unsure of myself. Considering my options, I actually began debating whether I really wanted to return to the maw of that subterranean maze, or whether I wanted to hike for ten minutes back down the mountainside to fetch water in the stream below. Every rational thought in my head told me to walk back across the clearing and make for the pooling water beneath the clear, clean stream coming down from above the cliff, but some animal part of my brain grated up against all that its sandpaper warnings desperate for a retreat from this damp, gloomy hillside, however momentary. For a minute and more I stood and debated, but when the time came and I slid down from the loading platform to crush once more the shattered glass pooled below my chosen camp, it was around the building and towards the road I went, not back towards the mine. The path down was rather easy, it was the trip back up the steep incline that I dreaded. I filled my bottle, canteen, and mug near a babbling, soft set of rapids, the rushing water being a safer bet than the more stagnant and slow stints of creek. Then I turned back, humming aimless and disjointed tunes to no one and attempting to convince myself that this inane trip had been undertaken due to a desire to wander a bit, rather than due to unfounded fear. Every step brought me closer to a comfortable rest, but also closer to the mine. Every step brought me closer to my newly claimed and mildly fortified home for the night, but also closer to the mine. I found myself dreading the crest of the last rise as my calves ached and my feet cried out for relief, dreading the rounding of the stone building through the tall grass and trees, dreading the first glimpse of the mine. But again, despite all that inner worry and tremor, the dark mouths across the way held nothing but rock and graffiti for me when I came back into their company, just as they had when I'd left them. I don't usually make it my business to talk aloud to myself, but there was some muttered cursing and chastising as I crawled back up through the loading door, careful to place my filled mug in a safe spot before ascending. Wasting no time, I pulled a plastic bag filled with a mixture of old and dried orange peel and torn scrap paper plucked from dumpsters and piled it out before the opening, perhaps two feet back from the ledge. Around this, I built the shielding dome of the dried wood from the mine, along with the more sheltered portions of the drawers I had disassembled outside, and soon I had my knife in hand, striking it on the flint stick that tucked into its sheath and blowing lightly yet eagerly on any sparks I managed to bring out. Some time passed, but eventually a spark took, and fortunately, I didn't need to search for further material. Some of the larger chunks of wood from the tunnels caught, and with their heat, I was able to catch some of the furniture, which in turn would aid with the rest. My fire was finally set, and pushing my mug with cautious gloved hands up to the brightest of the glowing planks, I sat on the concrete in silence and tended my little flame. Thirty minutes and more passed before the fire brought the mug's contents to a steady bubble, but I didn't mind the wait. For the first time in a few days I had a real camp, and now that I knew I wouldn't be fooling around with the knife striking flint all evening trying to get a blaze off the ground and going, there was nothing to do but try and relax. I had removed my shoes when the fire first took, and I now removed my socks, laying both the more recent soggy pair and the other damp pairs from my pack out on a nearby cinder block and drying them near the heat, being as conservative with my gathered wood as I could to keep from exhausting the pile. 
Blisters were cleaned as best I could manage with boiled water and a relatively unsoiled rag, and then I moved to one of the old metal chairs, propping my feet up in the other and shifting it closer to the flame. Relaxing doesn't even begin to describe that feeling, not after all the stumbling and limping along I had done over the past few days. Despite all of that, though, some nagging part of my mind remained with the holes in the cliffside across the clearing, and I kept my chair facing them over the fire, so that when nerves grew too strained, a light glance would soften my worry again. I tried not to think of how I would cope with rising nerves when the nearly moonless, cloudy night came and the tunnels became all but invisible. Checking the cheap and blocky weatherproofed watch I kept in the pack, I saw it was just past four, a surprise given how drowsy I was beginning to feel. Like a toddler fighting sleep, I leaned into a doze again and again only to jerk myself awake at the last moment, returning to my vigil over the fire. Deciding I'd better get what food I had together and fix myself some dinner, I dragged out the two packets of oatmeal I had saved setting my last granola bar away from these and hoping it was not all I would eat tomorrow. The mug made a makeshift bowl, and I ate the watery mixture in silence, a spoon lost earlier on the trip forcing me to drink the stuff rather than eat it by the spoonful. Hardly had I cleaned the mug and set it back against the flame to boil a bit of the canteen's water when my head bobbed, and this time I didn't try to fight it. I'd come up here to rest, and I meant to rest. Mine be damned. Sleeping in the metal, armless chairs wasn't the grand spot, but it wasn't the most uncomfortable thing I had done on my trip. My sleeping bag could be left aside with the heat of the fire to keep me warm and dry, and so my mind was left to wander as I shifted uncomfortably on my perch and found what dreams I could. Though I remember none of them, I'm certain that's a good thing. When again I opened my eyes, feeling almost more tired than I had when going to sleep and nearly questioning whether I had truly done so, I was fast told by the watch that what had felt like a blinking nod had been four hours, and eight o'clock had already come and gone. Stoking the low fire and blowing its embers back into service, I had it going along at a steady rate before long and taking the time to listen, heard that the rain striking the tin roof had slowed to an absent-minded trickle. Knowing that the shadows all around me were long indeed, I fought the urge to look out towards the mines. Rubbing the sleep from my eyes, reminding myself that there hadn't ever been anything to see, and mechanically setting about checking my drying socks to see how the process was coming along, I promised myself I wouldn't indulge in another look. After all, doing so would only get my mind whirring again just before sunset, and make the night all the more dragging while I imagined all sorts of encounters that would keep me twitching and jumping through the whole blind, infuriatingly creepy cycle. Unfortunately, my conviction didn't last through more than five minutes of frequent watch references and scans of the wood supply. Standing and pretending for an audience of no one that I had done so to stretch my tired legs and back rather than scan the other side of the clearing, I swept my eyes across the rock of the cliff face, its light limestone surface speckled with what aging rays from the oncoming sunset could reach the place through the dissipating cloud cover and the woods blanketing the mountains. Shadowy entrances, broken stone, sloppy graffiti, bent scrub and dry grass. For the moment, the rain had halted its offensive, and despite the coming of the night, the mines were there clear as they had ever been, not a stone out of place. The leftmost still wound off at an odd angle. The central few displayed their banners of broken glass and spray paint. My eyes stopped cold then, my mind struggling for a moment as it attempted to catch up. My self-insulting snort caught like a bloodied, scared animal in a vice before it could be delivered. Mountainside, fire, storehouse, and all might as well have melted away, leaving just me in that lone, dusk-cloaked cavern in the sodden wilderness. 
There, in that last tunnel, the rightmost opening, whose mouth puddled into a pond, and whose rocky corridor was filled mostly with a shallow stream running backwards into the darkness, perhaps ten or fifteen feet back from that aperture in the unforgiving cliff, a shape loomed. From behind a tall yet leaning pile of pallets partially submerged in the incoming water poked a pale form I was certain hadn't been there at all prior to this very moment, given the number of furtive glances I had thrown in the direction of that cursed crag. White next to the near blackness of the old wood it was, and though distance in the coming night kept me uncertain, I could swear in the decaying light of that dying and stormy day as I stared at a pallid shape I couldn't place. Two wide, staring pools of soft, reflected light gleamed back from the darkness. To say that my heart froze and my body locked as if frozen down to the tips of my fingers would be cliché, but to say otherwise would be to lie, and no good will come of relating this story if I can't manage to be as transparent as possible in the retelling. All my self-assurance, all my tentative intellectual posturing, all the hours safely spent in the dark along my long road east, all these went straight to hell as I stared into that man-made cave mouth and tried to judge whether I was seeing what I thought I saw. Like a shocked child searching some infernally challenging picture puzzle, I narrowed my eyes and tried to breathe deeply, measuring every inhale and exhale my mouth just slack enough that I could feel the rusty, earthen rottenness of that pit on the breeze. The rain was gone, but the wind remained, and the howl of its passage through the column-lined cavernous maze was maddening in the unnaturally quiet woods which loomed sinister all around, almost driving me to cringe as might the squeal of metal ground against metal. Through it all, those shallow, broad spaces of yellowish reflection stared, not a single tremor or blink giving pause to their vigil. Minutes must have passed, each one an eternity there upon the storage building's exposed loading platform. I must be a ragged and dark yet vividly clear outline to any who looked on from the cliff, my every moment cast in the orange tint of the fire and magnified by the huge open shadow behind me a fact I was beginning to become painfully aware of. Having seen no movement at all for so long, having stood staring so very intently, I forced myself to wonder, veered back into the realm of sanity, lest I turn tail, hop from the platform, and run, panting and scrambling across the storehouse, into the dusk like a madman. There were plenty of rocks prone to holding mineral deposits, large or small, scattered across Kentucky. Had I missed some broken stone long fallen from the mine ceiling earlier in the day? Some geode split open and laid out atop a pallet in the mine whose sparkling viscera even now glittered in the near-dead daylight? Then, as fast as they had seized me, the distant reflections let me slip quietly from their grip, the last of the worst fear shuddering itself out of my extremities as I first scanned the whole of that open, flooded tunnel for the slightest sign of movement, and then turned my attention to the pallets, hard-pressed to decide whether this was a good or bad development. Though I know not how it had happened, for it must have been striking and quick enough for a blink or twitch in my observation to cloak any movement, the shape had gone both the pale object and its wide, reflective pools having vanished. Left behind was only the mine's watery patter, as the small waterfall from the stream mouth above fed its gnawing underground channel, the shadow of the rubble and ill-kept entryway's ruin, and the feeling of uneasy sickness left in my stomach by the confusing thing I had just witnessed. Watching was not a strong enough word for the vigil I kept on the place as the minutes slipped past me there in the deepening shadow. Questioning my own sanity, I scanned all the entryways in turn, paying special mind to the flooded channel. None were out of the ordinary, and not a single stone or cracked wall caught my attention. All were empty, 
vessels without occupants, as they had likely been for decades prior to my feet finding the winding road which led here. There arose in me a desire to retreat down the mountain before dark wholly settled in, to reach the ghost town down below and try my luck the better part of a mile off in one of the shattered school's rooms, but I quickly shot the notion down. I had ten or fifteen minutes before true night, and the woods would be anything but comforting at this hour. I would be just as uneasy and jittery on a walk down to the town, and I knew that. The only thing that could justify such a move was if there was, indeed, something in the mines that ought to be avoided, and I was definitely not ready to concede that. Every moment spent distancing myself from the gripping sight of those eyes was another in which I shored up what courage I had, and reminded myself that I was out on my own, striking off on the road east, not willing to bend a knee and put out a call for help. Even talks with my cousin had been avoided on the walk up save a call from a gas station in East Lexington to ensure my coming wouldn't be a burden. I had been sucked into this morass, and now I alone would be responsible for pulling myself out. Gritting my teeth and narrowing my eyes in an effort to force myself into at least mild surety, I donned my dried socks and boots before taking up my flashlight in my left hand and sliding down from the loading platform beginning my way across the ever-darker span between myself and the mine, keeping my crowbar handy at my right side in case my mind and the scenery hadn't been playing tricks on me in the dark. There would be nothing there when I arrived, I knew. Repeating that mantra to myself, I made the internal promise that only if some shadow of Satan himself spit angrily out of the mine mouth would I allow myself to act the child here and run through the dark down the mountain. Otherwise, it was right back to the storehouse, my fire, and my sleeping bag. Forty miles to go might have been a small leg compared to the distance I'd already covered, but forty miles was still forty miles, and even if I didn't get a wink of sleep out here tonight, I was determined to keep my feet dry and rested for once after long days in the damp. Approaching the flooded aperture... I scanned the shadowy scenery that waited just within, pallets and a few piles of stones the first things to strike me. The remainder of the passage beyond sprawled into shadow not far from where I stood, leaving me to marvel again at the misty dark of that long, choked night in the tunnels. My grip tightened on the crowbar unconsciously, my mind only registering the act when my nails began to bite deep into my palm. In the clear trickling water pooled in that torn portal, despite the disturbance caused by the light waterfall, I could see that the stone floor lay a solid two or more feet down below the surface out past the shore, and that the stack of pallets, whose height I might have placed around seven feet on its own, was actually taller. The nine or more feet of its tottering, aged bulk were crowned now with only the dust and grime that years in this yawning damp had left but its proximity gave me more cause to shiver. Almost scared of the consequences, I flicked on the flashlight and bounced it around the tunnel, but was met by nothing but a deeper grasp of the dusty black. No reflection save that of the water glared back at me, and no noise save that of the waterfall and that awful, screeching wind in the columns could be heard. With one last look up to the peak of that sodden wooden pile, I made myself turn for my shelter in the flickering light of the fire again, telling myself off for my foolishness. This time there was no solid restraint, though, and the walk was punctuated with many glances over my shoulder and scans of the surrounding mine mouths. When I had at last put the fire back between me and the clearing beyond and seen to it that the creaking warehouse in which I stood was empty of reflective eyes and lurking figures... The sun had well and truly gone, leaving me alone in a night whose darkness was bested only by the ebon openings across the clearing. My chair still positioned facing those holes in the rock, I set my now empty mug back to boil, leaned back, and settled in for what I knew even then would be a sleepless, mentally draining night. Thinking back on those hours now, at a distance, they seem long and arduous. 
Those words don't even begin to describe how they felt when I was trudging through them, though. My trip off the platform to have a piss in the broader low segment of the building was a calculated, considered risk. Treks to the woodpile next to the looming doorway were short but treacherous narratives sprinkled with furtive glances, and second takes at branches swaying in the breeze. Voyages over to my pack to refill the boiling mug with water were dangerous affairs, followed up by long, cautious scans of the clearing outside, which occasionally featured the flashlight, momentarily taken up despite my paranoid battery conservation to ward off the encroaching mystery of the sheltered ground beyond. Crowbar close at hand beside the chair, I waited, eyes on the flooded breach out beyond the fire's light which stood only as a black haze through the heat and smoke, boots firmly on despite how good I knew it might feel to kick up my feet bare by the fire again. Then, each time I felt an eternity must have slipped by in the company of the mine's wailing song on the wind, a long delayed glance at my watch would let me know that twenty or thirty minutes had passed since the last glance, and my soul would melt just a little at the knowledge that hour upon hour still lay between me and the dawn. By midnight, my watch on the fire became more pronounced, though, and by two I stopped carrying my crowbar with me to the woodpile. Not a flinch had stirred in the night beyond the flame, and with less than four hours left until dawn, the bulk of the night was over and done with. I was far from at ease, for my eyes still found the mine as often as the flames, but I allowed myself distraction, taking up a pin pulled from a gas station trash can along with a bright piece of cardboard only partially marred by a beer logo found in the lower part of the building, to doodle like a small child. I distinctly remember sketching the crude outline of legionnaires on foot, struggling against elephants and cavalry, but I've forgotten what became of that hobo's canvas. The act spared my mind a bit of the tedium and torture of the wait, and with much greater ease than before, I found myself looking down at a watch that read four. So close was the morning that I could almost taste it on the sky peeking through the clouds, less than two hours holding its relief back from me. These were things which I desperately needed to know, for despite the nap I'd gotten before nightfall, The trip and the heat of the fire were conspiring to make me painfully drowsy in the face of the wail of the wind in the old stone not far away. Several times during that span I nodded off in the chair for a moment only to reawaken in a jolt as the image of two pale reflective pools of light leered at me from memory and forced me alert, bringing me to my feet so I could send sleep running and scan the now familiar rock face beyond the clearing. Thus was passed another hour, nervous and shaky, fruitless observations of the gloomy area around my fortress doing little to reassure me. Not long after five had come and gone, though, I drifted off once more after a final, flashlight-aided scan of the outdoors. There is no way to know how long I was out, but given that the sun was not yet rising when I awoke, the sleep could not have been long. This time, it was not a memory or the roots of some nightmare which jolted me, nor was it the creaking of the roof which had so often caused me to glance at the opposite door and its mattress barricade. There came to my ears, through the now accustomed noise of the wind and the drip of water and the crackle of flame, a new and altogether more frightening sound, natural and instantly recognizable even in the haze of sleepy pre-dawn. The noise was enough to grip me so thoroughly that I held my eyes shut against the wakefulness into which I'd been tugged, now more than certain that the next observation of the cursed clearing would not be fine, knowing that the next whirling scan of my surroundings would not yield nothing. What I had felt before dusk at the sighting of those pools in the mine was nothing by comparison, for that had been potentially hallucinatory potentially dismissible. This was tangible, and it was easily understood, and most awful of all, it was unbearably close. Just beyond the flame, 
somewhere in the night beyond the shallow defense of the slight drop to the ground and my campfire. The glass in the rocky clearing outside shifted and crunched softly, its coming barely audible, the settling crackle of its displacement speaking to weighty but cautious movement. In my frightfully light sleep, though, it was enough to stop my heart and freeze all motion down to my fingers and toes. Not even the strongest of winds had shifted that trash in the sparse gravel and grass of the open ground before the doorway. Only my boots had seen to that, and with me here next to the fire, that left only one possibility. Someone had stepped into the glass carpeting the ground before the doorway though it took all my willpower not to shake or burst into unconsidered motion at the thought. It also meant that whoever this someone was should even now be just two or three yards off, so close to the fire they could touch the flame if they desired. Fire sweeping through an aged library or an avalanche barreling down a slope would compare well with the process going on behind my closed eyes. Even with only a few seconds separating the coming of the noise and the opening of my eyes, plans of attack and retreat which had likely been stewing under the surface of my thought all through the night welled up and formed in the fore of my mind. Crowbar near at hand, a twitch of the arm would yank the thing up to my side while my chair was kicked back and I faced whatever snooping visitor had come so close to a clearly inhabited building. With the flashlight still in my lap and ready for use, this could serve as a secondary weapon if my guess at the crowbar's location proved incorrect, and I found myself on my feet and unarmed. From there I could decide whether to retreat or confront whatever awaited me. Stealing myself as best I could and gritting my teeth against my nerves, I forced myself to act with jerking, hesitant force, each minute twitch of my eyelids as they opened an almost painful experience. Once they'd been peeled back far enough to give me a glimpse of the space beyond the fire, though, the plans flew away. There would be no grasp for the crowbar or stand before the light of the fire. I was fortunate in that moment of shocked terror that I had a mind to keep hold of my flashlight, for when I fled into the farther reaches of the warehouse, throwing myself from the raised platform without a care for the height, and skittering across the dirty floor with all the manner of a mouse caught pilfering a pantry, I otherwise took only what had been on me at the time of my awakening. The pack, the energy bar, my water, and all the rest of my gear were left forgotten on that platform in the storage building next to my dying fire. For all I know, they are still there on that shadowed mountainside these many years on gathering dust and grime with the passage of cruel years. Never in all my time spent studying and living in the region since have I ever dared return, even by car, to rotten and worm-eaten Lawton, much less the mine and its looming outbuilding. My memory of the place will forever be tainted by my hours there that night, and what I saw when sleep and worry had both been tossed free and I had allowed my eyes to find once more the space beyond the flame. Over that low pyre of discarded furniture and mine pallets, masked in the haze that had long hung low over the fire's now sputtering and sluggish flame, the familiar pools of light gleamed back at me. Even in my position atop the platform and slightly removed from their place outside the warehouse, they were a great deal farther from the ground than I, seeming massive at that negligible distance. Amber, empty discs set in a pallid, slippery frame, its shape vaguely human and its gaunt, bony structure conjuring up images of starving victims even through the blessedly vague veil of smoke. This company I found only for a moment before I tumbled back over the chair in which I sat and made like a fool for the far doorway, desperate to put distance between myself and those otherworldly things which I could no longer deny were eyes. Fortified mattress blown over and vaulted in a display of agility and strength I didn't consider possible in my beleaguered state, 
I made for the woods with all the haste I could muster, my feet crying out under the strain as I crunched across the broken, decayed pavement. In those few seconds it took to reach the gravel path and begin my blind and panting descent in the dark, though, the worst glimpse was caught as my head reflexively took in a last scan of the now unbarred forward doorway, its dark frame backlit by the distant light of my fire on the other side of the warehouse. Poking from the doorway like an exaggerated scarecrow, naked flesh bright even against the pale concrete and shoulders above the highest portion of the perhaps ten-foot split in the building's side, the gangly pursuer from the mine leered, its eyes now merely outlines in the dimness of the early morning, night once again blessing me with only a vague glimpse of its sunken, awful features. Sitting in safety now, I tell myself it cannot have been the case. But in that terrible second before the descent, heart thrumming like an engine in my ears and stomach churning at the fright I'd just received, I swear it looked as if more eyes peeked and glared from alongside the towering onlooker, stooped and crowded into the doorway to get a better view of the fleeting youth, who not a minute before had been within reach just beyond the fire. I descended the mountain in a flailing, aimless sprint after that, only stopping to catch my breath when the lights of the trailers and cabins near Lawton gleamed from either side of an actual paved road, and even the gutted school and its crumbling companions had been put far behind me. That morning I forsook my promise of self-reliance and began hitching rides the remainder of the way to Huntington bumming soda or extra water off those who had it in their cars until I reached my cousin. I didn't have it in me to wander in the mountains alone and unguarded for another couple days after that morning in Lawton, not even with the mines so far off behind me. There were countless mines and even more natural caves in these hills, I knew, and despite the hatefully rational explanations I dreamt up for what I had fled from in the dark, outside the limestone mines. On some level I knew I had not been hallucinating, dreaming, or fabricating noises. Whatever I had seen that summer night in the hills, I had no wish to ever see it again. I'm proud to say I turned things around after finding factory work in Huntington and building up a solid foundation of cash, but... What sent me stumbling from my final campsite has left me permanently shaken. I don't know that I will ever again feel comfortable driving through the hills at night or trekking alone in the forests of eastern Kentucky. I went back to school, finished and pursued postgraduate study, finding an excuse to move west into the plains a year or two after graduation, where I received a doctorate in history. I've enjoyed my position at a museum in Kansas City, and while it isn't luxurious, it is comfortable and more than fulfilling. Relatives were told the move was for career purposes, and that explanation has long seemed to suffice, but lack of enthusiasm for return trips and family outings back home has been a bit more difficult to deal with. There is part of me who wishes their mutterings about burnt bridges and broken ties were justified. Part of me that wishes family troubles were all that kept me away. But I know better. Somewhere back east, still disturbing my sleep from states away, there lurk things in the ground that neither I nor anything I've read or researched can explain. Somewhere Beneath the rotten and decaying cores of tiny hamlets in the Kentucky hills dwells something which I can't understand, something a great deal more terrible than rough memories. Some ten hours away by car I stand safe and sound, however, and unless I'm dragged back kicking and screaming, that is exactly where I mean to stay. I put this pin to the proverbial paper now, only to give myself some small amount of closure through reflection and, perhaps more importantly, to warn off any in the region who find themselves intrigued by the caves and mines of Kentucky. Whatever your interest or inclination, I would advise steering clear. You just might be spotted by something equally intrigued by you.
As a civil inspector in Ohio, I spent most of my time scouring overpasses and government building projects. If there was a fault in a foundation or an oversight on a public blueprint, it was my job to sniff it out. The work was dull, but straightforward, and I liked it that way. I wouldn't get rich, but the position was comfortable, and I could leave my house each morning secure in the knowledge that today would be much like yesterday. That comfort was stolen from me in the spring of 2019 by Cincinnati's derelict subway tunnels, and I haven't worked a day in civil inspection since. In the early morning hours of March 3rd, a tiptoeing earthquake rattled windows in Georgetown, a small community along the Kentucky border. It was so subtle that most residents weren't roused from sleep, a passing shudder of this table or that floor lamp all that spoke to the creeping seismic activity beneath the soil. Generally, this wouldn't have meant anything to a Cincinnati-based civil inspector living 40 miles away, but cruel circumstance would make it my problem. Someone associated with the city government, whose home was along Brighton Avenue, started raising stink about a dip in the roadway that jolted the passing traffic. Supposedly, the problem was a sudden development. The word about the tiny Georgetown trimmer reached Cincinnati, and suddenly every voice in local government was ablaze with references to structural stability, theorizing about sunken ground or displaced earth. The long-abandoned, half-completed subway system beneath the city ran right under Brighton, which only served to throw more fuel on the fire. Despite the fact that there had been no measurable trimmers in Cincinnati, it was fast decided by people with frayed nerves and few wits that an inspection was needed. No one wanted to be the one who was fingered for doing nothing if anything went wrong so dollars would have to be spent to see if a minuscule earthquake had managed to shatter several feet of concrete from 40 miles away. When straws were drawn to see who would get that not-so-illustrious job, my name came up. Though I didn't see any reason to justify the city's worry, I wasn't about to turn down burning through a paid afternoon strolling an empty tunnel for my wages. I've tried to work out an excuse I could have used to escape that ill-fated patrol, but there was no way for me to know what lay in store for me. In my mind, this was yet another case of an easy day for easy pay, and I make it my habit not to question easy pay. The day started out innocuous enough. Sunny, unseasonably warm, relatively quiet. I took the keys I'd been given to the large, gated entrance near I-75, the rumble of passing traffic muffling any reservations I might have about the tunnel that waited beyond. Only when the large metal doors swung shut behind me and the roaring traffic dwindled to a stifled drone did I feel apprehension. There are two parallel tracks making up the larger portion of the completed tunnels, separated by a central concrete wall. The wall is punctuated here and there with cramped six-foot-high access passages, meant to give maintenance crews the ability to slip from one to the other on foot. There was very little actual railway, though, the money having dried up far before the final stages of construction. Even the graffiti felt old and outmoded, for the city had stepped up security at the locked entrances two decades ago in the interest of safety, much to the chagrin of wandering teenagers and cold homeless residents, I'm sure. Light spilled in from the metal grate above the doors at my back, but it was fast swallowed by the yawning mouth of the tunnel ahead. The noise of each breath I took seemed to cascade down its darkened interior like applause, amplifying each rise and fall each scuffle of my hands against denim as I raised a flashlight from my belt and banished a bit of the shadow. My first step sent a stray stone skipping along the time-stained concrete and, foolish as I knew it was, my heart leapt at the sound. I forced myself to move forward, 
keeping myself distracted by scouring the ceiling for cracks or degradation in the roof and scanning the paint-spattered walls for signs of failure, but I never quite got comfortable. Each footstep sent ripples of sound through the dark. Rats scampered the floor at the edges of my sight, fleeting shadows within the shadow, and their muffled pattering seemed almost deafening to me. Though I had no reason to fear, I became conscious of the fact that I was trying to minimize the noise, almost tiptoeing through the tunnel. My eyes constantly darted for those gaping black passageways in the dividing wall that led to the adjacent track, as if I expected to catch movement in the obscured tunnel beyond. I never saw anything but the wriggling shapes of rodents. Aside from the almost imperceptible rumble of distant trucks overhead, I heard no human sound save my own in the subway. Perhaps it was this paradoxical loneliness beneath the bustling city that made me feel like such an invader, I told myself. Gradually, a station opened up before me, with the dividing wall between the tracks dying away and the platforms rising up to either side. Stairways disappeared into solid concrete ceilings, filled in the better part of a century ago when the city ceased production. I felt a bit better here, somehow less threatened in the open expanse of the derelict station. It was a far cry from the confined tunnels and the mental images of lurking figures conjured up by that barren dividing wall. I clambered up onto the nearest platform, the largest in the station, and scanned the steadfast walls, finding little of note save the preponderance of genitalia amongst the graffiti. There was no sign of wear and tear, the old construction having been built to last. I tapped it with my knuckles absently as I moved along, a barely audible tribute to the last century's engineers, who had built such an underappreciated and indestructible bunker. Again, it struck me just how silly the trip down here had been. My eyes found a sort of ratty clothes heap across the tracks then, just a vague silhouette in the distant darkness. I made my way across to the opposing platform, curious as to what had been left behind in the urban tomb after all these years. As it moved into view, I saw mounded blankets and twisted jackets, matted and filthy with neglected age. I saw a low ring of old bricks, the bones of a makeshift fire pit which hadn't hosted wood in ages. Finally, I saw the beaten old sino pad off to the side, stained and dog-eared, and the haphazard writing scrawled across its pages. I don't know exactly what compelled me to take up the little pad and start to flip through. I had already decided that my task was pointless, so I'm sure a little boredom played a role. I had hours to burn down there, and I wasn't about to find a gaping chasm in the roof. Regardless, I began to read. As I went, what little comfort I took in the open space of the subway station slowly trickled away. An in ink aged so greatly by exposure to the predations of vermin and temperature that its flow was almost lost. The first few pages of stilted, aggressive penmanship tell of how the writer had ended up alone in the tunnels. By his account, the writer had dwelt there for many years with a group of vagrants during the 80s and 90s. When authorities had warned the squatters that the tunnels would soon be locked off, he had stubbornly opted to hide in the deepest portion of the ruins, evading notice while the rest packed what little they had and moved on. When the barriers clanged shut, he had crept back to his accustomed spot on the platform, determined to either survive on a combined diet of stolen canned goods and trapped rat, or die on his own terms in the tunnels. There was only cursory information about what had led to his presence there, however. Apparently, he had only begun writing at all because he believed someone else to be in the tunnels with him, and suspected they were rifling through his camp while he was away. He frequently addresses whoever's banging around in the main tunnel at night, or the man in the tunnel, 
with the ending to his introductory pages reading. If you are sitting in my camp reading this while I scrounge for rats near the entrance, do yourself a favor and either make yourself known or keep to your part of the subway. I have a gun on me, and did it be a bad idea to spook me at night? Several entries, perhaps made each day, detail how the man in the tunnel continues to scatter stones before going quiet at odd hours of the night, or mumble not-quite-right words he can't decipher which echo around the subway system. The speech was described as sounding deaf, as if the speaker were slightly mistaken and atonal but couldn't detect the difference. Never could he catch a glimpse of this person. The one weak flashlight he'd had on him couldn't reach far down the tunnel, and his unwanted guest always seemed to go silent as soon as the writer was awakened or alerted by the noise. Then comes the fourth entry, when things get very eerie. An old cat who would come down into the tunnels through a tiny grate to hunt rats and poke around his camp, dubbed Ollie by the writer, had been missing the day of the prior entry. The writer had taken to calling for him whenever he went into the tunnels or got up from his perch on the platform to stretch his legs. When, on that second day, the writer finally managed to drift off, he was awakened by faint, distant calling from far off down the tunnels. Again, he described it as slightly off, as if spoken over chewed food. He swears in the notebook that the voice was calling Ollie over and over, in much the same tone and rhythm that he had called the name before. He laments in each entry that he had no way of contacting the world beyond the subway gates, and mentions that he is going to attempt staying awake for the next couple days, perhaps now writing more for his own security of mind than for his assumed visitor. Though I can't know how long passes between the penultimate entry and the final, strange encounter described in the last pages, I believe it to be no more than a day later, given its phrasing and flow. The writer, apparently dazed by lack of sleep in front of the small fire he'd made on the platform and rocking back and forth to keep awake, was surprised by a noise just above him, from the ceiling of the platform. On edge and holding the small revolver he carried in his lap, he raised the weapon almost reflexively and saw outlined by the fire what he describes as some big-ass pale naked guy hanging from the ceiling. The person, though I think thing might be the better term, was looking down at him and was moving to climb to the floor when he shot it. It wailed, a sound he describes as wet and weird. The thing then dropped to the floor and skittered with inhuman speed off the platform and down into the tunnel, disappearing before he could stand up to line up another shot. It was something the homeless population in the tunnels had called the Long Man, the writer said, a kind of tall tale the oldest of them used to tell. He's always assumed it was hearsay, like the others. Maybe it had been there all along, he speculated, becoming bold when the population of squatters fell to just one lonely soul. Heartened by the fact that he had hurt whoever or whatever had been lurking in the tunnel, he records that he is going to follow the blood this long man left in the tunnel as it fled and see if he can't find it and kill it. Then the journal ended the nameless man who pinned it in the dark lost to the remaining empty pages. I sat there, crouched in the dark over the ruins of the fire pit for some time, soaking in the story it told. I found myself throwing furtive glances across the platform to the looming tunnels, conscious of the occasional scuttling rat. This, I told myself, was an excellent bit of theatrical fiction. Whoever had written it had left it here, years back, in a place that was bound to put visitors on edge. There had been a real lovecraft amongst the squatters in the station to have pulled off that little tale, I thought. As I tried to shake away my nerves and restore what little comfort I had built up in the yawning subway station, 
I put the little notepad back down in its place. Fool that I was, I dismissed my worries, consigned the story to the world of fiction, and strode back to the tracks. Looking back on that return to the tunnels, and the first steps along the route to the second station, I do think the story made an impression on me, whether I dismissed it or not. Each step upon the concrete was cautious and measured, and I took care to steer clear of broken glass or pooled water that might ring out beneath my tread. Distracting myself with observant glances at a roof I knew would yield no scars, I reassured myself that it was only a couple miles until the end of the line. Then it'd be back to the surface to tell the city where it could shove its earthquake theory of pothole development. The shadows seemed deeper, and the rats seemed more numerous, my mind reading foreboding menace where I assured myself there was none. Much as I told myself I was being foolish, I couldn't make myself calm down entirely. I almost made to whistle or mutter to myself just to break the silence and prove myself a fool, but I couldn't bring myself to do it. I just kept my head down and moved along. It was only when I came into view of the second stop along the tunnel that I was given pause. Somewhere in the gloom up ahead, barely captured beneath the waving beam of my light. A snap of motion caught my eye, barely visible across the intervening hundred yards or so. In a flash, it sank behind an intervening concrete pillar and out of view near the farther tunnels. I froze, processing the motion, my head spinning as I went through an animalistic on-the-spot internal debate over whether to cut out the light and try to hide. Though it had only been visible for a moment, I could have sworn the thing that moved was a head, lurching backward out of view. It took me a moment to gather myself, but I was emboldened rather than frightened when I heard a stone clatter in the distant tunnel. I strode forward, light in hand, speaking for the first time since closing myself into the echoing vault. Hey, I shouted. Whoever's up there, I'm not here to run you off. The words of my supervisors came to mind, a warning to watch out for vagrants in the tunnels. Suddenly, my mind felt at ease, giving a familiar shape to the nervous tension I'd felt in the dark. I had no idea how a homeless resident would have found their way back in here, but perhaps I'd found the fiction writer from the prior platform. I'm here to check for damage. I told the empty air, my voice amplified by the soaring arched ceilings. I'll be in and out, fast as can be. I moved out into the station, the echoes of my footfalls once again deafening. I shined my light into the oncoming tunnel, but saw nothing save dust and distant darkness beneath the beam. I scanned the platforms and saw this junction was much the same as the last, vacant and gaping. Only several trash heaps and scattered hunks of debris littered the ground, and the ceilings were as sturdy as they'd ever been. Again, I called out to the darkness, and again, no response came. I spent a moment debating whether to proceed, but ended up deciding against an early retreat from the tunnels. After all, I was familiar with the overpasses and derelict buildings of the city and I was no stranger to squatters. If I didn't bother them, they wouldn't bother me. That's what I kept telling myself, at least, forcing each step and scanning every aperture in the dividing wall between the tracks. There was more debris from construction here, with piles of pallets and bundled piping pressed up against the dingy walls. I made an effort not to pry too much, keeping my eyes forward, hoping whatever homeless person I'd spotted just sat tight and let me get my ill-advised rounds over with. I spoke now and then, laughing off the futility of the search for flaws in the structure, making sure I made my position known in the dark. Stupid I'm even down here, really, I told the dusty, stifled air. Managerial shit, big waste of city dollars. 
What can you do, though? The words were torrential in the confines of the subway, but I felt more secure. I wouldn't be sneaking up on anyone in here, and now that I was convinced there was an occupant, that was my best bet to keep the day simple and straightforward. I wasn't about to rock up on some spooked homeless guy in the dark. The more I thought about it, though, the more uncomfortable I became. As concrete as the simple idea of squatters had been, and as glad as I was for my apparent solitude in the tunnel, I couldn't reconcile one thing. The longer I walked, the more it gnawed at me, until I slowed to a near crawl the better part of a mile from the second station. The last opened up before me, still and silent, and I halted the words of warning I'd been forming just as they began. Whoever it was, they had never once used a light. I'd never seen a flash in the dark or a stray beam bouncing off pooled water. What kind of squatter didn't need a light? I hesitated a moment, but then second-guessed myself. As I threw a cursory glance around the empty station, I shook my head, trying to dispel some of the nervous twitching I'd become accustomed to in the tunnel. There was nothing here, and there wasn't really anything left to the tunnel system. Right ahead, where the tracks should have continued, they terminated in a big cinder block and cement barrier that marked the end of polished construction. If they weren't here, they weren't anywhere. I supposed I'd just mistaken an odd shadow or water-stained blotch on the wall for motion in the last station. I scoffed for an audience of no one, mocking my own hasty judgment, laughing it off like I hadn't just shit my way down the last track. I pressed forward to the barrier, feeling I owed it to myself to at least check that before I turned to go. Then I could at least try to tell myself I'd been nonchalant down in the subway. It was only when I drew near, high on the feeling of relief that had flooded me when I found the last station empty, that I grew nervous. In the lower right corner of the barrier, several of the large bricks had been dislodged and shoved free, bathed in the dust of intervening years. Through the hole trickled dingy, tepid water pooling on the empty concrete of the station's tracks. It looked too old to be freshly made, I thought. No tiny earthquake could have shaken those stones loose anyhow. I sloshed through the shallow water, dropping to a crouch before the gap, shining my light through in search of some kind of chasm or damage. I hoped to see only the mounded rock and poured concrete of the construction team's patch job, but I wasn't to be so fortunate. Beyond, the ground grew rough, hewn rock and jagged stone over which a slow, sickly stream bubbled. It ran through a little tunnel, no more roomy than a crawl space, bubbling up from some cold spring beneath the ground. It was the first real sign of wear and tear I'd seen down here, but it left me with far more questions than answers. The tunnel had apparently been plotted with the aim to steer clear of the river. The construction must have grazed a subterranean spring, I wagered, perhaps without the notice of the original planners. The years had done the rest, eating through a path towards the derelict barrier. The water would have had to work fast, though. Could it even have carved the little creek bed that fast? And how in the world had it shifted the cinder block of the wall? Perhaps there was a homeless resident in the tunnels, I reasoned. He'd broken the wall in search of water, maybe having heard the murmur of the stream from the station. I nodded to myself, working it out in my head. Then... At the end of my vision, something moved at the rear of the spring-fed stream. Just above the waterline, emerging from whatever crevice in the stone was vomiting forth the sour water, the beam of my light caught shine which had not been there on the initial scan. From three grayish-white shapes poking up from the water, six golden reflections glared back, 
twitching in the harsh glow of my light. Eyes. They were too broad to be a man's, too reflective in the dark. I stumbled back when they blinked out, the owners having flinched away from the beam. Raccoons or big rats, I tried to tell myself, rising to my feet and putting a few more yards between myself and the hole. That rationalization didn't stop me from pulling the cheap little utility knife from my belt, grasping it so tightly in my free hand that my nails drew blood from my palm. They'd have to have been very, very large raccoons. Moreover, the pale shapes in the water had been wrong, rounded and broad, too much like a person's skull. I made for the far tunnels, throwing a few shaky glances over my shoulder towards the gap. Though I was still busy trying to convince myself I'd been spooked by animals on the one hand, other parts of my brain calculated the distance to the far exit. I cursed that I'd been given a key only for the one gate, and lacked the keys for other access doors built near the stations. It was when I reached the other end of the station that I heard a slight, subdued vocalization from behind me only reverberating to my ears due to the vaulted construction overhead. In a shaken, awkward tone that brought to mind the faded pages of the filthy stenopad, a twisted parody of the words, What can you do? echoed out into the tunnels. The words were without inflection or emphasis, clearly organic, but spoken with all the mood of a text-to-speech device. They were all wrong, the words of a child phonetically reading out a sentence they couldn't understand. There was no tenderness or clumsy comedy in them, though. Only cold, detached interest. I ran, not yet daring to look back. I made it perhaps a hundred yards down the tunnel when, just as I began to believe I'd be left alone, there was a clamor farther back along the tracks. Though it took me a moment to place it over the noise of my booted footfalls in the stifled darkness, I eventually placed the noise. The slap of many bare feet upon concrete. My pace quickened, pressing me to the limit of my physical ability. I cursed that I'd let myself slip out of shape, damning myself with weekends spent lounging around at home with a book in hand, but the adrenaline helped push me along. Only when I could hear the nameless things gaining in the dark did I make a gamble. Without slowing my pace, I ducked through one of the holes in the dividing wall. I hoped beyond hope that whatever was close on my heels hadn't fanned out into both tunnels. I flicked off my light as I crossed on shaky legs to the far wall, cautiously feeling my way into a crevice between the concrete and some stacked, filthy wooden pallets and held my breath. The fleshy sound of the footsteps swept past down the other tunnel, half muffled by the intervening wall. They were as odd as the voice had been, unlike the rhythm of a regular sprinter, as if every few steps were punctuated by leaps or scuttling crouches. Imagination did the work my shadow-blinded eyes could not in the all-consuming gloom giving twisted forms to the capering horde as they wound further away down the tracks. Though my initial mood was relief, it was not to last. First, I thought of escape. With only one exit available to me, I felt cornered, the things now between me and the distant exit. Even if they'd passed me by for now, what chance did I have of slipping past whatever those watchers in the stream were in the dark? There were more immediate threats, though. Only a heart rattled a minute or two after their passage. A noise reached back to me from where the mob had run. A sort of sonorous clicking, like a tongue off the roof of a mouth. It echoed well down the tunnels, and after a brief pause, was answered. No echo could muddle the fact that the responder was frightfully close in the dark perhaps twenty feet off. The most disconcerting thing, though, was that the noise came from above. Again it sounded, 
Many such noises joined in, most distant and scattered, but the one nearest to me was methodical, purposeful. It shifted from one side of the tunnel to the other, unseen limbs scraping across stone with cautious, barely audible grace. I stifled each breath, ears strained, every hair on my body standing on end as I braced for whatever came next. It came lower, clicking all the while. I recall thinking it had to be directly above me, on the wall of the tunnel I huddled against. I froze as best I could, restraining a jolt of fright as some tiny fragment of stone or debris was dislodged in the dark and clattered to the ground beside my arm. There was one final click, loud as thunder to my ears. Then, silence. What came after happened in a flash, but my experience of it is sticky and slow, stretched wide by tension. I waited for a breathless eternity, expecting each moment a miraculous resumption of the clicking which never came. My knuckles must have been blanched white in the dark against the knife. Every muscle in my body tensed like coiled wire. When the hand brushed against my throat in the dark, I don't think the grasping thing on the wall knew what I was. It was probing, suspicious, but not decisive. I didn't give it the time to figure out, though. I would like to say I put a bold plan of action into motion, reaching just as planned when the cold, unseen fingers grazed my skin. I reacted in a blur of spastic flailing, though. Still, it likely saved my life. The ropey, spindly thing above me had come quite close, and I got lucky with the jab I made in the dark. My knife found purchase, leaving my hand wet with warm, irony blood. I wasted no time in drawing back, hitting the grasping thing again and again within the span of a few seconds. As if just finding its voice, the thing screeched. I can't describe the raw power of the noise, far louder than any gunshot I've heard. The cry ruptured my right eardrum and left my head spinning with near-concussive force. There was a clattering of limbs as it fell, rolling from on top of me to the ground beside the pallets, rasping and thrashing. I was stricken several times, fracturing a couple ribs in the process, but in the rush of the moment, I didn't feel the clumsy, desperate strikes as any more than dull thumps. I scrambled to my feet, backed away along the wall and panicked. Fortunately for me, my addled brain made the right call in the moment. I resolved to flee, with the light on, knowing there were others in the tunnels who would know my position. What was not fortunate, though, was that my light first fell upon the thing that grasped me in the dark, giving me a clear glimpse of what the forgotten writer with his stenopad had termed the Long Man. This was an apt name. It was too stretched, too elongated, too see-through. Its organs and veins were visible in the beam, black against the milky pallor of the semi-transparent skin. Far taller than a human being, it was wiry but light, likely weighing no more than I did. Its hands, oversized and sporting flexible tapering fingers, clutched at a cluster of open wounds along its neck and chest, which pulsed blackish blood at each pump of its dying heart. Its eyes, two impossibly large orbs above a wicked-toothed mouth and a skeletal flattened nose, found mine. They were a shocking amber, and almost comically wide. Frightened. I can't forget the sight of the thing, much as I've tried. Though it was only a startled second that I looked upon its dying form, I know I'll remember every shady detail until my final days. Still, it served to shock me into motion. I wheeled about and ran for the exit, aware of scattered screeches and clicks in the tunnels as other long men closed on my position. I kept expecting them to pour from the holes in the dividing wall 
or to drop down from the ceiling above like leaping spiders. They never interfered, though, at least not directly. I can't know whether it was because of the thing's dying cry or some other reason. I assume they were wary, averse to taking a risk. Though they certainly could have killed me, my lucky break with the first hunter must have made them anxious. Rather than grasping hands or screeching charges, I caught only flashes of pale motion at the edge of the light and the whistle of thrown rocks clattering off the walls. A few of these hit me, grazing my head and bruising my legs, but I was fortunate. My passage through the second station and the further halls were a blur of harried motion, and I made the first station with little but scrapes and bruises from the bombardment. Then, the assault seemed to die away. The scuttling advance of the long men falling to a whisper as I neared the exit and the soft glow of late afternoon came into view through the grate. I clattered against the harsh steel of the doors and scrambled with the key, stupidly trying to handle it without letting my flashlight slip from my grip. I was frayed beyond measure then, desperate and shaking, and it took many excruciating seconds to get the door open. I slipped through, the gate squealing shut behind me, the key readied to bar the way in my wake. In the last rays of light behind the closing doors, I saw the wide eyes of several inhuman hunters looking after me, their silhouettes white against the gray of the tunnels. I told my supervisors there were dangerous squatters in the tunnels never letting the truth of the situation slip. When the police came to question me in the following days, I told them much the same, recasting the encounter as one of urbane violence rather than a monstrous encounter. Though I'm sure they sent men into the tunnels, no one has ever followed up with me. I've never found it odd that the city began talks about filling in the tunnel system entirely soon after my inspection. The attempts to rebrand the half-completed subway as a moody club or concert venue died away, too, with the city largely ceasing all public references to its moldering project. While my peers ummed and awed over why the struggling budget was being tapped for so wasteful a purpose, I kept my mouth shut. I think I know why the city, slow to awaken and slower to action, moved so suddenly to seal off the passages. I also think I know why the city moved to distance me from work, silently severing me from the job. I won't protest, though, because that suits me just fine. I have no desire to ever be underground again. Lynch. Harlan County abounds with every breed of tall tale, from Bigfoot stories to legends about ghostly miners. They're just overshadowed by the mine wars and the coal country mythology of the early 1900s. Only the locals really hear tell of things which go bump in the night. And even then, the hardy and hard-headed folk in the hollers are cautious about sharing them with outsiders. Too often, the traveling lowlander or coastal visitor already looks down his nose at the accents and the poverty and familial simplicity of Appalachia. Thus, the people of Harlan County aren't too keen on handing the outsiders more ammunition for their disdain. I grew up in those parts, though, and I heard my share of campfire stories in the dark of the craggy forests and vine-choked glens of home. I recall one story about lights tracing mountaintops held to be deserted in the dead of quiet summer nights, the ghastly lanterns, so it was set 
of long-dead moonshiners whose stills had not run for many a decade. That was a favorite for my grandparents, and I'd had it told to me a dozen times before the age of ten, so the local tradition runs deep. There were tales of ghostly echoes of mine collapses, and reports of strange voices in the woods at night, and even a legend about a gigantic snake seen tracing the creek bottoms of Harlan. Even at that young age, most of those hill myths didn't hold much stock in my eyes, and for reasons that will become obvious as I tell this story, I've never assumed anyone else would put much stock in my experience either. This will be the first time I've told anyone, barring my sister, I suppose, what really happened to me in the winter of 2007. Even then, with family as my only witness, I held back on imparting some of the weird little intricacies which have kept me wondering ever since. As the years passed, I failed time and again to escape the sensation that everything I saw was real, that my experience was genuine. I've recently stumbled across certain myths about subterranean cave things ranging the map from West Virginia to Wales, and that has me more convinced than ever it was genuine. So, I'm recording that experience here to put my thoughts in order and, perhaps, find a little peace. Having finished the first semester of my senior year at Pikeville about two weeks earlier, I'd driven back home to be with my then fiance, who had a place she shared with her sisters in the tiny town of Lynch. There's a shadow that hangs low over that town. It's hard to put a finger on what exactly casts it, or trace exactly how, but something puts people off about the place. It has all the worldly charm of any other hill town, and possesses enough buildings in antique styles to draw more antiquarian hearts together, but it lacks even modest businesses, and can't boast the liveliness of its small-town neighbors. The mines have mostly turned to low-traffic tourist traps, and with them, the lifeblood of the town has ceased to flow. With prospects slim and skeletal, those antiquated homes slip into neglect as the population ages or trickles away for better employment elsewhere. After two or three decades of struggle, Lynch might as well be an empty, rattling old set-piece its few hangers-on, the last desperate performers in some monotonous, long-doomed theatrical tragedy. Perhaps the worst of all are the toothy ridges of almost scorched coal tipples and storage barns which dot the ridges looming tall over the huddled, decaying homes and bent ruins of Lynch's forgotten Main Street. From the valley floor amongst those hills, they look almost like lost towers left by some age-torn, vanished civilization. In a way, I suppose they are. Townspeople living in their shadow can't help but be tugged back into worried wonder about the future of jobs and livelihoods in the region every time their eyes find one of the tottering pillars. The companies, all owned by men in the distant northeast, had long ago grown fat on the black gold beneath the earth, and had either moved to more profitable fare elsewhere, or mechanized, and cut free working people to rot in places just like this. The coal tipples aren't much different than abandoned Roman aqueducts, and the beleaguered Kentuckians in their shadow look up at them with all the nostalgic hope and wonder which Dark Age peasants must once have felt in distant Europe. I'd been swept out of my fiancé's home that December, my terrible and long-plagued relationship collapsing in the thundering, caustic way typical of disaster pairs like that one. I'd been not so ceremoniously urged into the near-freezing rain that night after the spectacular shouted conclusion to our fighting stumbling under the weight of two duffel bags hastily filled into the wet and wind. 
perky despite the weather and the prologue to this ill-fated trip was Saul, my old collie, who kept a dutiful watch over my bunched clothing and valuables while I took up my phone on the tattered sidewalk of tattered Main Street to call up my mother across the state in Indiana, just west of Louisville. My parents had abandoned this rickety ship a few years prior, and I begged them for a ride, despite the late hour and the miserable weather. My wallet had been left in the bedroom, and it would have been disastrous to return for it then, with the coven of sisters stalking the halls of that run-down house like spiteful ghouls. With the weather as bad as it was, a walk along twenty miles of road to friends in Harlan proper wasn't on the menu either. My options were few and my worries were many. In the moment, I didn't care how desperate I must have sounded over the phone. I just wanted escape. Tucked under the awning of a long, closed company store with Saul at my side, my heart sunk. As the wind lashed down the street, my mother, despite her worry, told me she was nearly four hours further away in Indianapolis, visiting an aunt just my luck. By the time we'd exchanged goodbyes and hung up, the whipping of the awning in the wind and the gnaw of the rain through my already damp sneakers made me vow I'd find somewhere to warm myself. Though I didn't think it was cold enough to kill me through all my layers, it was far less than comfortable in my sorry condition, and I figured escaping this chill might ward off the sinking of my spirits. I got up, hoisted my bags, and went on my way. With Saul lurking at my heels and my duffel bags left to sit near an old newspaper dispenser out front, I poked into the lone gas station left standing in town. It was a weary local affair nearly a decade in its grave, but the woman at the register was kind enough. She permitted me to sit along the wall of the alcove entryway with my companion curled at my side. That wasn't a king's perch, but I could at least keep free of the wind. I was left to watch the non-existent traffic and burn time for a few hours, solitary stragglers out for beer or cigarettes occasionally striding over my outstretched legs as they pushed into the station. Last call came around, though, if it can be called that. And as my hostess went about locking up the final store drawing breath in this strangled hamlet, she told me with some guilt that I would have to find somewhere else to wait out my remaining hours in Lynch. Scooping up my belongings and moving back off into the wind outside my modest hideaway took a great deal more effort than it had taken to flee the house, and I needed to summon up every ounce of my stubborn determination to muster the will to march out again. Saul's company helped, but even his friendly presence stood as a reminder that we couldn't stay wandering for the fully four or five hours which stood between us and rescue. I needed to find somewhere both secure and sheltered, and I thought I knew of just the place. When youth was still driving me to reckless adventure, the woods just north of town had offered up somewhere which was both close to home and bright enough not to drive me mad in the clouded night. An old coal processing plant's ruin crouched low in the trees just beyond town up there, its gnarled bulk cutting into the slope of its hosting hill. The place's face was a great wall of paneled glass, but long years and the predations of the town's children had left the surface craggy and sparse, the remnants catching the high beams of passing cars in the murk of the valley and briefly giving life to the shadow-doomed forest. The old coal plant had long been a fortress for the children of the region. The remoteness of the community prevented it from becoming too common a squat for drifters or the homeless, while the concrete, almost Soviet bulk of the ancient-looking edifice drew the imaginations of even grown souls into its tenebrous depths. Several nights over my last summer in town as a high schooler had been spent testing my nerves with friends in that very building. 
It stood not a hundred yards from the main road through a thin span of trees and across a long, dry, and broken stone channel, through which a diverted creek had once run. Despite its age, the plant was dry, and though the rust and the shoddy construction would have made it a bad permanent residence, I wasn't in the market for a house just yet. This was my last shot at a sheltered retreat, and afforded me a good view of the station and the main road not far off from its vantage point on the hill. Texting my mother my plan and making certain she knew to stop at the gas station and wait for me there, Saul and I pressed on up the road a short way and over the channel. Fences had long been tumbled over, and any police in the county had better cases to crack than trespassers in modest, forgotten lynch. So we had little to worry about as I used my phone's wavering light to press through the worst of the brush on the opposing side of the trench. At length, we came below the plant. It was raised on mighty concrete stilts to better stand on the incline, one of Harlan County's finest coal castles. Its moldering smell, that of rust and industrial decay, which carries an almost sweet aerosol taste and scent on the wind under the right conditions, was so strong as to be overpowering, and a grand whiff of the stuff stopped me in my tracks as I reached the clearing around its pillared feet. It would likely have been five stories or so measured from its real floor to the ceiling, but the interior was mostly one great open space, stripped of most of the machinery which had powered Lynch in days of old. It boasted only two floors of rickety metal walkways encircling the room's edges, both so fragile in their old age as to be entirely untrustworthy. I believe it was these battered walkways I heard creaking in the whiny way that elderly steel murmurs and groans in the wind and the cold, and I hesitated. Even though the night was bright despite the rain, and the road through the trees occasionally lit the place with the beams of passing headlights, this forgotten fortress was still foreboding enough to give me pause. Saul sniffed around at my side, but didn't wander far seeming wary of the strange place, and the noises emanating from the rainy woods all around it. Eventually, though, the wind and rain began to bite again, and the minutes spent apprehensive in the cold seemed more and more painful. I find it funny that I might have avoided years of worry and nightmare if that rain had just shoved off for a night or two when we needed to be outside. As it was, Saul and I needed a roof over our heads, and I let us in. Aged stairways and ladders leading up into the monolith had almost all rotten away, but the last survivor, a shoddy flight of switchback metal gone to seed long ago, was sturdy enough to hold us. I was careful to ensure Saul didn't entangle a paw in the grated surface, or slice a leg on the ragged edges which seemed to lurk everywhere seeking vulnerable skin to gash and gnaw. Once inside, though, the metal gave way to concrete, and the only worry was the trailer-sized opening in the center of the room's concrete floor, an old tipping point for trucks driving beneath the building, perhaps. The ragged wires and tethers hanging above that waiting mouth in the floor dangled like twisted intestines in the dim and dust. Its sparse railing would keep me from tumbling if I needed to pace for warmth in the darkness, and though I initially worried for Saul, he wasn't one for straying and exploring. Dripping from the few holes in the blessedly intact metal roof echoed all about the bowels of the building, while the wind shuddered through the creaking windows and metal fixtures all around to create an almost total ambiance of wretched age and dreariness. The seedy opera of industrial forgetfulness only barely outpaced the world outside in the realm of comfort, and dour as he was, Saul seemed just as aware of the somber atmosphere as I was. Striding over to find a seat down among the stone and scattered brick near the building's broken glass face, I kept my back to one of the paired concrete columns along the wall, 
so that I could face the split farther above on the far wall, the truly frightening part of the building. That dark opening, whose blackness against the fluttering evening gloom of the main chamber reminded me what real darkness could look like, was the entryway to an old and battered coal tipple. Its busy conveyor belt had, in days past, carried coal from a mine nearly a mile off over the mountain into sorting facilities up the hill. After this, the belt would carry the load the rest of the way down, bringing its payload to rest here. A tunnel of dingy wood and banded rust soaring high above the forest undergrowth of the hills it was, climbing up and away as if to flee the rotting facility. Once it had played host to my friends and I, climbing along the shifty stairways and ladders that flanked the long-dead conveyor, and sneaking around the sorting facility uphill, each of us laughing at our daring. Alone I was not so cocky. Under the pressure of the winds I could hear its groaning wooden bulk join the symphonic creaks of the plant all around me. Even if only bats haunted that dark and winding tunnel into the hills, I didn't trust it enough to leave my back to it. Two hours in the catacombs of Lynch's coal industry was not long, but it felt long. Noise never let me fully rest in the dark, and as glad as I was to find myself dry and relatively warm, everything about the place seemed different now that I was here without the playful voices of friends to reassure me. Years hadn't done more than add graffiti and trash to the place, but everything down to the sickly scent of metal moving fast towards rot kept me from just drifting off into my thoughts. Every car's light cast through the window sent me on a quick scan of the floor all around me for unseen rats or insects which I knew better than to look for in this kind of wet weather at this time of year. All the while Saul's head stayed at attention, his head twitching and bobbing back and forth now and again, as he too scanned and sniffed for something amiss which he couldn't place from his seat at my side. Somehow that put me off, Saul acting funny. He even strayed off a few times towards the loading bay at the room's center with his nose to the ground, only returning begrudgingly when I called to him through the softly swirling dust haze of that awful room. Never before had I seen him act that way, and even though part of me wanted to push it off on being in a new place filled with strange sights and sounds, I didn't ever fully get over it. When, at length, the sound which spooked me echoed out from the far corner of the room, I'd almost been ready to leave. It had been a bit over two hours, and I was starting to think the last little while out in the cold would be bearable if I could just find a pine with a bit of growth left over to sit under, or beg a porch seat off the kind of midnight smokers you seem only to find in run-down neighborhoods. Again, it strikes me how close I might have come to missing this experience entirely. But I didn't. When the chain rigging up against the walls of that far corner shifted and grated in a way unfamiliar to me after an hour in the plant, I froze and found the corner, eyes narrowing in the dark. Saul rose even as I shifted my head and got to my feet rising slowly to his own full height and making cautiously in the direction of the gap in the floor and the offending chain beyond, ears flat. I made no sound, and neither did he. I remember thinking how odd it was that he seemed interested, nervous about the sound, but didn't so much as growl on the approach. This was the same dog who barked for an hour at squirrels and deer through windows towards our backyard, and yet he was crouched low, eerily quiet, eyes wide and locked on that spot from whence the clanking motion of metal on stone had come. For all my worry, though, I could see nothing. I could identify only the slightest shape against the bulk of the mounded chains and the grunge of the dirtied walls in the gloom. Even then I was uncertain, 
for though I didn't remember having glimpsed this pile of stone or blotchy patch of aged paint before, I told myself it was surely too still in those long seconds we spent staring at it to be a living thing. My hand lingered on my phone, but I didn't dare power the screen on to bring light to the room. The chamber was far too large for the phone to entirely banish the dark. Even more worrying was the moment of blindness flipping the thing around and getting the screen up to full brightness would cause me. Even while I was busy wrapping myself in reasons the shape I was seeing couldn't be anything other than an odd pattern along the wall, I remember just as vividly that I didn't dare take my eyes off it. Pin it on instinct if you want, but I'd wager it was just the paranoia of the hour prior actually paying off as I encountered something odd in the coal plant. A blind grasp of luck, the hour's twitchy disposition gracefully granted its guest. Cautious as Saul before me, I lifted myself up to full height from my half-crouched stoop, eyes still wide and fixed and after another moment spent waiting for motion which didn't come. I fortified myself as best I could and took a soft step forward which rung out as thunderous despite the battering of the rain outside. Then, after maybe half a minute, Saul did growl, long and low. Heart racing all the faster, I suddenly found my voice calling, Hello? Nothing. Motionless. Saul's growl died away, but he renewed it as soon as he'd taken another breath, beginning to pick his way out and around the gap in the floor, eyes ever locked on the corner, ever slower and lower to the ground in his stalking, almost feline prowl. I called again, but once more no one replied, and no flicker of motion stirred the shadows. Just as I gathered my breath to call Saul back, the fleeting light of a passing car along Lynch's main road punctured the woods and threw itself upon the splintered window panels at my back. And what the dancing light revealed in that crypt of coal was not just a spot along the wall or an unseen pile of debris. I can only be thankful I caught just the fleeting glimpse I did, but that's a small comfort. I don't know what it was. The years have painted it stranger and stranger in my memories, but at the time, I thought it was a human being. Even so, it was massive, nearly twice my height. Even if time and fear make people exaggerate, I'd say at least eight feet, and probably bigger. Lean to the point it was painful to look at, gnarled and bony like a holodomor peasant grasping for grain, long in the arms and legs in a revolting way, which was hard to tolerate. It had these horrible, long, crab-leg jointed fingers splayed out on the wall behind it. It was white against the gray of the stone, and though I can't be sure, I'm certain as I reflect it was hanging perched against the wall inches from the ground and motionless amidst the chains as it balanced on the wall. The most troubling were the eyes, massive, staring, glinting amber and fish-like in the black as the light outside died away and plunged us back into ink and obscurity. The brightness was what seemed to jolt it, though it didn't move until after the dark had rushed in on us again. I'm not too proud to say I didn't have the first thought of fighting or running as it lurched. I was too shocked, too busy trying to sort out what was in front of me to worry about what it might be here for. And before I knew it, the thing had vaulted, almost flown into a roll from the wall. Saul had begun backing up as soon as the light had hit it, but he hadn't gotten far and whatever it was moved so fast and had such long reach. Poor thing. I know it grabbed him, but as often as I find myself rising from nightmares and shaking at the memory, I don't know whether he yelped or whether it all happened too quickly for him to feel pain or fear. 
speed and the jerky, almost jittery way the thing moved made it a blur in the dancing light through the glass. And by the time I knew what was happening, it was leaping and climbing spider-like up to the ring of rusted walkways above and dashing for the tipple shoot up the mountain set into the wall, Saul's limp form under its arm. He never made a sound. I don't know why I followed them. I don't know what I thought I could do to save him. Like a young kid misjudging the depth of a pond, I was in over my head before I considered the consequences. I have no memory of the grapple for the upper walkway along a shoddy ladder or my pursuit up the tipple, though I must in retrospect have used my phone in the blackness along the wooden tunnel. Disturbing as it is to say now as I reflect on it, the darkness was almost cave-like in that tipple. A subterranean chute filled with aged equipment and the scattered remnants of coal floating paradoxically above the earth. Just as it occurred to me how hard it would be to get back down. Just as it occurred to me that I'd heard neither the pale thing nor Saul in all this time. I found myself in the elongated mountaintop sorting center I'd visited all those years ago with my friends. My phone tossed light off of several battered electrical panels whose innards were as ravaged as the glass at the fore of the plant. No windows graced its walls, for it was just wide enough for the conveyor and a walkway to either side, and just tall enough to allow for corroded bridges to pass over the belt. Structural archways every few yards and the interrupting bulk of metal hanging above the conveyor strangled my light, making it all the more insignificant. A boat at the edge of the deep sea, waiting to disappear in some sudden and unforeseen storm. Though I desperately wanted to find Saul, I had to have known even back in the plant that he was either gone or as good as gone. His silence spoke as much. Despite that, in my doomed run up the chute, I had all but stranded myself, over-invested and charged far too deep into dangerous terrain in the dark. I had no plan to escape, and no guarantee whatever took Saul was not preparing to turn around and come back for more. Death skulked here, I remember thinking whether I wanted to turn back or not. What did I have to lose? A human skeleton, buried in ragged clothing and coal dust which leaned against the first arch, shattered that do-or-die recklessness, though. I didn't see much detail, but what I did see was more than enough to spook me back into the chute and down towards the plant, crawling and tumbling as best I could in the murk. In a blur, I burst through the plant, down the battered walkway and into the woods beyond, never once looking over my shoulder, but ever expecting a long-fingered hand to jerk me up by the coat and drag me back up the mountain towards the sorting facility and the abandoned mines farther on. I called my mother as I stumbled back onto Main Street and made for the comparative light of the gas station store hours and courtesy be damned. She answered, and I babbled all the confused and frightened pleas to hurry I could muster over the phone, half in tears, my eyes often seeking out the looming tombstone that was the coal plant. It, in turn, looked with storied eternal vigilance down over the town. Once I was certain she was close, I phoned the police, reserved enough, even in my crazed worry, not to mention my encounter with the thing in the coal plant's ruin. The skeletal remains in the sorting facility and my missing dog, run away in the dark in this censored narrative, were all I revealed to them, and that was enough to get a car from the county sheriff out to town. For a while I was certain the deputies who arrived first that night were going to drag me up the mountain and into the bowels of that hellish complex again to show them the way, but their superiors later accepted my desperate pleas that I'd be taken to a hospital. 
I was concussed and bleeding profusely from a gash I'd given myself running headlong into a fallen metal support bar in the tipple coming down. And that saved me from the return trip. My mother had me out and away from there, en route to an emergency room not an hour after the police arrived and garnered what information I could give them. I've never been so happy or comfortable at a hospital. That night was the last time I looked on Lynch, save through the lens of nightmare, for I haven't returned, and don't plan to. Childhood memories and affectionate internal overtures towards home might soften that feeling, but the ongoing and likely futile investigation into that skeletal body found in the ruin will ever serve as a barrier to my return. Reports from the coroner cited hyoid fractures as evidence of foul play, and the Harlan County authorities to this day lay the death of the transient whose remains were found in the sorting facility at the feet of an unknown killer in the region or beyond, perhaps a transient like the dead man himself. Tumbles and scuffles over lighters, alcohol, or dry socks have led to worse, they attest bringing case after case forth to bolster their point. Whatever the truth, a year prior to my encounter, on a winter night much like the one upon which he was found, that skeleton had been throttled in the dark up above Lynch, as he lurked far from the wind and the prying eyes of the citizens of the sleepy, desiccated mining town. What they haven't placed a motive on, though, are the odd marks driven into the bone along the legs, where the all-weather pants have been violently ripped and torn away. Wounds which suggest stripping of the flesh by way of blade, tooth, or claw. Answers to their questions are slim, and their searches through the complex have revealed little save the mine and its treacherous half-flooded interior levels inaccessible by all but the most daring spelunkers and divers. Who knows what dwells in those bowels of the earth, feeding on all that which dares come into its shadow. It was relatively recently, consumed by nightmares about that night in the coal plant, that I stumbled across an article on the Ogoff, a cave in Wales where strange sightings, sounds, and disappearances abound. That mythology got me searching, and I found a similar mythos of moon-eyed people and pale figures left by the Shawnee and Cherokee in our own mountains. What's more, I stumbled across disappearances in the caves dotting the state, from Pine Hill to sprawling Mammoth Cave further west. This made me revisit the memory in detail, made me write it down in full here, made me remember things I hadn't ever considered connecting to that awful night in Lynch before. I've found myself revisiting a youthful event whose weight I didn't realize until now, with many years and miles between me and the mountains. In my youth, on a forgotten afternoon, Elementary school had let out, and a close childhood friend, Mamie, had taken me out to see the coal plant. It was my first visit to the ruin, the beginning of my many trespasses as I grew. Altogether it had been an uneventful trip, clouded with all the haziness and lethargy youthful recollections are prone to, but I seem to recall there having been at least one memorable development on that much warmer afternoon all those years prior. It creeps back into the cellar of my awareness now to knock around and remind me of things which would have been better left forgotten. As we left the empty coal plant and walked along the creek bed late that afternoon, Mamie had realized she'd left her backpack behind and had doubled back into the plant to retrieve it. Both of us knew her mother would be furious if her school supplies were all left to meditate in the ruin. So I let her go and diligently continued flipping over rocks and collecting bugs on the creek shore. Upon Mamie's return minutes later, 
We set off up the embankment and walked off along the road home, conversations lost to my mind carrying us along in the steady, careless way childish discourse so beautifully manages. When rounding the bend onto our dead-end road, though, she offered up a question that, even all these years later, stands my hairs on end. She casually asked me whether I'd spotted the scarecrow hung up in the wiry steel rafters of the shadowy plant, and speculated as to who in our small community would have been bold enough to climb up to such daring heights and stash yard art along the ceiling. At the time, and for years afterward, I'd forgotten those words. Now I'm inclined to wonder. While I'm still trying to track Mamie down after years of broken contact, I can't help but think she too might have been watched that evening as the sun set, and she efficiently trotted back for her school pack. It's almost as consuming a subject to dwell on as my own experience. How long did the thing in the corner share the room with me? Was it motionless throughout, missed as an unsmooth surface along the old wall until attention had been called directly to it? Or had it crept in and slid down the wall to observe or perhaps listen to us from its perch? If so, for how long? From what crag or crevice in the mine and caves beyond the tipple had it come? Worst of all, was it alone? I first heard mention of the many-legged god while traveling Papua New Guinea in preparation for writing my dissertation in 2010. Seated around a fire, with several elders of a remote highland village, our interview had stretched long into the night, and the full moon above cast the tree-shrouded cliffs in an ethereal glow. There was a lull in the conversation, and I allowed my eyes to wander the landscape. When I lingered on the deep ravine below, its path winding through a canyon into some farther valley obscured by the green canopy, one of the elders pointed and shook his head. Only bad could come of looking upon the home of the many-legged god, he had told me. Better to dwell on good things among friends. They had refused to elaborate in detail, only saying that a much-hated tribe dwelt in the hidden valley, and that they practiced foul customs which the highlanders abhorred. In a land racked by intertribal struggle with many richly varied beliefs in witchcraft, I took it in stride. Even today, stories about cannibalism and trophy heads are told in the harsh, remote reaches of the massive island. I assumed that this was another case of two clans of ancient enemies feuding with one another, and I didn't give it much thought. I wrapped up my trip over the next month and returned to the States with copious notes on language and customs close at hand. Only in late 2017 did I happen across that strange name again. The old journal of an armed guard for a surveying expedition had been uncovered in a forgotten corner of Papua's National Museum and a contact I made during my trips to the country asked me if I was interested in translating the document. Given this meant I had first access to the artifact, I jumped at the chance to distract myself from the monotony of teaching. It's necessary to dive into the history the journal describes for context, but I'll keep it brief. Early in 1914, an expedition was dispatched by the German Empire's colonial government in Papua New Guinea to survey the interior of the northeastern corner of the island, known at that time as Kaiser Wilhelmsland. The hundred or so men involved would continue their survey despite the beginning of the First World War, avoiding Australian capture in the wilderness long after the colony had fallen into Allied hands. 
Hermann Detzner, who led the expedition, published a memoir of the experience in the wake of the conflict. Filled with stretched truths, it resembled an adventure novel more than a scientific study. Ethnographers and anthropologists have long held it to be mostly fiction, a tall tale woven by a brave but immodest man. The expedition's few surviving members were either natives intent on keeping quiet, or shocked German youths desperate to forget the hardships of the road, with disease and hostile tribes having taken their toll on the wandering surveyors. No other known accounts have been given of this expedition, making this lone, water-stained journal the last remnant of a long-dead adventure. Its narrator had been Friedrich Hotzendorf, a freshly graduated engineering student from Munich. The account was mostly logistical, dry and boring, listing miles traveled and supplies used. Occasional clashes with hostile locals were usually avoided by negotiation, and the few early pages containing personal musings are spent complaining about mosquitoes and the omnipresent heat. It remained this way until late 1916, when the expedition reached a highland village which Friedrich named as Ancient Tree in German. I recognized the name though today the title was spoken in Papua's Tokpisin pidgin language. Then, Friedrich raised further memories when he wrote of the odd legends villagers told of a many-legged god who ruled the lower valleys. As I drew the connection to my own past wanderings, I read that Friedrich and several younger members of the expedition had gotten a village elder drunk on rationed schnapps. During this night of drinking, they had been regaled with stories by the old man about the twisted inhabitants of the valley and the high civilization they supposedly boasted. The valley dwellers lived in buildings of stone and wore trinkets of gold, the old man had insisted, unlike anything I've ever heard described on the island. Friedrich ends the account of the night with a depiction of a gold totem the elder produced as proof supposedly taken as a trophy of war after a clash with the valley dwellers. It had been sketched on the following page with careful grace. This drawing resembled a centipede coiled into a spiral, its seemingly eyeless head at the center. The craftsmanship was described as superb, but the expedition's offers to buy the totem went unaccepted, and Friedrich left the village empty-handed. The rest of the journal, methodical and meticulous, revealed no more about the many-legged god. The valley was fast left behind, and worries about Australian pursuit drove away any speculation about what the out-of-place idol might mean. I was far removed from worrying about Australian search parties, however. The nagging feeling that I was at the cusp of something undiscovered would not let me forget so easily. I droned on through my classes until the summer relieved me of distractions, my mind lingering on that tree-shrouded valley in faraway Papua. Despite how little evidence I had at hand, the whole story which had built up in my mind seemed too tempting to ignore. Moreover, the tale seemed genuine, for the fear in the voices of my old hosts rang clear through my memory every time I looked upon that sketch of the idol in the journal. I wouldn't be able to convince the university to fund this little expedition, dangerous and controversial as the study of uncontacted cultures could be, but that was all right with me. I didn't mind tapping into my savings for what might just be the find of my career. After flying into the capital... I bedded down for several nights to rest up and purchase supplies. The heat was particularly oppressive that June, and the usually hectic Port Moresby seemed almost sleepy beneath its weight. I bought simple provisions, mostly rice and preserves, and tried to enjoy what peace I could before what I knew would be an arduous journey. 
On the final night, I confided in several friends from the National Museum, showing them where I was headed and giving them a rough timetable for my return. Then, with my equipment studiously packed and laid out at the foot of my hotel bed, I slumbered peacefully for perhaps the last time in my life. I've often dwelt on that final evening in Port Moresby, wondering if the experience which followed would have been made more bearable if I had walked a different path. I had wholly abandoned the idea of bringing grad students or professional friends along on my trip. A longtime curator at the museum, excited at the retelling of my story, had offered to accompany me, but I had turned my friend down. The inland regions of Papua could be unpredictable, as we all knew, and I didn't want to put anyone else at risk. This was my gamble to make, I reasoned. What a fool I was to make it. A short morning flight to Ley, a murky industrial port on the northern coast, was followed by a long bus ride up into the highlands. The sun-kissed warmth of the lowland coasts was steadily devoured by the stifling humidity of the conifer forests in the highlands. The towering trees crowded in to cast their shadows over the road, and the ferns and scrub reared up to blot out the spaces between. This blanket of ancient woodland was only broken when the road wound up to the mountainous heights where grassy, rock-strewn cliffs and slopes jutted from the trees down below. When the bus at last rumbled to a stop that night in the highland town of Osino, a local chartered jeep carried me overnight east into the hills, bumping over winding dirt roads and between jagged mountain passes. As the sun rose, I was jolted awake by the driver to find myself in that same memory-haunted village unchanged by the intervening years and swirling with yet more vibrant mystery than it had boasted in my intrepid youth. The village of the ancient tree had not forgotten me, it seemed. Jokoa, a gregarious elder nearing a century's age, greeted me warmly. He remembered my interviews and the studious interest I'd taken in the region's many clans. He took me into his home and told me about the many family squabbles and marriages which had filled the intervening years, the wood smoke scent of the traditional dwelling whisking me away to happier times. We ate a modest lunch and a much more grandiose dinner, the village going out of its way to make me comfortable. All the while, though, I awaited the perfect moment to produce the old sketch of that strange golden idol. Only when the grandchildren and great-grandchildren had retired and the elders once more ringed the fire did I remove the copy I'd made of that damnable idol's image. I almost at once felt guilty, for Jokoa recoiled from it, as if it might leap from the page to bite him. Initially, he refused to answer my questions about the old journal in the Golden Totem, but eventually he broke into practiced English, ensuring his words couldn't be understood by his fellow villagers at the fireside. Jokoa told me that the village's oral tradition held the idol to be over 500 years old and affirmed that it was supposedly the spoils of a raid of some kind. He told me that his grandfather had been the one to meet with the Detzner expedition and that the elder had sunk the wicked totem in a nearby lake in fear that the Europeans would return looking for those who had forged it. The whole affair had left the community desperate to keep the abhorred valley dwellers unknown and sequestered in their woodland holdfast, forgotten by all save the highlanders who watched them. There were three clans who watched it first, Jokowa told me his solemn eyes on the glowing embers beneath us. One left in the forties to find work in the city. The next village moved to the coast, took up farming and fishing. We're the only ones who remember. We are the last that still believe. 
Jacoa proceeded to tell me that it was much more than comfortable stubbornness which kept his people on the hills overlooking the shadowed vale. It was they who had begun the practice of watching the valley, and they who kept it safe. By long tradition, they posted warriors at the mouth of the crag leading in, and burnt back the brush which guarded the entrance. Sun and moonlight were poison to the pale things in the valley, he said, and the whole clearing in the woodland at the valley's edge was specifically cut to ward off any wandering the wretches might do in the dead of night. Long ago, when firearms had made their way into circulation on the island, the valley dwellers had been brought to heel. The stalemate between the twisted tribe within the valley and the highland villages that contained them had become one-sided. Seldom did the things creep from their accursed dwellings in the dark earth below, and this was just how Jacoa wanted it to stay. Now, only occasional sweeps of the valley were made, yearly incursions into the shadow to ensure the ancient enemy was kept cowering in the dark. Jokoa wasn't shocked when I did what curiosity demanded by asking whether I could try and enter the valley. His expression was pained, more with pity than irritation. He reiterated the dangers, telling me that the tribes I sought weren't entirely human. They were vicious, heartless devourers of men. He conferred with his fellow elders, who each shared stories in their native tongue of horrible legends passed from father to son about the terrors which lurked in the valley, from cannibalism to twisted rituals and effigies of bone beneath the trees. Again, I was faced with a chance to disengage, to abandon my scholarly interest in an undescribed and unique culture and settle for a calm and collected week recording legends with Jacoa in the safety of the village. Again, that foolish ivory tower certainty pulled me along towards the undiscovered, and I declined to heed Jacoa's words. After a last round of questions among the elders, Jacoa laid out the terms. His people, after all, controlled the sole entrance and exit to the valley and only with his blessing could I set foot in the hated chasm. There will be no recording, no pictures or film, Jacoa ordered. Your experience is your own. I protested, telling him that documentation of so isolated a group was the purpose of my journey, but he insisted. There are dark things beneath the earth, he told me wizened face dancing in the dim firelight. I will not let you bring word of them to the wider world. You will sate your own curiosity and, if you survive the many-legged god, return home with legends no settled man would believe. Jacoa grinned. Again, the gesture was soft, sympathetic. I got the feeling he imagined I wouldn't return. I molded over weighing my need to find the truth. I accept, I told him at last, my eyes darting for the open end of the hut and the moonlit treetops in the valley beyond. Very well, Jacoa nodded. We will show you down at sunrise. I had always known danger was a distinct likelihood. But as I trudged down rough slopes behind seasoned hunters and fighters who jumped at each broken branch while the shadows deepened around us, the drive for discovery which had brought me so far began to ebb. With dawn's light being swallowed up by sheer rock walls and towering trees, the old bolt-action rifle Jacoa had insisted I carry seemed thin protection indeed. At length, our band of intrepid intruders came through the suffocating ferns into the open air of a clearing. Opposite us, the jagged stone walls of the chasm leading into the valley loomed out from the morning mist, looking for all the world like some long-abandoned fortress from a dark fantasy novel. Tokua, Jokoa's imposing grandson, 
strode forward the last fifty yards or so at my side while the others held back like gawkers watching the condemned. Stay above ground, Tokuo urged, his wide eyes meeting mine for perhaps the first time that morning. You don't want to get caught in closed spaces. They move fast. He shook his head, looking up along the switchback path towards the village. I thought he might try to dissuade me one last time, but he never gave voice to the words. Instead, he simply reiterated the warning of his grandfather, urging me to be out of the valley by nightfall. Then the group departed in silence, leaving me to gather my courage in the shadows of that ominous chasm. Only in the absence of other people did I realize how silent the primordial forest had fallen. The quiet was broken here and there by the distant call of some hunting bird far above, but that was small consolation. I glanced one last time at the notebook that contained my writings on the Detzner expedition, rallying my thoughts and reminding myself how fortunate I was to be confronted by so potent a mystery. At last... I hoisted my pack onto my shoulders, readied my rifle as best my unpracticed hands knew how, and strode into the misty-mouthed canyon. During my education, I'd been fortunate enough to wander some incredibly old megalithic sites in Sumatra and Java, an experience at once intriguing and depressing. The long-dead ambiance of those jungle-eaten temples and monuments reared by centuries-dead civilizations can make an onlooker feel as if they stand at the cusp of a mass grave. This chasm was somehow much worse, lonelier than anything I've ever experienced. I pushed past fetishes and totems of wood and bone produced by Jokoa's highlanders and placed with ritual caution to ward off the evil said to dwell within. In chalk-like pigment, they had etched glyphs and figures upon the walls, mock warriors poised to throw back anything which might dare stand against them. Overhead, trees on the slopes above the chasm seemed to lean in to devour the sky, drowning the crag in semi-darkness. I produced the powerful flashlight I had brought along, shocked at how blinding the shadow had become, ever glancing towards the distant canopy and never once catching sight of the azure morning beyond. Then, the chasm opened up on the valley proper, and I was greeted with a sight which should never have been seen. The space was relatively thin, some one or two hundred yards across, but stretched away into the mists for many times that distance. Several small streams fell in babbling procession from the sheer stone walls and pooled in a clear pond at the center, breaking the droning silence of the chasm. Up above, on the battlements of the rough stone slopes, mighty trees twisted and intertwined at obscene angles to form a living ceiling their bulk and range of growth seeming beyond reason. Despite all this evocative scenery playing out beneath the beam of my flashlight, it was the walls themselves that stopped my heart in my chest. Set into the reddish stone of the valley's edges, great glowering faces had been carved. They were abstract and elongated, their twisted contours carefully smoothed and rounded. Their mouths and eyes opened onto what I at first took to be small alcoves for display or storage. Upon drawing nearer, I saw that the mouths were doors, awkwardly raised from the ground below and allowing access to the interiors of buildings carved into the rock. Immediately, I made for my notebooks, sketching their forms as best I could by the glow of the flashlight. I might not be able to take photos, but this was too otherworldly a find not to record. Nothing of this sort had ever been found on the island. Indeed, I could think of nothing similar the world over. Turkey's Cappadocia and Jordan's Petra come to mind when one mentions underground communities or construction. But these faces were positively chilling. 
I could at once understand why the place had such a terrible reputation among the locals. Despite the grace of their construction, the buildings were intimidating, the valley seeming observed from all angles by its unliving guardians. The stonework looked old to my trained eye, eaten away in places despite the concise cover of the canopy above. Whether the years were measured in centuries or millennia, I could not tell. Given what I was to learn in that time-forgotten hell, I cannot help but assume the latter. Nearly an hour passed before I mustered up the courage to enter one of those awful, carven faces. I wandered the valley, finding it a great avenue of near-identical sculptures, with only the streams and pond to break its symmetrical layout. The remnants of what I took to be gardens of some kind rested here and there among the entrances, empty patches of raised soil perhaps used to raise lichen or fungi in the damp dark of the valley floor. Occasionally, slightly luminescent crickets leapt from my path, the sole sign of life in the unmoving tomb. At last, though, I could stall no longer and forced myself to clamber clumsily up into one of the open mouths. The rake of my flashlight across the far side revealed a circular chamber, its walls expertly shaped but left rough and textured to the touch. Its high, domed ceiling grew incredibly low near the floor which itself buckled inward unevenly like a bowl, making the whole space into a kind of flattened sphere. At the center there was a fire pit and several raised plinths I took to be stools, and along the curved walls alcoves racked with dust housed pottery and sculptures of treated clay. Some, upon closer inspection, turned out to be blown glass, speaking to a high proficiency among the craftsmen of this undescribed people. Almost all were shaped like crawling or curling millipedes or centipedes, giving credence to the century-old sketch of Friedrich, with the few outliers generally being insect or arthropod in nature. Only when I had done several circuits of the room did I accidentally bring the beam of my light directly across the sunken fire pit, the whole of the room's ceiling lit up like a signboard, making me jump like a stricken animal. I had to collect myself before I fully realized what had happened and brought the beam back to focus on the pit. Its leaden interior, coated in some sort of dull metal soot-stained by spent fires, reflected upon an unbelievably intricate network of multicolored quartz which had been meticulously inlaid upon the ceiling. The lines formed many elongated men, dancing or posing around a vast coiled centipede, much the same as the one represented in gold those many years ago. I spent some time sketching the image, marveling at the grace of its contours and the play of my light off the dazzling quartz. I imagined how it must have shimmered in the flickering light of a fire seeming to shift and waver on a smoke-shrouded ceiling. Then, with a final scan of the stunning chamber, I proceeded through one of the several low, round doorways set into the wall. The smooth leather divider, which had once served as a curtain, chewed to tatters by the march of time, pulled away to reveal an almost identical chamber next door. All around the valley, these dwellings or ritual chambers formed a sort of communal hive, interconnected and accessible, hinting at close clan or familial bonds among the missing inhabitants. Toward the rear of the dwellings, heading deeper into the rock, small rough-walled tubes had been carved, usually leading into musty, cramped depressions littered with desiccated old rags of a strange, dark fabric. These I took to be bedrooms or meditation chambers, secluded cubbies where the inhabitants could curl up and ruminate on the issues that faced them. Sometimes, though, the tunnels wound off around tight corners, seeming to weave out of view and deeper into the stone below. 
Try as I might, I could not bring myself to crawl into these tunnels. The warnings I had received about the darkness which lurked below ground played a part, but I was equally concerned about the claustrophobic awkwardness of the angles and slopes in the tunnel. Fascinating as the valley was, the oppressive mood it inspired was undeniable. The subdued clamor of the waters outside served to coat the shadows in a masking white noise, and the feeling that I was not alone had grated on me more than once as my boots echoed across the stone. I had no desire to become trapped on some slick incline in the dark beneath my feet, my cries for help reverberating down into the unknowable depths. As it happened, the surface held one final groundbreaking find for me. When at last I reached the end of the valley, I discovered the building there to be different than the others. It was much larger, with an oval interior soaring cathedral-like overhead, the shadowed floor covered with raised plinths or stools like the ones I'd seen before. The walls were covered in curved shelving, carved into the stone, laden with clay tablets in impeccable condition. On these tablets, a series of elongated triangular depressions formed a language of some kind, its patterns making it unmistakable, though whatever linguistic tradition had birthed this otherworldly writing was alien to me. I speculate it was legible as both a visual and textural language, allowing its readers to feel its words in the dark, much like Braille. So exhilarated was I by the discovery of etched writing that I made it almost halfway round the room eyeing the shelves before I noticed the effigy looming at the far end. I had, at first, taken it to be a statue in the shadows, a massive recreation of the smaller clay and glass sculptures the modest dwellings had displayed. When my light played off its jagged form, I realized that its contours were of bone rather than stone. Lashed by leather or skin with meticulous care, femurs and ribs made up the legs and carapace of a great, writhing centipede. It was reared like a striking cobra, its legs outstretched and flailing, its ivory bulk having towered over the raised stone stools that decorated the floor. Protruding from the place where a head should have been, was a centaur-like assemblage of bones that preserved the shape of a man, with the long spine bent and its arms outstretched towards the floor below. Its skull, slightly above eye level with me when standing before it, looked out over the room with unseeing sockets. Something about its proportions struck me as wrong, perhaps speaking to some deformity or birth defect but I was too unnerved by the structure to draw in for a closer look. The giant idol was a wicked thing, and I gave it a wide berth. Though, as an anthropologist, I told myself my revulsion was born of unfamiliarity with the practices of a very unfamiliar culture, that student's mantra didn't ease the harsh glare of the unseen skull scanning the room. I focused instead on the shelves and tablets, gathering those which looked most intact into my bag and wrapping them in wax paper, hoping Jokoa would understand my need to preserve these potentially priceless clay tomes. After all, if the Highlanders had actually wiped out the valley dwellers, then these were the last testament to the community which had been built in the darkness of their sheltered, misty vale. Then, a very different kind of text came into view. It was a modern supply log, many decades old, rotten and torn. This stranger, in a landscape of strange texts, had been slipped in among the tablets, just one more tome among the collated knowledge of the many-legged god. I suppressed my excitement and removed it as tenderly as was possible donning plastic gloves to handle the delicate pages within. By the light of my flashlight, scored by the soft symphony of the slow streams and chirping crickets outside, 
I saw the text was in the French language. Though I speak many tongues, my French was mostly garnered in grade school. Still, collating that layman's grasp with a solid understanding of Latin, I could make out the gist of most of it. A missionary, ostensibly Catholic, was keeping record of supplies and funds being used to establish wells, clinics, and churches in the highlands. The few legible dates in the log placed its origin sometime in the early fifties, and its contents seemed mundane. Then the pages ceased to be lists and became something altogether more terrible. In hurried scrawl which demanded Herculean effort to decipher, the missionary wrote of a raid on the wagon which had been carrying their supplies. He described the slaughter of their horses and the capture of he and his companion in the shadowy dusk, another missionary named LaSalle. More chilling was the shaky description of his captors, etched in handwriting made jagged by frayed nerves and spiked adrenaline. The things he described were men but stretched beyond reason, gaunt and disturbingly tall. They had moved with a grace he described as disgusting, likening the way their elongated limbs and spines worked to the way a spider's legs skittered. Their faces, he said, were the worst, sunken and marble pale. Their heads had no ears, instead boasting great sunken pads that vibrated with every snapped twig or soft footfall. Their massive eyes, almost entirely pupils, danced in electric light like those of animals above mouths of needle-like teeth. They had dragged them away, the narrator wrote, into a valley I took to be the very one in which I stood. The ghouls, as he termed them, had branded and marked the skin of their captives before ritually butchering LaSalle before an effigy of bone. What the writer called their monster had taken LaSalle, an offering of flesh for a hungry god. The writer, assuming he was being saved for another ritual the following night, had scrawled these words in hiding, hoping his fellow missionaries might learn what had befallen them. They'd obviously never found them, and the fate that befell the log's owner was easy to imagine. I turned my gaze to the idol once more, drawing in to examine that malformed skull, the missionary's words etched into my memory. Suddenly, the proportions made sense, the saucer eyes and the gaping cavities where ears should sit coming into sharper focus. It was so close to human, yet so abysmally different. Those who look on Neanderthal, or the popularly named Hobbit, and find them uncanny, need only look on the children of the many-legged god to experience true revulsion. The stone beneath it was dark and stained, ancient offerings long ago having blackened the ground. As my mind reeled, trying to piece together what I was seeing, I caught a flicker of movement above me, at the edge of my light. I looked up, and at once understood what it was to be an ensnared fly watching the hungry approach of the spider. Through a decorated crevice high above in the masonry of the ceiling, its gigantic body contoured to examine the room beneath it. A massive centipede had crawled. It was impossibly large, several feet wide and dozens of feet in length, far larger than any such thing should ever be able to grow. Its antennae wriggled mere inches above my head, twitching as it blindly searched for the prey which had so carelessly stumbled into its temple. I screamed as I stumbled out from beneath the creature and frantically dashed for the exit. I didn't have time to consider how foolish that cry had been. My only thoughts were of the pass to the sunlit forest beyond the valley, and the muted clatter of chitinous limbs on the stone behind me as the many-legged god gave chase. It was not until I burst from the temple into the near blackness of the veil that I realized how costly that scream had been. 
skittering from the once vacant mouths of those glowering faces and through cracks on the cliff face above with a flexibility and ease that seemed supernatural. The valley dwellers came. They moved on all fours, bent at the back to allow their overextended arms to aid in propelling them along the ground. Their legs jolted like a frog's, twisting at painful angles, their pallid skin translucent with the purple tinge of bulging veins. Blades of flint or obsidian were clasped in their hands, but it was those glinting, bulging eyes that made my blood run coldest. I sprinted, the centipede thing left somewhere behind me as it hesitated to leave its dark temple, its dozens of servants loping in to meet me. I skirted the edge of the pond, moving faster than I'd ever moved, but realized there was no way to outpace the things near the exit. They already closed in across the pass, barring my way, hopping forward to meet me at the pond's edge. I focused on them as I neared, preparing to fight, considering whether it was too late to swing the rifle down from my shoulder and attempt a shot. The two between me and the pass shrieked, an awful hyena-like sound made with vocal organs alien to our own. The light of my flashlight's beam was on them, and they stumbled over themselves to avert their eyes. Glottal and hacking, I thought I heard breaks in their cries, something that I now assume was language. I wheeled around, bringing the light to bear on the things approaching my side of the pond, driving them to their knees and setting the whole mob to shrieking. I wasted no time, starting up my sprint again, waving the beam at any who drew too close, thrown rocks whistling past my head as the things yowled to their fury at the light. As I pressed through the pass, I kept the light angled over my shoulder ever aware of the coyote-like chorus in pursuit. Only when I stumbled out into the late afternoon sun of the meadow and put a thirty-second run between myself and the valley's mouth did I dare look back. I curse that I did, for I would certainly sleep more soundly if I'd spared myself that last, eerie image. Deep in shadow, hanging from the rock with tapering fingers as if they had been born to the stone. The valley dwellers decorated the walls of the chasm. They hung at varying heights, visible as still silhouettes more than solid shapes in the gloom. Their eyes caught the ambient glow of the sun upon the meadow, and gleamed hungrily after the foolish soul they'd sought for prey. In the years since my fortunate flight from that night-cloaked veil, I've ceased to be an anthropological interventionist. When the argument arises whether the hands-on or hands-off approach is best when dealing with documentation of uncontacted or undescribed cultures, I always advise the Academy to keep far away. I'll tell colleagues who ask why so great a shift has taken place in my stances that preservation through awareness has proven fallible in my eyes. I'll opine that the uncontacted are better protected by their isolation than they could ever be by documentation. If ever the true rationale got out, my academic credibility would go up in smoke. Delving in the wake of that awful day has dredged up myths about the Vedic Agartha or the Mayan Shibalba. I've become keenly aware of how common human mythology about civilizations beneath the rock and stone truly are. I rack my brain, wondering how deep the tunnels beneath that forgotten crevice in Papua wind. I crack open my books and scroll tirelessly through articles on evolutionary divergence at my desk, taking note of the many close relatives we once had as a species and how widely they vary. What path, I wonder, might a group driven underground have taken? What twisting of the hominid form might take place if it were dragged from the sunlight into the shadow of the Earth's winding interior? Often, I look from my study's desk to the chest where those treated clay tablets rest unseen, unknown to all but me, and shudder. 
it is best, I've decided, that I never know the answer to those questions. If the children of the many-legged god are anything to go by, I believe it is better that no one know the answer to those questions. Heading the linguistics department at the University of Clarksville has suited me well. It's a tiny but respectable school, and my long career there has been nothing shy of impeccable. The town of Clarksville, for which it was named, has been equally wholesome, the rolling hills and verdant trees of south-central Kentucky allowing for a mild, contented life. My attachment to that peace is what kept me silent for so long, holding my tongue for fear that wagging it might upset the delicate balance of the department. The kinds of claims telling my story in tales would be derided across the academic world, so I've kept quiet about what I experienced beneath Mexico some 40 years ago. Now, though, With the headsman's axe of stomach cancer weighing heavy, I feel the need to write it down, if only so I can grapple with what I've kept buried for so very long. I'll leave this account buried amongst my personal papers, to be stored in the university's archives. I'm under no illusions that what I write will be believed, should anyone ever bother to read it. I only hope it can serve to calm my nervous thoughts before the end. A crude leech bleeding, so I might leave this bad blood far behind me. The whole sordid account began in 1979, several years after I attained my tenure with the university. As a young academic, I'd homed in on pre-Columbian Mesoamerica, the cultures of ancient Mexico and Guatemala holding particular interest for me. I won some small renown in my field figuring out ciphers for several forgotten Mayan logograms whose meanings had been lost during the long Mayan collapse. The languages fascinated me, and I made it my business to dig into any undeciphered writing or glyphs the region offered up, no matter how insignificant they might seem to others. It was this willingness to chase any lead which attracted the attention of Javier Herrera, who contacted me that spring. Apparently associated with a modest local museum near the community of Tishtlancingo, Herrera was an amateur archaeologist with an interest in drawing tourism to his modest hometown. Having heard of my trip into cartel country the prior summer to fetch Toltec writing tablets from a tiny ruin, He'd wagered I was not averse to risk. He was correct, and I was thrilled rather than daunted by the risky proposition he had in store for me. Blind to danger and unconcerned with the slim chance of finding anything valuable, he'd found just the right foolish academic to ask. A recent landslide in the area had alerted several herders to a huge, newly opened chasm in the hills west of Tishtlancingo. Initially just a geological curiosity, the locals had become intrigued with the sort of obelisk they'd spotted in the depths of the pit. The pillar of preserved rock featured familiar Mesoamerican characters in several well-known native languages, apparently repetitions of the same prayer cycle in different tongues, a sort of Mesoamerican Rosetta Stone. One form of writing, though, was unlike the others. It was, Herrera told me, unlike anything he'd ever seen before, sure to be of interest to someone with an interest in obscure Mesoamerican linguistics. The pictures he'd mailed along proved as much, displaying a dimly alien pattern of elongated triangular markings which held no traces of anything familiar. This, along with several scattered chunks of masonry in the water nearby, led Herrera to believe there was a larger site lost to the depths. 
It was those depths that would make a survey dangerous, and whose unplumbed mystery would pull me along into the expedition. The chasm seemed to fall away for hundreds of meters, ridiculously deep. At its terminus, a cenote opened up, revealing a crystal-clear tube of azure water trailing away through the earth to depths unknown. To plummet for artifacts or information would require a potentially risky diving excursion into the cave system, on top of the treacherous scramble down the chasm itself. Herrera needed a competent linguist capable of first translating whatever strange language decorated the obelisk and then managing the prodigious stress of the descent, in case more of the writing could be found below the surface. It goes without saying that I'd have accepted the invitation whatever the details might have been. The prospect of examining such an odd writing system, wholly unknown to the region, made my imagination soar. What really set me ablaze, however, was the glyphic representation of a bat's head which decorated the familiar panels of the obelisk. Though it had many names in many native tongues, it had only one meaning. This was the symbol of Xolotlan. If you're familiar with the idea of El Dorado, the mythic city of gold supposedly hidden away in the wilds of the New World, then consider Xolotlan a city of death, a less famous sibling to that city. The Aztec god of lightning and death was Xolot, his image most often that of a dog-headed man or a skeletal, bat-headed figure in priest's regalia. The Mexican hairless dog, Xoloitzquintli, to give it its proper title, is named for him. The breed was supposedly a gift from Xolot to mankind, given so that the dogs might lead their human companions on safe passages through the land of the dead into the subterranean underworld beneath. The near-forgotten crown jewel of this underground maze beneath the realms was Xolotlan, Xolot's temple city. I'm fond of the mythology, so much so I own two of the dogs myself. As such, I have a fascination with the seldom-mentioned, often-overlooked Xolotlan, Obscure tales told by certain arcane pre-Columbian texts of central Mexico say Xolotlan was a place to which those near death could make pilgrimage, a mighty subterranean metropolis in which half the buildings and structures were tombs and monuments, a rumor-shrouded place known only to the priestly castes of Mesoamerica's civilizations. Xolotlan and its caves were reportedly occupied by both human holy men and beings of the world of death. As such, they were safe only for those who were blessed with entry by the subterranean guardians of its anointed avenues. The mythology surrounding Xolotlan had been in shadowed existence long before the founding of Tenochtitlan and the beginning of Aztec expansion around 1325. Even the ancient Olmec have logograms reminiscent of Xolotlan, suggesting the idea of it was there from the very beginning, rising up in ageless millennia before agriculture came to Central America. Of interest to the Spanish were the rumored tombs, assumed to be rich in gold and turquoise, along with countless other rarities. It was to this obscure place that Herrera's miraculous obelisk made reference. There was no chance this tiny kernel of vague information would win over funding from the school or the local elite, leaving me to lean on my own savings. As I scrambled to book a summer ticket and scrounge together my modest funds for diving instruction and travel, I had no inkling of how momentous and terrible what we'd discovered would turn out to be. Excited as I was by this brazen new frontier, I boarded the plane to sun-scorched Acapulco that June with every intention of turning up no more than a pile of corroded gold relics and moldering bones, the refuse of a sacrificial pit. How wrong I was. How wrong we all were. Herrera welcomed me with open arms, 
and we spent the first weeks of the month practicing for the coming dive in the crystalline waters off the resort-choked coastline. Emiliano Villafuerte, an old associate of Herrera's who'd aided during tours of the area, took on my instruction. He proved to be a capable and compelling teacher, especially considering the language barrier. Despite my knowledge of Mexico's native languages, I was paradoxically short on Spanish in those days, and Herrera had to act as a go-between during my time in Acapulco. This made the lessons a bit stifled, but we naively figured the dive would be as straightforward as any cenote excursion and forged ahead, blind to the tribulations lurking in the hills. All the while, I poured over rubbings which had been carefully taken from the obelisk, in awe of the intricate structure of the newfound language. It bore more resemblance to Mesopotamian cuneiform than Mexican writing systems, but the triangular wedges that composed the alphabet were cluttered and aggressive. Moreover, it seemed to be an alphabet of syllables rather than a writing system of pictographic symbols or logograms, as with virtually all other Mesoamerican writing. The strangest feature was that they'd been formed of raised stone rather than impressions, the whole backdrop of the inscription having been painstakingly carved away from the letters. In this, at least, it reminded me of many other native writing systems, complex and likely meant only for a privileged elite of highly trained priests. The labor required to write in the tongue would prevent most lay people from even attempting it, we began to jokingly refer to it as Mexicaniform amongst ourselves, and despite its strangeness, I made excellent progress with the material we had available. Using the familiar Mixtec language as a guide, I worked out a visual system for reading the Mexicaniform which would come to serve me well below ground. Though there was no way to distinguish what noises the long-dead alphabet or logograms represented, the words could be understood easily enough. The inscription, a warning to what I assumed to be prospective priests, was shadowed and imposing, sporting all the Stygian menace common to Mesoamerican religion. A doom has fallen upon the lands of death, it proclaimed. A darkness lurks beneath which even mighty Sholot cannot endure. All has fallen to silence and even silence has gone to seed. The lifeless city lies cold, naught but the void awaits hither, and so shall it ever be. The words were eerie, seeming an attempt to ward off visitors. I'd never encountered similar passages before, for the underworld and its denizens were generally treated with reverence by religious texts. To see the city of death, ostensibly the fabled Xolotlan, referred to as anything other than an erudite scholar's paradise of temples and plenty, stirred the specter of fear in me. That fear would linger until our departure, and grow ever stronger during our long drive up into the mountains. More dry than tropical, the region was craggy and sheer, and each dip in the hills was choked with a sharp, gnarled green scrub that gnawed desperately for moisture in the parched earth. The trees were bent and scattered, leering over treacherous dirt roads like petrified witches in the afternoon glare. Every once in a while, a great gust of wind from the distant coast would sweep through the still highland brush, making it dance and wave in a way that seemed to me almost malevolent. I said as much to Herrera and Villafuerte, and they laughed off my nerves, content to assume it was just the discomfort of a stranger in a strange land. Though the locals and the few villages we supplied in were hospitable and jovial, and the landscape was not terribly different to countless other regions around central Mexico, I found the hill country's eerie beauty grotesque. The best description I can give to the menace is to say it felt like the backdrop to a nightmare which I could only vaguely recall, or perhaps of one I had yet to dream. 
I'll leave the exact location vague for reasons that will become evident, though those few who were aware of our purpose in the academic sphere could likely piece it together. It is my sincere hope that, in the long years since, the locals have forgotten those strange days, and the academic contacts who knew the truth of our aims have passed on or fallen into obscurity. By the late afternoon, we'd come to a halt and went into the hills, bent under the weight of heavy containers and watertight bags. We began outside of a modest home, and, after exchanging pleasantries with the owner, made our way north along the property into a dip between the hills. Following the bed of a dry creek, we came into a deep scrub-choked vale surrounded by steep cliffs. At its heart, a giant rent had opened in the earth, a rocky mouth grinning back at the mocking sun overhead. The others suddenly seemed to share my apprehension, the region's leaden shadow weighing heavy on all of us as we anchored ourselves for the climb downward into the hole. With scraggly goats eyeing us suspiciously from the heights and the hateful wind dulled by the walls of the valley, we descended on secure lines along the stone. The crevice proved much deeper than I'd initially anticipated, dropping a thousand and more feet into the earth beneath the mountains before it terminated on the banks of a placid, crystal-clear cenote. The sun overhead was eaten whole by the towering rock of the walls, and the noise of the wind became a distant, muffled piping. Lights bouncing off jagged cracks and water-worn rock formations, I was taken several times by the notion that the massive pit all around us had been carved out by hand. The soft, angular shapes seemed too symmetrical and measured to be natural, despite the wear and tear of many countless years upon the stonework. I related these thoughts to Herrera and Villafuerte, but they told me they'd found no signs of hammer or chisel strikes in the stone. We reasoned it must be some accident of nature, like the famed Giant's Causeway of Ireland. What most certainly wasn't an accident was the obelisk itself, which I took to studying the second my dusty boots left the slope. Jutting from layers of long-dried mud on the cenote's shore, the tower was masterfully carved of delicate, condensed obsidian. Our flashlight beams splintered and fractured on its jagged, crystalline edges an effect which combined with the cenote's still waters to create a dazzling light show. The thing was even more intriguing in person than those first grainy photos had suggested. Up close to the looming 18-foot obelisk, I couldn't explain how a pre-Columbian society could have found such a massive chunk of intact obsidian. They must have heated it, Herrera offered, his own eyes wandering the obelisk melted the different pieces together like glass. This I doubted. The civilizations of ancient Mexico were many things, talented craftspeople among them. They were not, however, great forge workers. To turn this much obsidian to slag, cool it in an unbroken block, and so elegantly carve into its surface would challenge even modern craftsmen. I suddenly wished I'd done more to rope an anthropologist or geologist from the university into this slipshod expedition. Glad as I am that no other professors or graduate students were dragged into that forgotten pit, their input would have been enlightening. As I stared down the imposing mass of that midnight dark stone, I was convinced that we were on the verge of something massive utterly beyond the scope of current New World archaeology. Still, as Villafuerte prepared our dive gear and did a preliminary scan of the clear water beside us, I assumed we'd have plenty of time to call in extra hands from universities across Mexico and the States that summer. This was, I told myself, merely an exercise in profiling a chance to get the lay of the land so we knew what we were working with if it came time to bring others in on the discovery. 
Determined to scout out the cenote and ensure all was safe for us to proceed, Fiafuerte made one final pass of the water with his light before sliding in from the sheer edge of the pool, the ancient surface sloshing with disturbance it likely hadn't known for centuries. Herrera and I watched on from the shore in our wetsuits, the water shining in eerie turquoise when lit from below by Fiafuerte. He traced his way around the mouth of the large sinkhole just beneath the surface, some 300 feet in diameter, before pushing downward into the bowels of the cenote. Deeper and deeper he went, his light moving this way and that as he inspected the curved walls, until at last his light was little more than a flickering dot, a lonely minnow circling the basin of a megalithic well. Then, in a soundless blink of sudden darkness, it disappeared. Herrera and I waited, trading speculation about whether something was wrong. Four or five minutes later, just as we were beginning to agree that something had gone sour in the cenote, the distant light reappeared, bobbing up towards us excitedly as Villafuerte made his ascent. When he finally breached the surface, he ripped away his regulator and scrambled out of the water in a frenzy. We expected shock or fear, the atmosphere of the shadowy crag taking our thoughts to dark and foreboding places. Fiafuerte was ecstatic, however, tripping over himself to tell us what he'd seen in the sinkhole. There were tablets and inscriptions along the walls, he said, all in the same triangular script we'd found upon the obelisk. Then, the cenote bent sideways, some eighty or ninety feet down, with the tunnel sweeping off to the west. There was a light at the end, he said, faint yet undeniable. The passage was huge, easily navigable, perhaps even carved. We'd need to see it with our own eyes to believe the scope of it, he insisted. Though the ominous obelisk and the wailing wind above had grated on my nerves, I'd be lying if I tried to convince anyone I wasn't thrilled by Villafuerte's words. Herrera donned his tank and took up one of the watertight bags, as did I, the whole group reverberating with renewed excitement. We double-checked our oxygen supply, tested our lights, and slid beneath the surface. The water proved surprisingly warm and its clarity was beyond anything I'd ever experienced in similar sinkholes across Mesoamerica. Comfortable as it was, we made an effort to be efficient. Following Villafuerte as he led us to four tablets built into the submerged walls of the cenote, evenly spaced along the shaft. These two were made of obsidian, fixed by ancient artisans into perfect cubbies in the surrounding limestone by some unnameable method. We photographed the passages of Mexicaniform with a bulky old underwater camera Herrera wore fixed to his chest. I didn't want to expend valuable time translating them while our oxygen slipped away. Later examination has proved them to be chants or mantras, encouragement for initiates and pilgrims who might have made the deadly dive in ancient days unassisted by modern equipment. No human eye could have made out the writing this far down, leaving me to privately theorize they must be ritualistic rather than practical, lending an unseen helping hand during the most trying part of a pilgrim's journey. Once we reached the bottom, we found no ritual sacrifices or scattered offerings littering the floor. Rather, the smooth cenote was intersected with an angular square hall, perhaps fifty feet to a side. It cut a clean path through the stone for a considerable distance, the better part of a mile, before opening up on a distant, gleaming light, just as Villafuerte had claimed. As we illuminated its walls, my heartbeat rattled my ribcage, my breath coming ragged against the regulator as I grappled to rationalize what I was seeing. Otherworldly, angular carvings decorated the walls, depicting strangely proportioned pyramids and equally strangely proportioned men. 
The reliefs were captioned with long passages of the strange language its crafters had used, almost all of which contained the Mexicaniform rendition of the name Xolotlan. We nodded and gestured at each other in frantic excitement, mute but desperate to share our exhilaration at something so unprecedented. Herrera clasped Villafuerte's shoulder, the gesture slow and clumsy through the water, a wordless congratulation on his find. Villafuerte shook off the thanks, pointing to Herrera's camera and motioning towards the walls. No one protested, and soon we were swimming along the broad Cyclopean tunnel, lights flashing to and fro as the camera captured the artistry of what we assumed to be some forgotten pre-Columbian ruin. The carvings and the passages accompanying them depicted a group of pilgrims approaching the mythic Xolotlan, making offerings and obeyances as they went. They were led by the familiar figure of the Xoloitzquintli, the dog pointing their way with almost comically outstretched paws. Abstract and cubic as the carvings were, they became unsettling when the pilgrims met the residents of Xolotlan. The natives of the City of Death were depicted as tall, thin, and wide-eyed, eerie even through the lens of angular sculpture. They towered over men, their gangly limbs outstretched in cold acceptance, a distant elder welcoming its delinquent children with icy reluctance. They spoke or sang before their guests, capering in ritual dances men from the surface praying or meditating in their shadow. Then, the priestly visitors from above would be sacrificed, carved open atop strange temples reminiscent of the classic Mesoamerican style so common upon the surface. By the time we'd photographed and deciphered our way to the farther end of the tunnel, our flashlights were no longer needed. The glow was almost blinding from here, such that we strained to make out what lay beyond the tunnel's mouth right up until we floated over the brink. Beyond, we saw something which outstripped anything we'd seen thus far, and which I'm sure most will denounce as nothing more than deluded hallucination, if, that is, they've believed anything at all. I wouldn't believe it myself if I'd not been the one to experience it. We emerged halfway up the angled walls of a mighty, artificial subterranean lake. The walls, like the massive tunnel through which we'd entered, were of carven stone, replete with abstract outlines and jagged, menacing reliefs. The lake bed, a hundred yards or more beneath us, was blanketed in a tall forest of bioluminescent weed and fungi which twitched and swayed in the superheated froth of thermal vents. They were a sickly, pinkish white, their glow making the seascape feel surreal and uncanny. Tube worms, like those that cluster around deep-sea volcanic fissures, surrounded these vents, and all amongst them fauna that would floor the most imaginative marine biologist made its home. Pale, spindly crustaceans swarmed over the smooth stone, plucking sustenance from the vents. Gargantuan albino fish hid amidst the weed, sluggish bottom feeders whose skeletons and organs were silhouetted through translucent flesh. Smaller, equally see-through minnows and darters drifted in schools through the open water and great pinkish stingrays like those that swim the Mekong River floated up from the floor to dance with them across the lake's otherworldly vista. All this was haunted by the bubbling thermal exhaust that plumed here and there to the surface as the vents belched and bellowed, obscuring our vision before dying away to let the lake glimmer clearly once more. It was a beautiful, arcane, freshwater seascape that would have made a fantasist weep. To this day, I think back on the life that even now must swim beneath the hilly countryside of western Mexico and try to work out the intricacies of that cave-born biosphere in my mind. 
In the moment, we all drifted to the water's surface far above, desperate to speak after so momentous a discovery, making to slip our mouthpieces free the moment our heads bobbed above the surface of the lake. What we saw above the water, however, stripped our words away before they could even be formed. The lake's calm, bubbling surface stretched off for miles, and the distant cave ceiling soared thousands of feet overhead. Mist from the warm lake formed vaporous clouds against the carved, stony sky, and colonies of chittering bats wove in and out of them like birds searching out a roost. Clusters of some strange fungal growth or lichen pulsed a sickly glow here and there from where they grew upon the ceiling, giving the impression of dull, winking stars through the imposing gloom. The cavern was titanic, larger than any known to humankind, so impressive in scope that it made our heads spin just to gaze upon it. This sensation was made all the more paralyzing by the fact that it all looked hand-shaped, taking the form of a monolithic, squat octahedron. At the lake's center, there rose a vast platform, an artificial island wreathed in mist. Massive towers and pyramids jutted like treetops from the shroud, looming black against the glimmering cavern ceiling. Their smooth sides reached up to that ceiling, often mirrored by identical structures which dropped down to meet them from above. It looked like a forest of angular, handcrafted cave columns, built in a style vaguely similar to Mesoamerican temple complexes, but infinitely more skilled. Even well-funded modern architects would struggle to replicate the structures in concrete, with all their machinery and logistical coordination brought to bear. This, I knew at once, was fabled in rumor-haunted Xolotlan, the mythic city of death given form, apparently not so mythic, after all. Once we'd gotten over the initial shock, I said as much to Herrera and Villafuerte. They were as exhilarated as I, all of us imagining the possibilities such a find offered up. There were the obvious material benefits to our careers, but I feel we were all much more excited about the staggering, awesome novelty of the discovery. If I'd stumbled across Atlantis itself, I'd have hardly been more pleased. Herrera stammered out a question, wondering whether we should go back and return with a more able team. Neither Villafuerte or I would relent, both of us arguing for a push into the city proper to get the lay of the land and know what we'd need for a return trip. There is a small part of me that laments that we did not turn around, as Herrera suggested. Perhaps he and Villafuerte would still be alive. I sincerely doubt it, however. If anything, a larger return trip only would have meant more dead. It is probably better for all of us that our expedition ended in failure and terror, and that I was left alone to dwindle, letting knowledge which should have remained forgotten slip away in deafening silence. Blind to the doom that waited for us, we swam for Xolotlan with a desperate explorer's glint in our eyes. There was perhaps half a mile of calm, open water to cover, and the adrenaline made the undertaking seem easy. Though the towers looked ominous through the fog, the comfortable warmth of the lake and the peaceful, hushed atmosphere of the artificial cavern lulled us into a monotonous sense of isolation. Foolishly, we assumed ourselves to be safe, the sole truly dangerous visitors to a placid, poised remnant of a bygone age. We were soon to be corrected, harshly. Herrera, perhaps the most nervous of us, was the first to notice it. It took some time for him to decide it wasn't a trick of the light or the lake's slow currents, and by the time he called out it was already nearly below us. Even if we'd spotted it sooner, we were a fair distance from the city's low-slung stony shore. I doubt we'd have made the banks in time, 
even if we gave it everything we had. Herrera called out for us to look, drawing our eyes to the lake bottom. The fungal fronds and strands of weed were being rustled in a weaving, snake-like line, something darting through the growth unseen. The movement halted just below, leaving us to tread water in frightened awe for a moment before the weeds spat forth the thing which had lurked within them. The creature was pale and bony, translucent in the sickly light of the lake. I think it was a giant freshwater eel of some kind, though there's nothing like it known outside that forsaken pocket of wildlife in Xolotlan's bubbling waterways. Its flanks gleamed with luminescent dots of a pinkish hue, and its black eyes glinted atop a flat, snake-like head fixed on our position at the surface. Ascending with shocking speed, it opened that broad mouth unbelievably wide, its throat swelling and distending to accept its target. Poor Villafuerte had been in the lead, kicking absently out in front of us, and it was he the thing focused in on. The length of an oarfish and several times the width, it covered the intervening space with such blinding ferocity that it was more a blur in the water than a solid form. Though Villafuerte kicked and yelled, knowing what was to come, there was nothing he could do. He was snapped up in its mouth in one fluid motion, the thing breaching the surface like a leaping whale. It had swallowed him whole, and as it retreated back to the safety of the weeds below, we could see the dark outline of him thrashing and spasming through its ghostly, troglodytic flesh. Had Herrera not intervened, I would have floated there, mortified, until some other horror swam up from the deeps to take us. As it was, he pulled me along after him, shouting that we had to get out of the water. He had the good sense to tug the equipment along with us, keeping our bags close at hand. It was Herrera who first climbed from the water onto the sloped, stair-step shore of Xolotlan pulling me from the water close on his heels, sputtering and gasping. I vomited upon the stone, focusing only on the plain, gray rock beneath me as I gathered my racing thoughts. Herrera wasn't much better off. Shaking his head as he muttered Catholic prayers and pleas in shaken, hurried Spanish, there was nothing to hear his muttered desperation save the forgotten city of the dead, which cast its shadow over us in expectant, malignant menace. It took us some time to compose ourselves. The thought of returning to the surface through the glowing lake in light of what we now knew lurked beneath the weeds revolted us. With Villafuerte's loss, the expedition's aim had become survival. Feeling cornered, we resolved to examine some of the city around us and try to find another way to return to the surface. Only if all else failed would we try the waters again. Taking stock of the watertight bags, we realized the dried fruit and nutrient bars we'd brought would be limited, only enough for a few modest meals. We had only counted on one night in the cenote, and even rationing wouldn't extend that by much. The water of the lake, at least, seemed potable. With ample batteries, we were also not in danger of running down our lights. The area in which we stood seemed to be some sort of small-scale stone dock extending from the huge foundation of the city. Low, open-fronted buildings faced the water, empty and yawning, likely warehouses or storerooms of some kind. We shrugged off our cumbersome tanks and kicked off our fins, leaving them stashed at the base of a wall. While our wetsuits and the rubber-soled socks we were in weren't comfortable, we had no other options, and ended up trudging into Xolotlan sodden and trembling in the still air. The city itself was likely only a few miles squared, but it was a dense maze of interwoven streets and pillar-like temples. 
Pyramids or blocky housing rows would rise in steps from the floor, only to be met in kind halfway to the ceiling. Doors and windows seemed oblong, built for residents which weren't quite normal. Textured ramps served in place of staircases in most buildings, angled so steeply we could hardly make progress climbing them. Often, these ramps were mimicked on the structures built into the ceiling overhead, making our stomachs churn as we silently wondered what purpose upside-down walkways served. We marked our way with small, green pieces of a notebook's cover, the color striking against the muted grays, sickly whites, and unwholesome pinks of the city. It would be incredibly easy to get lost down one of the many claustrophobic alleys or avenues, and we were always conscious of our bearings. The first buildings we fully entered, a row of towers filled with what looked to be apartments just off the docks, were spartan and austere. The furniture was stone, simple but elegant, with any cushions or adornments long ago having rotten away. The ceilings were strange, tall to us but low by comparison with the doors and windows, parallel with the top of the entryways. Little copper and gold plaques decorated the walls here and there, displaying short prayers or passages of unfamiliar scripture in the upraised Mexicaniform text. These apartments climbed up ramps too steep for us to ascend, but we guessed they rose all the way to the cavern ceiling. Walking further down the dark street, we climbed the low steps to a brooding stone temple wreathed with reddish moss. Its interior was cavernous, high-ceilinged and decorated with solemn statues of Sholowitz Quintly which posed like the Egyptian sphinx on plinths along the walls. There was a large, intricate stone map of the city built into the floor of the temple, its major buildings picked out with glimmering turquoise or jade. This was much more accessible to us, and when Herrera urged me to translate some of the religious reliefs upon the walls, we realized why. Working with the pins we'd stowed away in the dry bags, I looked over the tablets which were set into the walls above the map taking note of words or letters which hadn't appeared on the obelisk. It took me a few nervous hours, sweating in the dark under Herrera's flashlight to get a rough translation, but by midnight I had my report. It told a very grim story. Whatever the denizens of Xolotlan were, this temple was not built solely for them. Offerings of the faithful were routinely sent down from the surface, they wrote and many of their recorded prayers were blessings meant to prepare these pilgrims for sacrifice. Men from major Mesoamerican cities would swim the cenotes, of which there were many, into the lake, then brave the waters into Xolotlan. Those that reached the shore would be ritually fed and clothed, fattened upon rich banquets like exalted kings, and then carved open in the temples of the city as tribute to Xolot, patron god of Xolotlan. The altars of the temple, stained a blackish brown in unremembered ages, gained a new, imposing significance. There was a sort of macabre beauty to the place and the rituals it had hosted, but I couldn't appreciate it standing in the dusty remnants of that centuries dead city below the earth. It was a far cry from the sunlit avenue toward the Pyramid of the Sun, and worse, the human beings who had been offered up here were offered by something which wasn't quite human. The more I looked at the reliefs of gangly, staring figures welcoming pilgrims to their doom, the more I was convinced that the residents of Xolotlan were far from ordinary. These were thoughts I didn't dare relate to Herrera though I'm sure he must have suspected as much. We had kept an inexplicable silence all throughout our wanderings here, whispering and miming to maintain the stifling quiet. There had never been any discussion of this, but attracting attention seemed somehow ill-advised, regardless of the fact that Eon-dead Xolotlan seemed derelict, 
haunted by no more than memories and dried guano. It felt as if the walls themselves watched us, as if the city were slowly awakening to the presence of outsiders upon its ancient streets. It didn't help that a moist, sonorous clicking had rung out here and there throughout the city, usually from high up, as if the noises came from the roof. I pinned this sound on the bats, and Herrera always demurred and encouraged my skepticism, but I could tell they still grated on him. He flinched whenever the sound reached us, reverberating through the long dead ruin like the smacking of chewed gum, and I couldn't blame him. We sketched out a little replica of the sculptured map on paper before walking down the treacherous old stairway, scanning the towers around us with suspicious eyes as we went. There was a massive, hourglass-shaped ziggurat at the city's center, visible in silhouette through the forest of crowded monoliths and buildings, and we headed that way. The ritual carvings gave us reason to believe there was a colossal stairway inside it, a metaphorical and literal connection to the world of lesser men above. It was our greatest hope of escape, and we were ever more eager to see the sunlight once more. It was perhaps an hour into this journey that we were interrupted, the painfully loud slap of our rubber boots upon the aged stone clattering to a noisy halt. First, a loud, wet clicking sounded, uncomfortably close. Then Herrera, ever vigilant, had spotted it, pointing me towards the stalker. I had only just glimpsed it in the gleam of the flashlights we carried before it slunk backwards into the shadow, lurching like something out of a B-grade zombie movie. It was a silhouette, a head and shoulders pale as bone, which slid back behind a doorway into the mouth of a giant residential tower as our light struck its glinting eyes. I made some fuss about it being a large bat roosting in the ruins but we both knew that couldn't be. It had been tall, leering, too identical in shape to the gangly figures immortalized in reliefs and faded murals as the builders of Xolotlan. Herrera asked how anyone could still be alive down here, and I reminded him of the ominous inscription on the obelisk. Not but the void awaits hither. I thought as we drew the tiny knives from our kits and pressed towards the house. So shall it ever be. There was nothing inside beyond tumbled pottery and dusty stone furniture. The tunnel-like ramps and chutes leading higher into the tower were there, though, mocking us with their shadowy mouths in the artificial light. Anything could hide beyond, and we'd have no idea. We resolved to hurry on. We'd speculated about finding a place to bed down as the night wore on and we grew more exhausted, but the sighting of the thing that hid in the tower put an end to all that. There was no dawdling or speculation now, only a hurried trot towards the distant ziggurat. Still, we made our best effort to keep our noise to a minimum, eyes darting from window to window or scanning the cloudy heights of the city along the cave ceiling. It didn't help. The smooth streets of the city were often denoted with names at intersections in inlaid quartz or glass of some kind, occasionally marred by bat droppings or creeping moss. All of these were unfamiliar to me, perhaps great figures or events in the city's history. They caught the lights of our flashlights when we flicked them on now and again and we flinched each time they threw stray beams up into the heights of the city among the towers. Every few minutes, a soft repetition of that weird, sonorous clicking came tumbling through the streets, untraceable as we snapped our heads up and down looking for whatever lurker had made the noise. Ten jumpy minutes into our walk, Herrera spied a pair of uncanny figures hanging upon a walkway between towers far above us their arms outstretched like chimps as they clutched the rung of the bridge. At first, we thought them to be human-shaped ornaments or sculpture, marble against the jet-black shadow of the stone. 
when another pale form slid insect-like from an adjoining window and crawled along the bottom of the dark bridge, we ceased making excuses. A clicking sounded from a place in the towers far behind us, and it was answered by the group in front, agitated and hurried. Our hearts leapt as similar sounds rang out near and far, low and high, all across Xolotlan. The figures were too distant to make out details, but their eyes told us all we needed to know. Saucer-like and glinting in the cavern's surreal, fungal, ambient light. We debated in whispers whether to draw back down the streets the way we had come or continue on, trusting they would keep their distance. The decision was made for us, though. There was a shuffling behind me, hardly audible miraculously picked out amidst my huffy breathing and the fluttering of distant bats far above. Herrera stood between me and the thing hanging from the bridge, so perhaps subconsciously I felt most vulnerable at my back, listening for any sound that might herald danger. In any event, I threw a glance over my shoulder, only to drag Herrera by his shoulder into a stumbling, desperate run. In our wake, a dozen or more of Shulotlan's misshapen people sprinted in a hopping pursuit, pouring from alleys and sliding from windows down walls with the grace of acrobats. Their strange, long limbs contracted and leapt. Hops and crawling jogs punctuated their run, so that the hunters looked almost clumsy despite their speed and fluidity. Still, there was no denying that they were masters of their environment navigating sheer rock walls like crouching spiders only to drop to the ground and sprint like men. Herrera followed as I made a gamble, passing under the bridge from which the first watchers hung. They were already swinging down towards the ground, leaping from window to balcony to window, desperate to reach us before we could get by them. They made ear-splitting, whooping screeches that cascaded down the stony streets like floodwater and the demoniac chorus of responses they received made our blood run cold. We didn't have time to ask in those harried seconds where the pursuers had been, or how they could have let the city degrade so much while they still lived. We thought only of escape. Slipping past the bridge, I caught a good view of one of the hunters as it landed in an animalistic crouch off to my right. Its head was skeletal, noseless and grinning, golden eyes massive and bred for the dark. Tall, nude, emaciated, translucent. Ribs were gray outlines against white flesh and darkened veins pulsed down willowy, tapering limbs. Herrera must have gotten an equally intimate view, and the twisted sight spurred us on. As those pallid, overstretched caricatures of human beings clamored like hyenas at our backs, we burst from an adjoining street onto a wide thoroughfare, perhaps a mile long, which led to the base of the ominous central ziggurat. Once, it might have been a grandiose vista, a horticultural crown jewel of the city. If it had once been a fitting tribute to the revered psychopomp Sholot, it was now as forgotten as the deity who inspired it. In years past, a strange garden of exotic subterranean fungi, likely manicured and tastefully maintained, had fallen to the same neglect which had worn down the rest of this terrifying, proud city. Fern-like fronds of a fleshy, dim red fungus glowed all round, many having eaten through the stone of the streets. Taller clusters of bone-white stalks seemed to flicker like dying lamps in the gloom. Lazy, fattened fireflies nearly the size of cicadas hummed from mushroom to mushroom, alighting on pale branches and sickly-smelling fungi. The whole ground was a kind of rotten, stinking morass, filling our nostrils with a punishing stink like ammonia. The garden-turned-swamp might have been a paradise for the strange life which sprouted there, but it revolted us on a primal, unspoken level. Herrera actually stuttered in our run, swerving on his feet as he involuntarily retched, 
the stink hitting him head on. I pulled him along with me as I passed, barely holding it together myself, ever conscious of the yells and all-too-familiar clicks shadowing us up the thoroughfare. We kept wide of the thickest of the fungi, sticking to the overgrown road, closer to the towers lining the thoroughfare than the gleaming core of the rotten forest. Whatever repulsion we felt, it couldn't keep us out for long. A crude stone spike or spine, barely a blur at the edge of my vision, whipped past Herrera, thrown from somewhere above and ahead of us. It had missed him by inches. Almost as soon as we registered how close he'd come to death, another projectile was loose from behind, whistling by my ear. Herrera, seeing that there were pale figures running out from the towers between us and the central ziggurat, moved towards the forest. A rock grazed my head as I ran, sending a warm flood down my cheek, but I was too focused to feel any more than the dull thump of it. Herrera was hit too, stricken in the back by several stones as we wove through the first of the vile fungal ferns, but he carried on unfazed. The strange, fleshy leaves of the dusty mushroom growth whipped past in a blur. The buzz of flies and the wet thump of our feet in the mire's mud and guano floor filling my ears. Herrera called out to me, and I was fortunate he did so, for my vision was severely impaired by the glare of the glowing bog. Without those calls to guide me, I might have been separated from him on the move. It was only when we tumbled upon the banks of a stagnant and fly-clouded pool at the core of the garden, gasping and lightheaded, that we realized we'd left our pursuers behind. Initially, we were relieved, as Herrera examined the gash across my skull, deciding it was better to leave it than risk washing it in the vile water of the bog. The two of us began to regain our wits. It didn't take long for me to question why our pursuers would give up so easily, their cries and clicks lost beyond the buzzing symphony of the mushroom groves. Perhaps the grove was poisonous, we reasoned. We hadn't experienced any reaction to the growth beyond our initial repulsion, but that didn't mean we weren't in for a nasty surprise down the line. Much as that thought frightened us, we could hardly go back out into the open with the chittering horde of cave things. Trapped with no good options left to us, we resolved to walk along the bog's central pool towards the ziggurat, hidden from the pale things outside by the crowded fronds and stalks. We never let our guard down, our eyes sweeping every row of fungus or ruined hunk of masonry for any sign of danger. It was no easy task. Our eyes teared up at awful stenches and gaseous clouds filled with swarming gnats, all while the luminescent ranks of mushrooms pulsed and shimmered. The acidic air seemed to waver before us like asphalt beneath a hot sun, and our vision seemed lagged, with silhouettes remaining superimposed over our eyes long after we'd moved past the stump or mud bank in question. Soon, our heads throbbed and ached with the effort of trying to reconcile such a deluded, surreal landscape, blunting our ability to reason clearly. Herrera and I took turns in the lead, the follower keeping their hands fixed on the former's shoulders while shutting their watering eyes against the fumes. This way, we kept just enough sanity about us to make sure we were headed in the right direction. One sodden boot in the mud led to another, and though I can't say how long we slogged through the shit and grime in the garden, we eventually stood in the shadow of the ziggurat. It was little more than an outline through the glowing canopy overhead, but its bulk was unmistakable. I was following when Herrera pointed the temple out to me, spurring me to pry open my eyes and look past his shoulder. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was rustling through the fungal fronds to the side, though, my gaze snapping from Herrera's outstretched finger to the wavering half-shapes I saw in the garden thickets. I was rasping a warning, coughing out to him through the monotonous droning of buzzing insects, 
when something broke through the mushrooms into the open. I have no clue how such a thing came to exist. Maybe the properties of the air in Shulotlan are different than those above the surface, permitting growth at a rate unknown in the wholesome air of the upper earth. In any event, it couldn't have been a hallucination. That was my first thought when I saw it, that it must be some mirage born of the foul air and the flickering glow enveloping us. Mirages do not kill. They might mislead or confuse, but they don't tear a man limb from limb. Skittering from a bank of dense fronds just to the side of the pool came a praying mantis, pale and floral, glowing with all the brilliance of the bog in which it hunted. It was difficult to track its fleeting motions against the backdrop of the swamp, for its camouflage was excellent, but we could immediately tell it was no normal animal. It stood fully as tall as our shoulders. It came silently, making no sound save the light sucking of its limbs sinking into the mud. We both reeled, scrambling along the bank, desperate to center our wavering vision and attempt an escape. The first noise to truly break the white noise of the rotting garden was Herrera's scream. The only thing which saved me was that, by chance, it exited the foliage nearest to Herrera. Had he been in the rear, it would have been him that reached the ziggurat on trembling feet. As it was, the mantis from the bog dug its scything limbs into him, one around the torso and another around the shoulder. I saw it pluck Herrera's arm off like a flower petal as I slipped past, shrieking into the stalks of the swamp. I didn't try to fight, though I'm sure I couldn't have done more than get myself torn apart alongside him. Still, that doesn't do much to numb the guilt. His cries lasted for several minutes, haunting every step of my flight from the fungal forest. With each footfall, I thought another of the mantis things would burst out to take me. I believe I spotted several more in the corners of my vision, prying through stalks or perched upon gigantic mushrooms, but I can't be certain these weren't nervous fantasy. Projections meant to whip me into motion. Regardless, I exploded outward onto the thoroughfare at the foot of the ziggurat and managed to pound out the last few yards to its base before I collapsed in frantic exhaustion. I have no time scale for how long I lay there, half-conscious as the haze of the bog lifted, but it couldn't have been more than an hour. I'm amazed to this day that the pale natives didn't finish me off while I was laying senseless on the stone. I suppose they dismissed us as lost, clueless victims of the overgrown garden and its deadly inhabitants. Based on what I was to learn soon after, it's possible they simply didn't recall we'd been there, though that's rampant speculation. Whether by fortune or some other conspiracy of factors, I opened my eyes within reach of our goal, alone. The ziggurat itself seemed to glower down upon the labyrinthine metropolis, a giant black gateway at its center topping a massive bank of steep stairs. Like much of that dead, devouring city, it looked like a waiting maw, prepared to swallow up and vomit forth sacrifices after a long and thirsty hiatus. A dark, Ancient stain down the center of the stairway spoke to the streaked blood that had been left there in aged, forgotten days, when Shulotlan still hummed with more wholesome life, if such a word can be used to describe so otherworldly a place. Behind it, the pallid fungus of the ceiling shimmered through the mist like a sputtering sun, backlighting the temple with a frigid, repulsive light. This, then, was the place to which pilgrims from the surface had been brought in ages past. I gathered myself, only then realizing I'd lost my bag somewhere along the escape through the bog. All I had to my name were the small knife and the flashlight, both clutched tight during the tumbling struggle in the swamp. That, and Herrera's camera, 
which we'd passed between us during the blind navigation through the mire. Whatever sliver of awareness had remained in that miasmal garden had told me to keep them close, and I resolved to conserve the light's battery as best I could. Slowly, agonizingly so, I crawled up the treacherous incline of stairs. Every shaky step I thought I'd hear that familiar clicking and screeching start up amidst the towers of the city. Though my eyes strained at every squealing bat and distant splash in the placid lake, I only heard a few distant clicks, and they never grew nearer. That fact didn't make the climb easier, each lunge upward reminding me how tumultuous the night had been, and how close to death I'd come. I refused to relent now, no matter how exhausted I was. When I did finally come face to face with the dark, open doorway atop the stairs, that resolve was pushed to its limits. The glum light of the fungus on the cave roof reached only a few feet past the entrance, and the blackness beyond was impenetrable to my eyes. Flicking on the light, I steeled myself as best I could and pushed inside. What I found within was a charnel house. A great square chamber with a depressed floor met my feeble light, tunnels and platforms leading up or down from the main room into the upper and lower segments of the massive temple. All along the floor, caked in the undisturbed dust of centuries, the bones of countless thousands rested in hunched, desiccated preservation. These were, of course, no normal corpses. They were the mounded bodies of Xolotlan's cave-dwelling dead, rank upon rank leading to a central altar, behind which the foot of a mighty stairway rose towards the ceiling. The stone ceiling above the stairway was flat, I could see, crushing my hope of a simple ascent from the ziggurat. It took me some time to recover from that disheartening discovery. After a minute or two staring over the dead, I made myself move forward, weaving along the rows towards the altar. A diademed holy man of some kind lay splayed in death before the altar, his skeletal arms outstretched towards an obsidian tablet. On it, I found an inscription in the script of Xolotlan, an epitaph, as it turned out, for the mighty city upon whose corpse I stood. The tablet told of a blight that had come to Xolotlan, a fungal infection which took root in the sinuses and climbed into the brain. This was anathema to them, for it was not one of the many familiar edible or functional glowing fungi of the cavern, but a strain from the surface. They speculated it had been brought down with one of the pilgrims, using terms which have rough anatomical and mycological analogues in our own languages today. The ill lost their higher functions, falling to irreconcilable rage and barbarism. The clawing death was what the priests had called it, and its ravages had left Xolotlan isolated and reeling faced with an internal enemy they could not fight. The city of Xolotlan had been cut off from other great cities of the depths, the tablet making references that reminded me of the mythic Shambhala of Vedic legendary. They had sealed off the roots to the surface, warded off the pilgrims of the overworld with obelisks telling of the city's doom, and gathered in the heart of the ziggurat. Here, the lingering survivors had ended themselves en masse with the potent poison of the priesthood's devising, one final show of devotion to Sholot, that he might shepherd those amongst his children who still had their minds into eternity. The staring, yelping things in the city made sense now, as did the yawning, unkempt garden. The landslide which had started all this had torn loose a barrier erected in centuries past, one meant to seal the city away. We'd been drawn, clueless and excitable, right into the depths of a nightmare, a modern parody of the ancient pilgrims whose feet had trodden upon these same temples. 
Did the illness, which had twisted the strange denizens of Xolotlan, impact human beings in the same way? How many of the zombie-like revenants in the city bred amongst themselves and clung to life, chittering and grasping in the dark corners of a city they no longer understood? How many other enclaves might even now exist in the depths of the Earth's crust, teeming with humanity's strange subterranean relatives? All these questions assailed me, but slowly one rose to the surface of the mire, bringing clarity to my racing vision, giving me a tangible goal for the first time since reaching the ziggurat. There had to be a secret behind the perfection of Xolotlan's stonework. The clean lines of the sealed passages to the surface were beyond any traditional stonemason. The cap which blocked the stairway at the ziggurat's center was like smooth concrete, as if the limestone had been shaped and flattened like clay. The texts in the earlier temple had made exalted reference to something called stone mold in relation to the priesthood, and I dismissed it as some kind of mythic wordplay about religious stonework. The tablet in the ziggurat, though, had mentioned it in a way that made me certain it was a substance, not an art form. This was some kind of tool the people of Xolotlan used in elder days to perfect the shaping of stone. Weaving down perilous ramps and crawling along rough-bottomed tunnels into the depths of the ziggurat, I strained to find more references to the stuff, desperate for anything which might help me break the seal on the temple and see the clean air of the surface world again. As I stumbled through ossuaries and monument chambers for the city's honored dead, my light played across opulent royal tombs and decadent sarcophagi that would have stripped my breath from me under other circumstances. I could give them little attention now, feverish in my desire to escape the place I'd been so intrigued by for so long. I feared that I might stumble on one of the infected natives in the temple's bowels, but those fears never manifested, making me think some revenant of their old faith kept them weary of the intimidating structure. Though many years had been spent dwelling on the myth of Xolotlan, I wanted nothing to do with it now, not after I'd looked it in the eye. My only focus was escape and I was fortunate enough to find my route not long after, emerging onto a shadowed canal running under the base of the temple. This, it seemed, was a transit line for the priesthood. It ran from side to side beneath the ziggurat, probably restricted and well-guarded in Xolotlan's golden ages. Now, only dust and minnows from the lake made the tunnels home, leaving me to explore in relative peace. I walked along the flat banks of the canal, shining my light into alcoves that cropped up every so often along the walls, until I found myself face to face with my salvation. One of the alcoves was filled with casks of a sort of slick clay. On the sides of these casks, the lettering of Xolotlan spelled out stone mold in careful, pristine characters. I'd wager there was some kind of chemical or plastic lining on the casks, Another advanced secret of Xolotlan, for within it was a kind of mild, clear acid. Perhaps that isn't the best word, but it is the only one that springs to my layman's mind. It had no odor, and it wasn't stored as if it was dangerous to the touch. I certainly didn't test that, though. Rather, I poured several cautious drops onto the limestone at the canal walkway. The stuff steamed for several long moments, like hot water under cool air, before falling mute. Prodding the spot with the rubber toe of my wetsuit, I found the stone spongy and malleable, like clay before firing. I've marveled at this for years. I've tried to consult chemists on the matter, but approaching the question without telling the whole maddening story has proved impossible. Without a sample of the stuff to examine, they're as incredulous as you'd expect them to be. The speed and impact of the substance, especially when compared with the tame, odorless nature of it, has proved indecipherable. 
another secret which will hopefully lay silent with the builders of Xolotlan for many centuries to come. Across the canal, in the opposite alcove, two remarkably well-preserved canoes were moored against the wall. At first, I marveled that wood would remain whole for so long while floating in the lake's warm waters, but then my light met the bottoms, and they shone beneath the beam. They were of a pale, likely fungus-based planking endemic to the caves, warped in places with age. The bottoms were something else, though, lacquered with some kind of quartz-like film that glimmered and reflected the surfaces beneath and beside it. For a moment, I struggled to piece this together, but the frenzied events of the night fell into place for me, and it all made sense at once. With these, the priests might row the waters of the lake in safety, with the gleaming forests on the lake floor making the boats shine bright against the glowing fungus of the cave ceiling. From below, I reckoned, the creatures in the lake would see little more than glimmering light. There would be no detailed dark shapes to pick out against the sickly glow of the cave's omnipresent, fungal daylight. Whatever the coating was, it must have had a slick plastic veneer, not unlike the lining of the casks in which the stone mold was stored. Rethinking my route of escape, I reasoned that the way I'd come in was the surer bet, and packed several casks of stone mold onto the sturdiest of the canoes. Then, Taking up a warped old oar from the wall, I pushed down the canal and into the light of the open city, praying this last leg of the journey went along without disaster. I made a heart-stopping, sluggish trip around the outskirts of the city, worrying at every moment that the muted breach of my paddling would draw up some monster from the bottom. I saw nothing terrible break through the weed and fungus beneath but I spied a few of the looming natives hanging from temples and balconies as I passed. They simply watched, curious and silent. I brushed up against the dock we'd first encountered just long enough to grab my tank and fins, eyes always on the heights of the buildings nearby in case the infected made another run for me. Herrera's likely sit there to this day, gathering dust in final testament to our awful intrusion into that overgrown crypt. Then, it was off onto the water again, making for the far wall of Xolotlan, basking in the light of that pestilent, mist-wreathed cavern for one final time. When the prow of the canoe brushed the angled wall of the cavern, I prepared my exit. Donning my fins in the tank, I readied my gear as best I could and ensured the water between me and the entryway beneath the lake was clear. I then lined up the canoe with the tunnel, trying to keep myself directly above the aperture. I had one final gift for the departed city. Taking up one of the casks, I made my gamble, dousing the wall with stone mold. The rock steamed just above the surface, running like heated wax breaching the water and rolling at a snail's pace down the angled wall like magma. I repeated this with all the casks I'd been able to fit on the boat, getting a good slide of the liquid stone underway before I slipped over the edge of the water and made for the tunnel. I hope the stone mold kept going, despite the water. It seemed to be eating up the hundred feet or so between the surface and the tunnel in a pudding-like wave when I passed by it but I can't say whether the strange chemical actually caused a big enough schism to close off the entryway through which we'd come. I swam at speed, every moment imagining some twisted eel or malign octopus swimming up the tunnel behind me, pushing me to kick ever faster. The ascent to the surface and the scramble out of that sinkhole onto the star-lit valley floor as a haze, made blurry by fright, disbelief, and the dying veil of adrenaline. I lay there for some hours, stripped of my wetsuit, sitting in the ragged clothes I'd hiked out in. I must have looked so out of place, wild-haired and wild-eyed, staring off across the hills like a shell-shocked soldier. Only the meandering goats and wandering lizards witnessed all that, though. When I stumbled into a nearby house soon after sunrise, rambling about Villafuerte and Herrera, I was almost delirious. 
The next days were a haze, a panoply of reports to local authorities about a diving mishap in the tunnels beneath the cenote. I never tried to communicate to them the full scope of what awaited us down there, even in my most rambling moments. I was never foolish enough to think they'd believe, at least not without seeing it for themselves. Whether anyone did or not, I can't say. I left Mexico the following week, shaken and disheartened, and I never heard from anyone official in connection with the tragedy. Perhaps my slipshod plan to close the tunnel worked. Maybe they trusted my word, consigning the sinkhole to obscurity as a dangerous death trap and leaving it to rest undisturbed at the bottom of that valley, forgotten. Neither of those options seem likely, though. I often worry there is some awful epilogue to my own experiences, known only by whatever unfortunate military dive team or state-funded expedition they sent stumbling into that abandoned madhouse. Despite those worries, whatever the authorities uncovered down there, if they've found anything at all, they've kept to themselves. This is as it should be, by my reckoning. There are some places it would be better not to disturb. As it stands, my career has been productive, and I'll be remembered by a dedicated few in my field for many years to come after I'm gone. That's all I can ask. I'm happy to let Shalotlan rest firmly in the past, where it should have remained all along. Some nights, though, I take out Herrera's photographs, which I eventually dared to develop. I unfurl that old rubbing from the obelisk and stare over the strange, angular characters of Shulotlan's long-dead language. I wonder why the fungal strain which devastated the city's troglodyte population had no noticeable effect on me, no matter how many years slipped by. I wonder about the strange tunnel maps on the ritual chamber walls in the ziggurat, about rumored subterranean cities from the familiar Grand Canyon to the distant Himalayas. I wonder about the references made to rival gods and enemy nations in the annals of Shulotlan's temples, and what they mean for the wider world. Myth cycles in Asia and pre-Christian Europe described similar cave-dwelling things. The more I dig into obscure bits of legendry, the more I'm convinced I've only spotted the tip of an iceberg, submerged and lost to human memory. A distant acquaintance employed at the Kansas City World War I Memorial once told a colleague about an encounter he'd had with a tall, pale, staring man outside a mine in eastern Kentucky, not far from my own doorstep. Could this Lawton stalker be related to the things which chased me down the avenues of Xolotlan all those years ago? I've never had the stomach to do more than wonder. I will, however, endeavor to leave the whole of my collected rubbings, pictures, and ciphers amongst my papers. If someone ever uncovers something related to some other nearly human construct beneath the surface, they might come in handy. Otherwise, consider them trifling curiosities, in this account a stress-induced false memory, fueled by a mind too steeped in archaic lore and shadowed mythology. I've certainly tried to do so, but maybe the readers of these ramblings will find more success than I have. I head to my end with my pet Shalowitz quaintly curled at my feet. Hopefully, whatever afterlife awaits me, if indeed one does, is beneath an open sky. Just in case, though, the hounds of Sholot will have me covered. Deluge.
When the floods came to eastern Kentucky last summer, some places were hit worse than Breathitt County, but that doesn't mean it didn't get hit. More than a half dozen died, and the lives swept away in the deluge didn't end with the dead. Ruined homes, crumpled vehicles, and the onslaught of mudslides on the steepest slopes meant there were few in the lower reaches of the mountains who hadn't lost everything beneath the driving rains. I came back to Breathitt from Lexington later that week. I'd demanded time off from work and had quit when I hadn't been given it. Going home felt strange. Most of my family had either died off or left following the siren song of money, as had I. But seeing images of the wreckage lit a fire beneath me. I felt obliged to go, to do what I could with what little I had to give. The first day, I was given equipment and put to work mucking out several homes near Lost Creek and Leatherwood, and I'd be moved around the county as necessity dictated by the people managing cleanup in Breathitt. The silt and clay which had swept the valleys had built up five or six feet deep in places, and the halls of old houses near the creek bottoms had been caked with the stuff. We would wade in and scrape the stuff out, a crude sort of archaeological excavation, turning up sodden furniture and the broken refuse of broken lives. Jagged glass and twisted metal in the muck were the least of my worries, for the longer I dug, the more certain I was I'd encounter the body of one of the missing in the mess. But my fears never materialized. I pulled several mangled, crushed cats from the mire, and found a dog drowned against the wall of a collapsed barn. But I never suffered the dull horror of scraping away mud to realize I'd discovered someone's mother or grandfather or daughter in the slurry. The trees in the hollers had been tinted brown a dozen or more feet off the ground by the swell of the flood. Great banks of slick muck drying around fallen trees and crushed cars had to be scraped off the roads to make them passable again. Trailers had been picked up off foundations and dashed against bridges and trunks, resting shattered like glass along the banks of the creeks. Bloated cows and deer and chickens bobbed past along the river now and then, or rotted where they'd gotten caught amidst the debris. The whole place had a strange, subtle reek of putrid flesh masked by earthy damp and young rust. It was through these ruins we prodded and dug, mounding scrap to be burned or hauled off. Often the residents of the properties in question were in tow, trying to find lost photo albums and keepsakes and all the other dear things grandmothers and matriarchs fret over amidst the destruction. There were a few working the cleanup who'd come up from the lowlands, Mostly church groups, and some wanderers like me who'd taken up the call and come back from Cincinnati or Louisville. But most were locals, their beards unshorn, their eyes tired after days without rest, and their eyes hardened by a lifetime's labor beneath the earth or the scorching sun. True, there were patronizing journalists from elsewhere lingering and watching that first week. But after the buzz had died down, and the novelty of the funny little accents of these funny little hill people with their funny little problems had worn off for them. They scuttled back to their holes in the cities, and left us to our work undisturbed. It was because of one of those visiting journalists that I ran into Stephen McCullough, a childhood friend I'd not seen for over a decade. The stranger was attempting to poach an interview off a crying old woman as she gathered the refuse from her collapsed porch along River Caney, and it was Stephen that ran him off. I recognized the voice before I recognized the man, for we'd shared the odd catch-up call now and then since I'd left Jackson. But once I approached him and we got to talking, the years melted away, and more than ever, I felt at home again. Reminded by the talk and the language and the shared sorrow what it meant to be from somewhere. When work wrapped up at dusk that day, and I made to drive back from my home in Lexington an hour off, 
Stephen invited me back to the family home with him, an offer I gladly accepted. I'd been over at least once a week in boyhood, and I'd known the McCulloughs as well as I'd known my own kin. We rode through the wreckage up into the higher hills, talking of days gone by and wondering how long it would take before things felt normal again in Breathitt. I was barely thirty, but I felt like a boy again, despite the dour atmosphere as we fell back into joking and jibing, and pulled off up the gravel road that wound up to Stephen's home. We slipped out of the old ranger and pressed up the gravel toward the McCullough house through the damp afternoon air. It was the same property I'd been on playing and camping as a child with him, the tottering house as ancient now as it had ever been. Stephen's father had owned the sole garage in town before passing it on to his son, and the rusting wrecks of spent or uninsured cars decayed in rows amidst the tall grass along the woods. The neon plastic of recently used toys jutted up like candied teeth from the earth, testament to the frequent mock battles of many grandchildren and great-grandchildren. An aging generator hummed beside the AC unit, Beneath the porch's slouching roof, several old hounds slumbered on an old and weather-worn sofa which flanked the door, the canines glancing up only momentarily to ensure we weren't strangers as our boots creaked upon the stairs before sinking back into sleep. It was precisely the sort of home that was the butt of a joke in any urbane conversation about rural America mocking the backwards inbreds which dwelt up there in the hills from their silent suburban money pits. The jokers thankful they'd forgone the expensive business of children and land. Films written and paid for in cities with crime rates that would make breath it look like Hobbiton might people it with drugged-up cannibals or banjo-plucking rapists. And yet, in and around those old and flaking walls, Amidst these dense and ageless trees, more life had been lived than any sterile apartment complex or upper-crust lawyer-haunted condo would ever see. Above the screen door, as we entered, I made a point to reach up and feel the half-legible name Ernest etched out in the wood up there, a carven signature left by Stephen's great-grandfather when he'd built the home with his own hands more than a hundred years before. The warm interior of the old McCullough house was little changed from my boyhood memories of it. Cluttered with deep freezers stocked with last year's game, and furniture too sentimental to be thrown out. New pictures of younger McCulloughs adorned the walls and shelves now and then amidst the black and white portraits of the old. Perhaps the television was a newer model, but the atmosphere was just as warm as I remember it. Its avenues were filled with Stephen's family, his newborn bawling and his eight-year-old son Samuel whizzing around the kitchen as his wife and older sisters cooked. Nieces and nephews brooded silent in front of upbeat cartoons in the adjoining living room, seeming stifled by a dreary atmosphere they could not fully understand. They'd all come up when the weather got bad to share the generator and keep clear of the lowlands that were so prone to flooding. Both Stephen's sisters lived in town near the riverbanks, and both had lost everything they hadn't hauled up in their father's old truck. Lyle McCullough, Stephen's aging father, sat in his accustomed place at the table and asked between pulls from his oxygen about who'd been found in town, about the damage and about the dead. His usually warm yet sarcastically crotchety mood darkened when he learned old man McKinnon, a friend he'd shared a schoolroom with growing up, had been found crushed and drowned in his home that afternoon. I could see in his tired gray eyes that he was ashamed he wasn't able to be there with us, dredging the ruins of the town he'd grown up in. But neither I nor Stephen dared console him with words that would fall weightless and cheap at the noble old man's feet. The patriarch still commanded respect, even if he'd lost it for himself. Dinner was a cobbling together of rice, game meat, biscuits, and eggs from the coops out back, 
only dipping into the food the family had in plenty while resupply of the pantry remained uncertain. For all that, though, it was plentiful, and after days of work in the valleys, it was more than enough to fill us and raise our spirits. The women ate out back on the garden table, the children scattered to chosen spots around the living room, and Stephen and I ate alongside his father and in-laws at the small kitchen table, the old man's oxygen whirring softly as we talked. His young son Sam sat with us, silent but, I could tell, tickled to be eating with the adults. The house filled with the contented murmuring of familiar company, and though conversation never strayed far from the flood, it felt for a short while as if, safe in that place of familial security, we spoke of a distant land whose troubles might never reach us. I spoke with Lyle about my life in Lexington and my desire to come home, and he spoke about missing work, drawing Stephen in to talk about running the old garage. We talked of hunting and the trip Stephen planned to take come fall. We spoke of the children and school and the thousand little things that constitute community. It was only when the plates were cleared and cigarettes were lit in the dim light of the sunset pouring in through the back windows that Lyle mentioned an old friend who'd lost all his goats in the floodwater. Then young Samuel, silent till now, piped in and mentioned matter-of-factly the big man he'd found floating in the creek down the holler. This froze the room. Stephen, eventually probing to find out how serious the boy was, had Samuel tell him where exactly he'd come across this big man and what he looked like, but the boy struggled to describe it in detail. He could only say it was big and that its head was all wrong. Stephen excused himself, slid on a coat, and bade Samuel come with him out back. He was careful to keep his voice low and his demeanor calm, so as not to alert the other kids in the adjoining room. I followed, Stephen guessing we'd have an easier task finding anything in the dusk the more eyes familiar with the property we had looking. We wound silently past the women, who almost didn't heed our passing in the midst of conversation and slipped through a rusting back gate into the thick summer woods that cloaked the mountain. We three pushed down footpaths I hadn't walked since childhood, but even in the blue haze brought on by the coming twilight, memory crashed back down upon me. The familiar jagged slopes flanked by jungles of pokeweed and spindly conifers, shadowed now and then by great stands of oak and ash. The deer which haunted the forest at night occasionally crashed off into the brush, disturbed by our crunching footfalls as we wound down into the wooded valley, trailing the roar of the swollen stream that cut the property. Soon we were alongside it, tracing its banks from where it gurgled up out of some cave beneath the stone and counting the small waterfalls as we went, taking care not to slip toward the torrent in the gloom. It took only ten minutes or so to find the spot that Samuel sought to show us, but the lack of conversation in the onset of night made the air tense, and my nerves were more than a little frayed by the time we came to that ancient fallen log along the creek. Even before Stephen flicked on the light, I could tell it was no normal man. The figure broken and bobbing against the makeshift dam of fallen trees was huge, yet stretched and starved, stark white against the brown muck and slurry of the floodwater. Its sinewy arms, if it had stood upright, would likely have hung down past its knees. In the icy beam of a flashlight, the eyes, wide saucers like those of an owl, flickered with a cold on life. Its loins and joints were coated in crayfish that skulked and feasted on damp flesh, the bloat had begun, but the nude thing's distended midriff only accentuated its skeletal build. Stephen and I seemed dumbstruck and breathless, but Samuel looked on it with the grim curiosity a boy might lend a dead cow or roadkill. 
perhaps spared the realization that dead things should not exist by the innocence of youthful inexperience. Stephen and I eventually began to speak, the ever-darkening wood around us lending us an urgency I couldn't quite place but didn't dare ignore. He swore Sam to silence about the corpse for now, and bade the boy run up and fetch us a tarp from the shed, arming his son with the old shotgun he'd carried out with us, the gun looking comically large in the youth's pale hands. We would haul the thing up and meet him on the trail, wrap it in the tarp, and then haul it up into the shed. From there, we could decide how best to report the discovery. The moment Samuel disappeared into the trees with the shotgun, I felt somehow vulnerable in its absence. Stephen, more collected than I, shouted me over and had me aid in dragging the tall thing free from the haphazard dam, with one of us tugging at each of its ankles. The flesh was rubbery and freezing, and had it not been for the damnable swollen veins and faint stink, I might have been able to convince myself it was a prop or dummy of some kind. As it was, I watched with a shameful sort of relief as Stephen slung the thing over his shoulders like a lopsided autumn deer, and helped clear the brush and light the way for him in the gathering dark. Years hauling stone and game uphill had left my old friend with the wiry and sure-footed legs of an Afghan, and before long, we were on the main trails once more, making progress towards the top of the mountain. We were so caught up in the surreal impossibility of it all that we didn't really speak or speculate other than to coordinate our movements. That would come later, in the long night which followed. Then, as we climbed on shaky legs, our wonder at the twisted form we'd plucked from the creek was left to bounce around solely in our own skulls, leaving us both pale and wrecked by the time we crested the final rise. Samuel came back with the tarp just as we drew within sight of the back gate, and I flicked off the flashlight, all too aware of the ladies of the house who still sat and talked beneath the porch light. Stephen wound the thing up like a murder victim in a rug before having me take up one end. With young Sam getting the gate for us, we wound in and over to the shed just as night truly fell, taking care not to turn on the shed's lights until we'd shuffled the corpse in and closed the door. The three of us stood in a sort of awful awe over its bulk for a moment, catching our breaths as the enormity of all this pressed down on us. It was only after that dumb-stricken reprieve that Stephen told Sam and I to keep watch with the gun over the body while he went to fetch his father. He muttered something about old stories, and wanting to make sure this was what he thought it was, something lost on me in the moment. Before I knew it, he had slipped from the shed and begun a jog across the yard to the house. Though I don't know what he told them, he cleared his wife and the others from the back porch as he went in, leaving the world outside silent and ominous. Sam looked as if he wished to speak, but never did. I must have looked much the same. We stood silent over the thing in the tarp, our eyes and imaginations glued to it. I expected it to move somehow, to bolt up from the floor, or to slowly rise like some Frankenstein's monster from the cold plywood beneath it, shrouded under the cheap neon blue of its improvised death shroud. But it never so much as twitched, and after minutes which ticked slow as hours, Lyle McCullough was helped into the outbuilding by Stephen, short of breath after his brief jaunt across the yard. Stephen snatched up a panel of plywood from the far end of the shed and leaned it up against the sole window, a makeshift curtain to ward off prying eyes, before sinking to his knees. Lyle McCullough swayed above the tarp-covered shape upon the floor as his son made to uncover the thing from the creek. There was a chill pause as Stephen hesitated, with each of us, from child to elder, feeding off the nervous unease of the others. Then, in one hissing motion, the tarp drew back, and I saw the strange light of recognition dawn upon the patriarch's face in the sterile light of the single bulb overhead. "'That's one of them, all right,' he said. 
They's not a thing a man forgets. We looked on as he gathered himself, leaning against the wall as his tired lungs raked the air for purchase. Stephen asked Lyle whether he agreed with the plan he'd cooked up, that we should keep the body overnight and call in a Breathitt County Sheriff's deputy tomorrow to have it looked at. Lyle agreed. Only folks older than I am has any recognition of cave things. Even fewer seen them. Best to let them see it ain't no man for themselves. You'd sound crazy trying to describe it. Lyle's eyes stayed locked with the staring orbs of the dead creature he'd called the cave thing, seeming glued there by a fascination which was comprised of equal parts wonder and disgust. Stephen wasn't blind to his father's trembling hands and quickening breaths, though, and flung the tarp back over the awful visage of the dead thing as soon as he had his father's answer. He led us out of the shed, flicked off the light, and locked tight the door behind us. Then, taking his father's arm to guide him, Stephen led the group to the house. We didn't go inside, though. Not yet. There was talking to be done. Stories to be told, out of earshot of the rest of the family. Lyle took up a seat at the table on the screened back porch, and after fetching his oxygen machine from the kitchen, Stephen and I joined him there. After some back and forth over whether young Samuel should go inside, Stephen seemed to think better of trusting the boy to keep quiet around the other children, and pulled up a chair for his son alongside us. The back door was pulled up. Windows were shut, and the back light was turned off, leaving us shrouded in the shadows cast by the floodlight which overlooked the backyard and cast the shed in stark contrast to the dense, dark woods behind. Then Lyle began to talk. He told of a time some fifty years prior, when he'd been just a youth of thirteen, and Breathitt County had been a much purer place. Even with the clawing hands of mining and logging doing their work, the verdant hills of the county all still boasted round and forested tops, and the slurry and muck in flood season was not so terrible. In the sixties and seventies, a large minority of the households in the county had still lived day to day without electric, and though cars were common, they were often a family possession rather than an individual luxury. Life was harder, and, the more Lyle looked back on it, more rewarding. There were weird tales that came up from the mines back then, both close to home, and from counties a hundred miles off down the mountains. The older men, like Lyle's father and grandfather who'd worked them, had reams of legendry about them. Tales of familiar voices deep down in the tunnels whose owners were known to be homesick or injured and of tools and trinkets going missing in the dark and dust between shifts, of knocking rocks and jittering footsteps on the edge of earshot underground, of eyes catching light like a predator's at the end of long shoots in the black stone, only to blink and disappear before men could get down to search for them, of things that lived beneath the earth and hid from the lights of men just as they hid from the lights of heaven. Lyle had never necessarily put much stock in the stories as a boy. He'd grown up with them, and had come to think of them as just another feature of mountain life, little more than ghost stories to entertain children. But two things had prevented him from ever truly convincing himself the stories of his father's were just stories. For one, Daddy never looked as shook up talking about ghost lights as he did about cave things, Lyle explained. For another, there's what I saw in 67, when we was out looking for the missing ranger. Lyle told us how, in those days, the Forest Service still used fire watch towers to guard against wildfire during the driest spans of the summer, and one such tower stood in the isolated span of low-slung mountains in the south of the county. Out west, such things still exist in places, but east of the Mississippi they're all but gone. This single tower was manned, usually by retirees and seasonal lumbermen, who received a small paycheck and board while they resided in the little cabin atop it. Well, as Lyle recalled it, 
Sometime in the summer of 67, the retired ranger who manned that tower astride the region's loneliest hills went missing. The old ranger's son would drive up every weekend to deliver groceries and check on him, Lyle said, and had pulled up to the tower's base one Sunday morning to find the lowest stairs bloody and scuffed. The cabin up top was empty. The rifle the elderly firewatcher had kept was gone, a kettle still boiled on the tiny wood stove, and the blood near the ground was still fresh and warm, leading the son to conclude that whatever had happened had just happened. The county mounted a large search effort almost as soon as the old ranger's son made it back into Jackson to report him missing. The findings of the search were strange enough to be a tale all their own. An unseasonably long rain had fallen the night before, and the muddy five-mile track up to the tower had been driven only once the morning of the old ranger's disappearance, the tire tracks belonging, of course, to the son who'd discovered him gone. There were no footprints or scent trails for dogs to follow in the surrounding woods, and the sole sight of blood seemed to be on the watchtower stairway. This at first seemed to hint the culprit was a wild animal, and speculation began that a huge black bear or some sole-surviving specimen of eastern mountain lion had dragged the old man off, but the total lack of drag lines or blood trails seemed to rule this out fairly quickly. In the months to come, several of the larger black bears in the area would be shot, and none would be found to have human remains in them. No sign of the retired ranger, or his corpse for that matter, was ever found. These were details that reached Lyle McCullough much later. On that Sunday afternoon, though, he was clueless as to the details of the matter, just one of a few hundred men and boys that got roped into scouring the woods of southern Brethet. He had, by his account, split from a group of his brothers with one of his father's old bloodhounds, and had been trailing his canine lead uphill into the ridges for about twenty minutes when the animal began to moan and whine and tug to retrace their steps back down. The evening was just beginning to darken, he said, and as the night bugs gradually began to sing, it dawned on him that they didn't have much more than an hour before the sun set. He figured the dog had hit the end of its trail, and was eager to rejoin the others in the valley. Why it was so fervent in this desire he could not say, but the gravity of that wouldn't hit him till later. Lyle was just about to give in to his dog's demands to head back downhill when, by chance, he spotted the mouth of a very old, hand-dug mine in the short span of cliff above him, half-filled by some long-ago mudslide. He was intrigued, partially by the sheer, ominous isolation of the crag in the stone so far from any discernible path or road, and partly by local legends about a forgotten silver mine somewhere in the hills. It was, in fact, a failed prospecting attempt chasing geode glints in the stone which an overeager settler had mistaken for precious gems, but Lyle, as with the circumstances of the retired ranger's disappearance, was not clear on that then. What he did know was that there was a local legend of lost riches in the hills, and that there now stood above him in that cliff face a long-forgotten and isolated mine. He pushed up the hill to the aperture. The bloodhound, now being dragged behind him on its leash, became ever more fretful and rigid as he tugged it along. By the time Lyle had begun scaling the mudslide, the frightened animal had jerked free of him in a desperate show of strength, and had bolted off back downhill toward the others, baying dolefully all the way, as if it sought to call him along but didn't dare wait for him. When Lyle crested the top of the mounded mud and slid to one knee in the muck, he realized that there were prints on the downward side towards the mine's interior. But the prints struck him as odd, for they seemed to appear off to the side against the right wall, as if whatever made them had leapt down from the stone like some lemur from a wildlife magazine. These prints in the mud looked something like the feet of a man, but they were flanked on each side by strange indentations Lyle would later come to believe were knuckle marks, 
again reinforcing the ape-like image which had so jarringly flooded his mind at the sight of the awkward prince near the wall. His gaze followed the prince then, down into the winding, ten-foot-wide corridor of debris-strewn ground that marked the beginning of the shallow little delve into the hills, down to where the dripping of rainwater through fissures in the roof coated fallen boulders with glistening films of moisture and moss, down to where the echoing rustle of bats awakening before nightfall was beginning to reverberate through those old, forgotten tunnels down to where two wide pools like eyes caught the light of the evening behind him and seemed to stare back as he gaped and shivered. He didn't see it too clearly before he ran, but he saw enough. It was, he said, squatting like a gargoyle upon a fallen stone the size of a truck that masked half the passage about thirty feet in. Though it had something of a man's silhouette, it had all the wrong proportions something he'd seen all the clearer when Stephen had pulled back the tarp from that rotting thing in the shed. And upon its broad and wiry shoulders, it carried a beaten and torn corpse. A corpse, he saw, which was shrouded in mangled clothes. When Lyle retreated downhill, he expected the thing to chase. When he reached his family in the larger groups of searchers, he expected them to believe him. And though some, especially the miners, gave him enough credit to check out the old and abandoned prospect in the cliff face the next day, they came back to tell him it was empty, that the tracks in the mud might have belonged to any local wandering the hills, even if they were big, that the crevices in the rear of the shallow mine were too narrow and too small for any man to squeeze through. And so he had shrugged off his experience to his community and buried the memory of it within himself, right up until his son had called him out of the house to see the cave thing he'd dragged up from the creek. Quiet drowned the porch after that. It was likely close to midnight by then, and the windows of the house behind us had gone dark. The McCulloughs within lay sleeping or worrying, leaving us four to stew in the orange gleam of the backyard light and stare out toward the shed. There was some crazed, half-mad part of me that wanted to walk down there and see it again, as if I might push through the door, find it missing from its place beneath the tarp, and awaken to find this had all been part of some vivid and wicked dream. But the nip of mosquitoes, the thrum and rasp of the elder McCullough's oxygen— the far-off croaking of frogs in lowland valleys. It was all so mundane and so real that it dismissed any comfort I might have found in illusion. It was some time after that when Stephen finally ordered us all inside to sleep. We had work to do tomorrow in town, cave thing or no, and it wouldn't do to stay awake through the night. I settled down on the sofa in the living room, near where Lyle slept in a well-loved recliner, his breathing having long ago consigned him to sleeping upright. Stephen led Samuel to his bedroom, shared now with many of his slumbering cousins. I figured then he must have retired himself, but I didn't linger on it long. Even with thoughts of deep crevices in the earth and gurgling springs from cave systems long forgotten crowding my thoughts, I was so exhausted from a week's labor on flood damage that I passed into fitful sleep within fifteen or twenty minutes. I didn't last long, however, for my nightmares came on fast. After jolting from sleep several times and forcing myself to try for another go, I sat up frustrated at three in the morning, unable to shake the feeling that something was wrong. I perched on the couch in the dark of the crowded house a moment before I saw there was a shape against the backyard light in the adjoining kitchen's window. Stephen, I fast realized, looking out over the garden beds toward the shed out back. Perhaps I wasn't the only one who felt something was off. I rose, silent, my footfalls on the carpet lost beneath the hiss and hum of Lyle's omnipresent oxygen. I was halfway to the kitchen when I realized the dogs were baying and barking out back on the porch, but they cowered rather than frothed, never pushing against the screens to escape. 
I was inside the kitchen before I realized Stephen held a rifle. Stephen waved me back as I came in, telling me in hushed tones to not move too quickly. He didn't think they'd seen him, he said. I soon understood what he meant. What we saw out there we never discussed after that night. Not amongst ourselves. Stephen probably said something of it to Lyle when no call was made to get a sheriff's deputy out in the morning, and little Sam might have muttered about it in hushed tones with his father when night terrors took him. But we two who saw that last sight in the backyard beneath the stark light that shone there never shared our worries or speculations over it. Perhaps it would have been easier to bear if we had. Perhaps we will, someday, crack open the topic one dark night, safe from thoughts of unplumbed caverns among friends. But tonight, I remember it alone. Standing around the shed where we'd stored what Lyle had dubbed the cave thing were pale figures, equally long and equally hollow in silhouette, equally human and equally inhuman. They crowded the door, which had been kicked in, having to bend painfully low to scuttle through the entrance. Most stood still and quiet, though, like mourners at a funeral, saucer eyes gleaming each time they swiveled their skulls owl-like to scan the empty yard. Had they not been so horrible to look upon, it might have been a somber scene. The largest of them bore the elongated corpse out of the doorway and carried it back into the woods, slipping over the fence like an adult man might straddle a baby gate. The lesser of the cave things went behind them, seeming to withdraw in a kind of marching order that always left at least a couple pairs of saucer eyes resting on the dark house in wait of pursuit. Two dozen became one, and then half before finally the last few trickled into the trees and were lost in the gathering mist that rose before dawn. In their wake, they left no prints, and countless questions. I've long believed these things somehow knew it would be detrimental to let one of their own fall into human hands. I dwelt all that following day on how they must have been close when we came to take the drowned one how a couple of the cave folk must have tracked it to the valley and lay in wait for the cover of dark to carry it home, only to have us clumsily swoop in at the last hint of light and spirit it away to the shed, how they might have followed us up at a distance as Stephen hauled it uphill, how they must have lurked in the trees and watched through the long night as we sat on the porch and talked of days and legends better left buried. I still dwell on it now, all these months later, but I try my best not to. I have moved back into Breathitt, and for all its darker history, it's proved a far healthier environment for me than Lexington. But at times, when I wind the back roads after dark, or pass a window in the house in the night, I can't help but watch for eyes in the trees. Worried each moment I will catch sight of something from below ground, which has skulked up in the absence of the sun to watch, and, perhaps, to hunt. <laughs>